Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. At 724, we'll call the open meeting to order. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Studo, Mr. Walner, and we'll begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And as the town administrator no notified the members of the public in attendance, this meeting is being recorded by the town administrator as well as by NORCAM. In our first order of business is donations from the International Family Church. We have a vote to accept. And are we joined by Pastor Jonathan? Madam Chair, I've attempted to reach uh, Pastor Del Turco. I've not been successful, so I do not know that there is uh, anybody here this evening. Um, is there anybody here from International Family Church? If so, raise your hand or certainly unmute yourself. And Madam Chair, if there isn't, I don't know if we want to try to hold it until the, the next meeting or come back to it. Sure. With that, that, I think that's fine. We'll move on to the next order of business, which is... Um, something else I'd ask my colleagues to hold only because there's a couple more corrections to be made on the minutes of the meeting. So um, if uh, I was going to say, if it please the court, if it please my colleagues, uh, let's move on to a COVID-19 update by Mr. Yeah, Gilbert. I also have, uh, I'll be forwarding some uh, suggested changes for, on the 11th. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, okay. We'll find job. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the spell check made some pretty significant changes to some of the wording that needs to be corrected at least. So it's not anything to do with the performance. It's, it's going to do a spell check, I think. All right. So we'll move on to the next order of business, COVID-19. Mr. Gilberto. Um, here, I have a somewhat lengthy verbal update and I, if it is agreeable to you and the board members, perhaps we could do that after the hearings, because I know there are a number of residents who are on for one or both hearings. And Absolutely. All right. That's fine with my colleagues. We'll move on to public comment. <coughs> is there anyone here that wishes to speak at public comment? Not regarding the public hearings. Those will give the opportunity for people to speak for those, but just in general public comment, if you could raise your hand. I'm not seeing any hands or anything raised in the uh, participant log. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to um, staffing grants. Next order of business. Chief, are you there? I did see Chief Stats with us. <clears throat> yes, I am. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. Well, Chief. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. And um, if you have a I, I think we've visited this before with you, but if you want to give us just a brief rundown on this and what your ant application is all about and what you're anticipating when and the deadlines of filing and all of that, that'd be great. Sure. So similar to last year, uh, FEMA's uh, assistance to firefighter grants have opened up. And the first one is called the assistance to firefighter grant. And it uh, involves equipment of which I am submitting for 24, uh, full SCVA replacements, which includes the pack and two air cylinders uh, for a grand total of $168,000. There's a 5% cost share to the community. Um, so that is approximately $8,000 that would be on our end. Um, so that deadline is February 12th. <clears throat> the second staff uh, grant is the SAFER grant, which is for staffing. That has not opened up yet, but my intent is to uh, put in for the same amount of personnel that I did last year, which is 12. And this year, there's also no cost share to the community. FEMA has waived the three-year cost share, so uh, it would be 100% funding by the federal government. Okay. Questions of, the, of my colleagues? What a comment instead of question. Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> Chief, uh, thank you again for uh, staying on top of uh, the availability of uh, funds that may be available to, to the community. I think it's important and it's noteworthy that you're, that you're doing that and you're showing some initiative to, uh, once again, 
uh, help provide the community with some assistance uh, that's being offered by the federal government or even the state government. Uh, but that being said, you know, obviously, as was the case last year, you know, particularly the SAFER grant that covers uh, individual salaries and benefits, you know, for talking, you're talking about 12 positions, uh, which is a significant increase over the 19 or 20 uh, current firefighters, uh, significant increase. Uh, certainly, we've been talking about expanding the, uh, the workforce uh, over the years, but as a, you know, cost, cost wise, it's, it's significant. And this would certainly help us uh, to do that. But, you know, we cannot afford to go forward with this without the uh, input, assistance, and uh, cooperation of the union, you know, so that I would like to um, again, encourage you to, to, to file for the grant application, certainly. But before, you know, the board can make an informed decision, you know, I think we need to know, you know, uh, with the input from the uh, firefighters union, you know, what their thought process is on it, uh, their assistance and uh, working through the logistics as to how we would take on this additional personnel and then their cooperation with uh, assuring that it can be affordable moving forward. So that, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to be taking people off for three years and then having to lay people off. So I think they, we have an obligation to uh, seek their input and their assistance. And uh, I think they have an obligation to assist us and, seeing whether or not it can work, work for us or not. So I look forward to those discussions too. But I encourage you to uh, file for the grant application, absolutely. Um, if I can recognize our finance uh, committee chair, uh, Abigail Hurlbut. I did see you, Adrian, raised. Mr. Gilberto, can you unmute Abby for us? I, I, I unmuted myself. <laughs> okay, no, all right. I always do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Chief, if I remember from last year, uh, the this grant pays for two or three years, but after that, you, you can't lay them off or do anything else. You have to continue to keep them on board. Um, and uh, of course, if you were to lay off people, then that creates other financial obligations. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking as chair of the finance committee is what is the town's exposure for 12 new hires even though the first several years are covered uh, going forward beyond that point so the cost for 12 at this point moving forward is just over a million dollars a year that would be the exposure with the addition of contractual increases after that point so we're looking at a million dollars a year. And, and that is until they retire, leave, or whatever else, is that correct? That is correct. Uh, with that being said, you know, as Mr. O'Leary pointed out, with the assistance of uh, the union and the rest of the department, there would be some potential cutbacks at that point regarding overtime and while and that would help offset some of that cost. Uh, so the million dollars would actually be a little bit less going forward. Have you run any of those numbers so you have any idea of what it would cut back? Because my understanding is the reason for 12 and you could apply for two positions or six or whatever you wanted, okay? But my understanding is that this is the number that fits in best with the fire department as regards uh, on call, et cetera, which we've had trouble filling. Is that correct? It would allow us, it would allow us to get multiple pieces of our apparatus on the road and not be as reliant on, or not reliant on the callback system that we currently have. Right. So uh, do you have any sense of, uh, if it's not a million dollars, what it might be with uh, a potential savings from not as much. I mean, bear in mind, or at least I'm sure you have, Chief, but 12 new employees is really not 12 new employees in the sense that you still have to cover their vacations. You still have to cover their sick pay. You still have to cover all these other things going forward. So they're all going to take vacations, which is going to eat into any sort of projected overtime um, on the part of the overall force. Yes, that, that is correct. 
Um, and I have run those numbers and I will update them, uh, but roughly depending on how discussions go, it's anywhere from 400 to $500,000 that you could potentially save and offset that million dollar cost. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. All right, and this grant is, you have to apply for this grant by when? So like this grant, particularly this particular grant for staffing is not opened up yet, so the deadline the open the opening date and the deadline has not been posted yet, but it's coming early spring. And um, how long after you've applied on the off chance that uh, the powers that be say, great, here are your 12 dudes, uh, do you have to prepare bunks for them, for example? So we have a one year window to hire these individuals with a six month extension that we can apply for. Okay. So that will be dependent on the civil service list. Um, so there's a lot of different variables and moving parts at the same time. So, And do you anticipate a certain number of retirees over the next two years, for example, that might um, help you out? Well, we, we can't offset, we can't offset personnel with this grant. So that's what I thought. Yeah, so we have to maintain the current staffing level that we have. Plus 12. Plus 12. No matter what. Correct. Thank you very much, Chief. Yes, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Harold. Any other questions? I believe Mr. Keller has a question. Oh, Mr. I, <laughs> I see Mr. Keller. Put my hand up. I see. <laughs> I see. I was looking for a blue hand. It's a nice yellow hand. I don't know what happened to the blue hand. I know, I know. I have a blue hand. Ah, well, there you go. <laughs> um, just just a, a two, two questions, Chief. One is, the, the, does the million dollars include benefits, or is that just, just salary? Salary and benefits, Mr. Kelleher. Okay. And is that <laughs> the amount three years out, or is that the amount when we hire 12 people? Sorry, can you repeat the question? A million dollars, the, the cost when we hire them, or is it the cost three years out when we become responsible for their, their salary and benefits? Right now, it's the, the amount when we hire them. All right, so, so that million in three years will be some percentage okay. more than that. Correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Mr. Gilberto, I did not see a motion in the packet on this. I could be mistaken, but I think Chief Stats was just here to alert us about the possibility of these two grants and his intent to apply for them, correct? Yes, and correct. you don't need a motion for us to do that. That's correct, Madam Chief. All right. So if there's no further questions, thank you, Chief, for the explanation and keep us posted on what happens, if you would, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Board Chair. Thank you, Chief. Our next order of business is the show cause hearing on Route, Route 28 Lucky Mart. And I do see Attorney Delaney, Attorney Sean Delaney here, who's representing the licensee. And Mr. Delaney, if you want to introduce yourself and let us know, I think your licensee is here with you too. He is. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you. Good evening. Um, good evening, board members. Sean Delaney on behalf of Lucky Mart and Mr. Patel. Okay, thank you. And we have Chief Murphy here um, to um, give us a little bit of details uh, because this is a show cause hearing for violation. So we would typically begin with Mr. with Chief Murphy, giving us a rundown of the facts as to what brought us here tonight on this violation hearing. Thanks Chief for joining us. Not a problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm reading just from a uh, summary. Hey, Madam Chair, should you open the public hearing, open the show cause hearing? Just throws as a formality standpoint, just read the notice and. I did not see a notice in the, Okay. I don't think this was published. I think it's a disciplinary hearing. Okay. Was that, I, I, there wasn't a notice published on it. It's a, it's a notice. I can read the notice of hearing if, if that's and it was said okay uh, uh, when I read the notice of hearing miss mr O'Leary just to and then we can begin with um chief Murphy's um presentation so let me just get to that in the packet one second
This is a notice of hearing to uh, Sunny Patel Manager, Smokes and Snacks Incorporated, doing business as Route 28 Lucky Mar, 202 North Street, North Reading, Mass, 01864. Dear Mr. Patel, on Monday, January 25th, 2021 at 7.30 p.m., the Select Board will hold a hearing on the matter of your package store wine and malt beverage license. You are invited to show cause why your license should not be revoked, suspended, or amended due to reports from the North Reading Police Department concerning alleged violation of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 138, Section 34, sale, delivery, or furnishing alcoholic beverages to persons under 21 years of age on the evening of December 28, 2020. We have the attached, attached the reports for your reference. Sincerely, Michael Gilberto. Okay, so um, obviously the obviously the licensee and his attorney received copy of the notice of hearing because they're here in attendance. And Mr. Murphy, I'm I'm sorry, Chief Murphy, if you want to give us give the board a brief summary of what transpired that's led to this show cause hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening, everyone. Um, mm -hmm. On Monday, December twenty eighth. 2020, um, Detective Michael Mara and Detective Sean O'Leary, with the assistance of a 19 year old confidential person performed alcohol compliance checks th throughout the town of North Reading. Uh, those checks are done periodically in an effort to reduce the availability of alcohol to people under the age of 21. The checks are done um, in compliance with the training and guidelines set forth by the Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission. And as part of those guidelines, we did notify the public of the compliance checks through electronic and um, paper media. Prior to the alcohol, alcohol compliance checks, the underage person was issued all the pertinent paperwork to include the ABCC guidelines, which um, he then understood and, and acknowledged. Again, on Monday, December 28, 2020, an alcohol compliance check was completed at 202 North Street, which is um, Lucky Mart. Um, after that compliance check, I received a report that there was one violation of 204 CMR 2.05 permitting an illegality on the licensed premises to wit, a violation of Mass General Law 138, Section 34, sale or delivery of an alcoholic beverage to a person under the age of 21. According to the detective's report, the underage person was instructed to attempt to purchase a six pack of Bud Light beer. Um, the underage person was instructed to leave the premises if a state identification card or a license was requested by the cashier. The officers monitored the underage person as he walked into Lucky Mart. Approximately two minutes later, the underage person exited the store with a black plastic bag containing a six pack of Bud Light cans. Uh, the underage person told the officers he had just purchased the beer from the only male working at the cash register inside of Lucky Mart. The officers went inside, identified themselves, and informed the male that was working behind the cash register, who was later identified as Marmik Patel, that he had just sold alcohol to a minor. The clerk responded by asking, who can I see them? The officers advised Mr. Patel that they would bring the person back inside. Um, and then Mr. Patel had asked the officers what they meant by underaged. The Detectives explain the process of the violation and um, what can he can expect from the um, violation once it was submitted to the town. While explaining this, Mr. Patel said that the store had recently been given a notice of violation for selling alcohol to a minor. Mr. Patel told the detectives that it seemed as if the store was being targeted by the police. Um, the de detectives reported they believed that Mr. Patel was referring to the alcohol compliance checks conducted on October 18th, 2020, at which time um, there was a violation at the same location. Detectives told Mr. Patel that when alcohol compliance checks are done, they are done um, uh, throughout the community at every package and liquor store. While on scene, um, our detectives were able to confer with um, our North Reading Drug Free Communities Director, Amy Luckowitz, who did confirm that Mr. Patel did have a current TIP certification on file. Um, she did also um, send me a memo that on December 21st of 2020, she had provided a written memo to Lucky Mott reminding store employees to rely on their TIPS training and the associated techniques to verify a person's age without requiring them to remove the mask, which is of course a ongoing Board of Health requirement for the general public. Um, in that memo, um, 
Ms. Lakowitz further recommended that all establishments request ID for anyone purchasing alcohol who does not appear, um, appear to be at least 40 years old, which is much higher than the statewide recommendations of 30 years old. Um, she did provide that written documentation to Mara McPatel, who was also um, the clerk who was in violation. Uh, Madam um, Chair, also just uh, for the record, we did um, file a criminal application against Mara McPatel for um, delivering alcohol to a minor. Um, the case is still pending at court, um, awaiting a hearing date. Okay, thank you, Chief. Do, do the members have any questions? Uh, do my colleagues have any questions of Chief Murphy? So Chief Murphy, just to verify for the record, so on th this is the same establishment that we, we had before us here for another violation, similar uh, sale to a minor uh, in December of this of, of last year, December of 2020. So we, it, there was a violation that occurred back in October of 2020. Um, there was a suspension pending um, as, as indicated by the board, as ordered by the board. And this occurred uh, approximately two days before that suspension was about to take effect. Um, so the second violation was in, in December. So mm -hmm. it was one in October, one in December. In the previous, what we discussed at our hearing then was the prior, the first violation that occurred. So this is actually the third violation of a sale to, to a minor. Within, yeah, so the first, the, well, I mean, going back to 2019 was the right. actual first one and then two in 2020. Okay. So um, at this point, I'd ask if my colleagues don't have any questions of Chief Murphy, I'll allow Attorney Delaney, do you have any questions for Chief Murphy with regard to his presentation? Madam Chair, I have no questions. Uh, Lucky Mark and Mr. Patel will stipulate to the facts as set forth by Chief Murphy this evening. Okay. But I have more that I'd like to say at the Absolutely. appropriate time. Please go ahead, Mr. Delaney. So uh, I trust that the board members will forward the packet that I had submitted to uh, Town Administrator Gilberto. In that packet was first the termination letter that was sent by Mr. Vamil Patel, the manager of uh, Lucky Mart, to Marit Patel. Once uh, the manager received the full packet with complete police report, and took immediate action against the employee and terminated the employee from Lucky Mart. And it was an employee who had previously worked for them but had a similar like instance in Mr. Patel, the manager rehired him recently because of the fact that this gentleman had been unemployed for such a long period of time, uh, but terminated him immediately as you can see from the packet that I submitted to you. Attached there too was also an agreement reached and entered into by uh, the Mill Patel and Lear Realty Partners. Uh, Mr. Patel, uh, given what has gone on over the last nine, 10 months, one with pandemic and two with the issues he's had with his employees at this establishment and not following uh, what they were trained to do and the um, equipment that he's installed there at a very high expense uh, to card anyone who looks under, and I. When I was here before you back in December, uh, I had indicated he was instructing them to card anyone who was under, it looked under 80 years of age. And he went back and met with every single one of these employees and had instructed them, retrained them. And I don't think there's anyone more disappointed here this evening than Mr. Emil Patel that we're in this situation. So, but he has taken immediate corrective action, terminating the employee. He's looking to uh, sell the business along with the liquor license to someone that comes in. As you can imagine, it's a very, very difficult year financially for any business such as this. It's a business in which the fixed cost has remained the same year to date. However, the revenues have been down considerably. Uh, and financially, he's basically just, just holding on as is. So now, having stipulated to the facts as alleged by Chief Murphy, I'll go to now what the board has to decide. And I'm sure, You've done your homework or got an opinion from town council in terms of what measures you can take. And I think the guiding principle is pretty clear in terms of if you looked at decisions made by the ABCC that 
they have consistently held that compliance checks are educational tools. The penalty should not be draconian, punitive, or unfair. That is the ABCC stating that. The sanction should be a measured sanction where education is the tool behind the sanction that's imposed. So I know some, some of you may be sitting there saying, contemplating a revocation of a license. I would submit that a revocation of a license would in fact be draconian, especially in these measures. So then I'll go to in the research I've done and decisions by the ABCC, I'll give you some examples of what the ABCC has done in multiple violation situations. This one was of the Rugby's Incorporated DBA Slattery back room. Possession of alcohol beverage by a person under 21 years of age, four counts. On that occasion, the ABC suspended the license for 12 days, two days of which were served, 10 days were held in abeyance for two years. One example. Second example, Center Liquor Corp. The commission suspended, in this case, is a delivery of alcohol beverage to a person under 21 years of age, five counts. We're dealing with Lucky Mart three, if you count the prior two, but one in the instance in the late December. But in this case here, regarding Center Liquor, five counts. The commission suspended the license for 26 days, 13 days were served, 13 days held in abeyance for two years. The third example I give you is the decision relative to Henry Quick Pick Inc. DBA Henry's Market. It's the sale or delivery of alcohol beverages to a person under 21 years of age, six counts, double the counts that if you in totality add up the counts regarding Lucky Mart. So six counts. In that instance, the commission suspended the license for 30 days, 15 of which was served, 15 days were held in abeyance for a period of two years. <clears throat> so if you consider that Lucky Mock has already been sanctioned twice, the first time was a three-day suspension, the second time was a five-day suspension, and given the time period that it occurred on, very substantial financial hit, is it encompassed a holiday weekend, as was the decision of this board? So they've already served eight days. What I would submit to, the, to, to this board, what would be a fair and reasonable and a non-draconian sanction at this point regarding Lucky Mott would be a suspension that's no greater than 10 days. If the court does suspend, if the board does suspend it for greater than 10 days, any day over 10, I would submit to you, should be held in abeyance for a period of two years. That seems to be consistent with what has been prior suspension decisions of the ABCC. And that's what I would request this board to do and nothing draconian, such as an extreme measure of a month or two suspension or worst case, a revocation of that suspension. Thank you. Okay, so to my colleagues, does anyone have any questions for Attorney Delaney? Mrs. Gonzalez. Hi, Mr. Delaney, Attorney Delaney. Um, I have a question about your examples. Could you tell me like with the five count and the six count, how close in time those were? Because these three were basically within a year of each other. I in a year of time, three. So right. do you have a time span for those counts? I believe those were all on one occasion. There were spot checks or parking lot investigations by ABCC. So they occurred all at about around the same time. Can you clarify that for me a little a little better? I'm, I'm not understanding that. So most of those were investigations directly by the AEDCC, not by the local licensing mm -hmm. in which there were on several occasions, several examples on one particular night. Five I counts would, on one night? I would correct. And I would submit to the this board that that's it's all egregious, but that's much more egregious where it was consistent a patent on one particular occasion. One of those examples I gave you was a was not a convenience store or liquor store. One was an example of a uh, 
a bar nightclub situation. That was the first one, but that was only, that was the four count example that I gave to this board. The other two were convenience store, liquor slash liquor store examples. Thank you. Any other questions, Mrs. Gonzalez? Thank you. Okay, any other questions of the, my, the members? Mr. Studo. Good evening, Attorney Delaney. Um, so, okay, so I, I, I understand your examples, um, you know, trying to show that there's been other people that have, I, I get all that, but here's my question. The way you set it up, it seems that because they got a suspension for the first violation and then they got one for the second, that somehow because they already got it then, this new one, not that it should be ignored, but should be treated in the same context. And I, I reject that argument. That's and, you the, you then, you no, no, but hold on, hold on. Let me finish in that. But my point, I, I see what you're saying. Like I, I do, I do follow, but to me, just like, I don't know, I'm just going to reference it to like my six year old doing something wrong. Progressively punishment is progressive. And I can't ignore what's happened before. And again, it's not to be draconian. No one wants to. And like I've mentioned before, but if you recall the last meeting, I said, you know, once a mistake, second time's a pattern, third time's a habit. This is a habit. And now what you want us to do, and also let's say we give more than the recommended 10, you want us to suspend the rest of them for someone who's selling it. That becomes a moot point. He should have probably not told us he was going to sell. Because now, like, to me, that's, I mean, we could give him 100 days and he only has to serve 10. But if he gets in trouble again, he's got to serve the other 90 and he's selling it. What's the point? He's going to be long gone. So I, my only thing is, it's not even a question, but more of, like, I'm just trying to figure out how, like, I understand the action he took and I appreciate that. But the buck stops with him. He's the owner. And, I mean, I don't know how a suspension of any type affects a sale. I, I don't know that. I'm going to have to ask um, if it even does. But I, I just think that asking for the leniency based on losing money over a holiday period for something that was his fault, that's just not a good way to go about it. That's well, I, I think you misunderstood my entire presentation. I wasn't asking for leniency. Um, this is progressive sanction. It was a three, a five, and I'm suggesting now it should be a 10. Draconian would be something greater than that. And I'm sure you're aware, if you do take an action that's viewed as draconian, then there's an appeal process you can institute and go I, to the ABCC. And based upon my research and what I have shown to you, and what I'm suggesting is, I think the ABCC would view a substantial sanction of a month or two or a certainly a revocation is being draconian and on all likelihood that won't be upheld so trying to avoid that process it is a, a step up in terms of sanction it's a three a five and a ten and i don't know in this climate how soon he'll be able to sell this business anyhow he's endeavoring to do so but more than likely that will take time and it'll probably at a loss I'm not suggesting that to you to, to grant him some leniency. I was being transparent with the board in submitting it to you. So I don't know if you fully understood what my presentation was about. I hope I've clarified it. No, I, I, I understood. I understood that point. I, I think maybe. All right. Let me let me see if you understand what I was saying. Then, oh, I do. As soon as you tell me, like for me, I get the sympathy of what's going on. But as soon as you violate the law and you're in trouble, I don't want to hear about your financial. I don't want to hear it. Like, I really don't. You it, it's kind of like saying that during a pandemic, if you break into someone's house, it was a pandemic. You needed to eat. You know, let's take that in consideration. I, I don't. That's I'm sorry. Not, that that's not the point. The point was he is a businessman. Yes, the buck does stop with him. He took the action against his employee. He's a man who's trying to survive. This isn't a multi-million dollar corporation. Attorney Delaney, He's can you wait until, Attorney Delaney, would you let Mr. Studo finish? And I will recognize you to speak when he's done. I, I don't think it's good for recording purposes or 
for anyone's edification, if people are arguing back and forth, if you don't mind waiting until Mr. Studo's finished, and Absolutely then I, I will I will recognize you, Attorney Delaney. Thank you. Is there anything else, Mr. Studo? I'll just end it again, Mr. Delaney. I appreciate everything you said. I don't want to. I don't want you to think that I misunderstood. It it seems that though. I mean, um, it's unfortunate the coincidence, but you're two you're X number of days away from a suspension where the board did not take it lightly, and I just feel that, you know. It, it, it's something where it's just very difficult to ignore that I know I am a business owner. And if there was a violation, I can tell you that I would have a meeting and hammer at home that unless someone looks like they're 80 years old, you better card everybody. And that right there, that's fact. So that means it tells me that either he had the worst employee of all time or he did not deliver the message correctly. And that's on him. And I'll stop at that. Okay. Attorney Delaney, anything? Any, anything you want to add? No, I don't think that was a question oh. or something oh. I need to respond to. Thank you. Uh, um, anyone else, Mr. Walner, any comment or question? I would just want to know what we've done in the past ourselves, you know, uh, Attorney Delaney has brought some examples in. I don't quite get the five in one night is more egregious than a repeat pattern over a year, but that being with, withheld, all I really care about is what have we done in the past when we've had three violations? May, may I just say to my colleagues that though I probably haven't read those cases in a while, to caution you to compare this situation with the cases that are raised and keeping in mind and bearing in mind that what attorney De Delaney has offered for cases might not be an establishment solely in the business of selling alcohol. It might be a, might be a restaurant and it might've been the only violation, albeit five in one evening, it might've been the only instance of the violation um, based on the ABCC sting. We don't have that same scenario here. We have a business which is in the business, a limited business um, as it was acquired and so this is one of its uh, maybe two, two things that it can do as a business in that particular location. And this is the third instance of discipline over the past year and a half. So I caution us to be comparing this in the cases that Attorney Delaney is referencing because we really don't know the facts of those circumstances. They may not even be comparable to this. So if we can just keep our, our eyes and our minds focused on the facts of this case, what this board has done, what this board has done previously, and with regard to this establishment, I think what it, I think what Attorney Delaney was saying, and I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is they've already been punished twice. And I think what the board is saying, Attorney Delaney, is yes, we know that, and that's the problem here. So I don't know if uh, Mr. Waller, if you had anything else, I no, know I, you want to say I what was you. done in the. Past. I, I, I agree. I'm only interested to know what, what the town of North Reading has done in the past. Mm -hmm. Because this is this is our situation, right? So right. I, I agree with you. Mr. Laney's offered some some comparisons, but I don't see how they compare without knowing more information. So I think it's just really what have we done as a town? Um, if there's been a situation like this before, what's our precedent? In our packet, um, the TA included a. Uh, uh, he included a list of prior disciplinary matters. And um, I'm not actually sure that we've had an establishment that's had three instances within a year and a half period of time and a violation literally the week before the suspension was to take effect either. But Mr. so I think that in terms of a first offense, there's been a standard measure that's been imposed. And I believe in a second offense, although Mr. O'Leary can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe in a second offense, we've had a little bit more discretion, not, not a, in, on a case by case and on a, a third offense, it's, there's, been a, there's been, I think only one that I saw in the listing. But um, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Mr. O'Leary. I think that, that third offense was revoked. Yeah, I, I mean, it, a lot of it is, was determined based upon 
time elapsed between violations, um, again, generally it would be common ownership. <clears throat> we wouldn't hurt, we would not hold a, a new owner responsible for what a previous owner had done it or not done. So, you know, generally the time frame associated with uh, the violations was an important factor to be considered. You know, it had been three years, five years between violations. Then, you know, you think about all the services that all the service that had been provided, the transactions that were provided over that time period is significant and, you know, another slip up. So a lot of it had to do with time. And, and then, but to this particular case, if I could just uh, address some, make some comments and, you know, and Mr. Delaney, I, I appreciate our attorney Delaney, I appreciate your uh, doing a little research as far as how the ABCC works. And I'm somewhat familiar with how they work also um, from both the previous professional life that I was in and also uh, having sat on the board here for close to 30 years and having dealt with them and testified before them several times. And again, they were offering, uh, they always offered some pretty good guidance. Uh, sometimes they remanded it back to the town for consideration in different instances. Uh, again, to avoid draconian uh, measures. And at other times, um, they also looked at the circumstances, looked what uh, we offered for uh, uh, punishment. And more often than not, they concurred that it was so. So we've been fairly consistent. And, um, and I don't disagree that uh, the measures we should be taking initially should be educational in nature and not draconian. And I think that's pretty much what our policy has been for all the time that I've sat here. Um, but to Mr. Studo's point, you know, how often do we have to try and educate the same individual on the same violations, uh, certainly within an 18 month time period, in one instance, uh, October, November, December, three month time period, um, and they hadn't even served the second suspension yet. So at a certain point in time, you know, the assumption of responsibility for uh, either uh, accepting the educational uh, action of the board or ignoring it or just didn't sink in, you know, there, there needs to be responsibility assumed, uh, more responsibility assumed by the, by the owners. And again, we don't take these, these matters lightly. We, uh, we want our local businesses to succeed. We want them to operate um, safely. So our, our uh, minor residents, uh, while they might be tempted, uh, are not successful in carrying out uh, the temptations and the ability to, to acquire the alcohol. So, um, but, but I do concur to a certain degree that the ABCC, you know, should the uh, Lucky Mart decide to uh, appeal whatever the board determines to do, uh, is very receptive to making sure that uh, local business establishments continue to be able to operate, that the action isn't draconian. Uh, but I'm disturbed, extremely disturbed and disappointed that, you know, within, within 30 days of our last hearing, this happened again. And again, it, it, you know, in, this establishment is not targeted by the North Reading Police Department. You know, it was given advance notice, other establishments, the same establishments that we, um, do these same activities on annually, sometimes two or three times a year, are the same establishment. This, this was not singled out at all. You know, so um, again, I, I think the punishment uh, does that. And again, I, to me, again, I'm for progressive discipline. Uh, I think this um, a license is, a, is, a, is not a right. It's a privilege that's uh, issued by the town and by this board and, um, and I, and I don't try and take things away uh, from people uh, lightly. So, and I'm not in favor of a revocation. I'm gonna state that right up front uh, to my fellow board members. I'm not in favor of a revocation at this particular point in time, but I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with, you know, what should the punishment be and what's reasonable and what is progressively uh, warranted uh, in light of the time frame associated with these violations. So, uh, so I'm still open to suggestions uh, to me, it, the, the 10 day suggestion by attorney Delaney is, uh, is a floor and, uh, and not unreasonable. Uh, my expectation as far as uh, a suggestion, but uh, to me, that's a floor at this particular point in time. And uh, you know, whether he's gonna sell it, sell the establishment or not uh, is not of, of great concern to me. Um, 
because again, to me, he's, he's actually been a pretty good member of the business community and, and I've gone into the, uh, the establishment numerous times, uh, particularly when we had board meetings in the in town hall, I would stop in there and buy myself a, you know, a Coca-Cola and uh, say hello, maybe buy a lottery ticket and uh, chit chat a little bit and go in. So he's a, he's a fine businessman, uh, but made some mistakes here, which are um, costly all the way around. And it costs us a lot of time, aggravation, and, and again, disappointment from my vantage point. Um, so for my fellow board members, I'm not in favor of a revocation. I am in favor of a, a substantial suspension, uh, which is, again, sent home another message, I guess, and hopefully uh, this lesson is learned. Thank you, That's Mr. Have, yeah. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. I do, I do have a couple of questions, Attorney Delaney. I did, um, I did see what, you submitted in the file, which was the termination letter, as well as I think it was an agreement with the realtor. Is that what was submitted? Correct. And 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 is there is the prop is the property listed for sale right now? No, he he only is the proprietor of Lucky Mart. He does not own the real estate, so it's an agreement to sell the business with Lear Partners. It's not the seal of the real estate. And so the business at Lucky Mart includes the sale of alcohol, the retail sales of alcohol. It has a lottery license. And then it has some, some grocery, limited grocery in there? Correct. It's your typical convenience store with a beer and wine license. Okay. Okay. Um, So I think what we need to do, if there is no other questions and there's nothing else that you wish to add, Attorney Delaney? No, okay. you've, you've heard me. I appreciate that. Thank you. I know that we need to deliberate, uh, you know, the, the, what we determine to be a just measure of punishment here, but I think we need to begin with our findings of fact. And um, I can certainly kick that off for the board if my colleagues would like me to. Okay. Um, this uh, disciplinary show cause hearing was convened as a result of a December 28th, 2020 uh, alcohol compliance check in which, during which the licensee sold alcohol to an underage patron. The clerk, at the licensee did not um, request any identification of that patron. Mr. Patel um, was the individual who sold the alcohol. He is supposedly tips trained according to our, the police report, but he did not adhere to the tips training in, um, in regard to identifying the patron and this is this individual, Marmik Patel, was the very same individual with whom police had met not one week prior to provide him a memo on the importance of IDing patrons. Um, this is the third violation of this type by this licensee, a violation of sales to a minor. The other two violations for which this license has been suspended, the first uh, was a three-day suspension for sale to a minor in violation of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 138, Section 34, that occurred July 15th, 2019. The second was a five-day suspension uh, for sale to a minor December 7th of 2020. And therefore, these repeated instances with the same owner have occurred uh, for sales to a minor within the past year and a half. And if there's anything else to add to that by my colleagues. Seeing nothing else, we need to deliberate and just try to determine what would be the just measure. And as the notice letter indicated, it can be anywhere from a suspension to a revocation. I don't know if Mr. Gilberta, we've ever seen in terms of your historical review, anything similar to this that might 
be by way of guidance, though the board does take these on a case by case basis. But if there's anything that you might you might have discovered in your review, I know you gave us the summary sheet in our packet. I did through you, Madam Chair, and um, you know I think that you know as has been mentioned, the, there is a pretty extensive history, but you know the instances vary greatly. And so it is difficult to make a comparison. I mean, there is an example going back to the mid nineties of a revocation on a, a second offense um, within a, a fairly short period of time. Um, that revocation was, um, um, was overturned by the ABCC and um, the license reinstated. Um, there are instances where there were um, second offenses that occurred in short order with a five day suspension. And I think we've talked about that in the previous year. And there are instances where there's a fourth, a fourth suspension, but over a much longer period of time. And so it was a three day suspension that was uh, implemented. So it's just, you know, it's difficult to sort of highlight a, a specific instance that to compare this to, uh, and just, just my estimation, but the board members have the information. It does not seem comparable given the given the re same repeat violations and even just coming before this board and I was at the hearings prior to and so weren't my colleagues and really just kind of the urgency of complying and IDing and all of the checks and all of the information and all of the help that, that our staff has provided. And it, it just kind of, uh, doesn't seem to be paid attention to at all. So I don't know what the pleasure of the board is. Does anyone else want to contribute to the discussion? Mrs. Gonzalez. I think the thing that bothers me the most about this situation, um, in the first offense, it was a fake ID. Um, as I, if I remember that correctly, it was a fake ID. Mm -hmm. and. But the second and third, they didn't even card. They didn't even card. So you already had your first offense with a fake ID that, that came before us and we were stern with them and they promised they were gonna ID anyone under 50, I think I remember. And then on the third time, they are gonna ID anyone under 80. They didn't ID anybody. So that's what bothers me the most about this situation. Okay. <clears throat> Any um, recommendation on a decision? We do need to make a motion here. The, the, other, the, other, the other issue I think is the, the, the compliance checks, at least for the last time, were also posted in the paper. So the restaurants knew that, that, that the checks were going to be happening previously. So Mr. O'Leary has his hand raised. Yes, please, Mr. O'Leary. You know, the, the ABCC checks are unannounced. You know, North Reading Police Department for years have been doing these compliance checks uh, with notification, um, both written and in the newspapers. So, you know, for, for anybody that gets hauled in before us, there's little excuse um, for not being notified and nobody's being targeted. Um, Madam Chair, my, my recommendation is, is going to be a 12 day suspension and I'll make a motion and then we can, it gives us a starting point. How's that? And then we can either vote it up, vote it down or amend it or someone can make a motion afterwards, either vote it down and vote to revoke it. But Madam Chair, I move to suspend for uh, 12 consecutive days the package store all alcohol license of Route 28 Lucky Mart, 202 North Street on uh, February 7th, and that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on February 6th and picked up at the police station on February 19th. I have a motion by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a second? Hearing none, the motion fails. Does one of someone else want to make a motion? Mrs. Gonzalez. I would like to make a motion to revoke. I have a motion by Mrs. Gonzalez for revocation. Do I have a second? Hearing none, the motion fails. 
Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to suspend uh, for 14 days, two weeks, 14 consecutive days, the package store all alcohol license of Route 28 Lucky Mart, uh, 202 North Street on February 7th, and that the license must be delivered uh, to the North Ray Police Department at the close of business on February 6th and picked up at the police station on February 21st. Okay, motion by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a I'll second. Her 14 day suspension, seconded by Mr. Walner. Any further discussion? I'll say from the chair that I don't think that that's enough. And if I could second, I would have seconded Mrs. Gonzalez's motion to revoke. But I, I think it needs to be a much more uh, considerable penalty. And I could see something by way of a 30 day suspension, Mr. O'Leary. And if there's any further sales to minors within that 30 day that we should, we should automatically revoke it at that point. Because we've, we have a history like Mr. Studo said. That's my deliberation on the motion. So I have a motion, Mr. Studo, Mr. Studo. I don't agree with the revocation. I do agree with the 30 days. So that's why I've kept my mouth shut and actually you beat me to it. Okay. All right, Mr. O'Leary. Motion is for 14 days. Yeah, motion is for 14 days. Again, what I'm looking um, for here is, is a couple of things. One is um, my hope would be that the uh, license holder would not appeal a 14 day suspension. Uh, what my, my hope would be, and that would accept the punishment and, and move on and uh, hopefully successfully find a new buyer or successfully uh, the business uh, increases and they, they got the education they needed and continue to comply with the rules and regulations and the laws. Um, I'm afraid that a 30 day suspension, and maybe even 14, but a 30 day suspension would lead to a, uh, uh, the ABCC to, uh, remain it back to the town or not agree with it. So that, you know, what I'm looking to do is, you know, send the message, uh, a strong message, looking to avoid litigation and uh, maybe get a commitment from the, uh, the applicant or excuse me, the license holder that a 14 day suspension would be accepted and not challenged. And if they're not gonna agree to that challenge, then we can talk about the 30 days. <laughs> But again, I'm not looking to go before the ABCC. And again, um, and again, in a prior life, I worked for the auditor's office and I audited uh, the uh, ABCC and saw numerous um, uh, license hearings and uh, suspensions and things overturned and payment in lieu of uh, suspensions, which the ABCC also offers, which is they can actually buy their way out of it and not even have to serve a day of suspension. Exactly. Uh, so looking to avoid all of that and send the message at the same time. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, <clears throat> I almost lost my train of thought there. Um, I just want to know, um, is there a problem with them appealing to the ABCC? I mean, you're making it sound like it looks bad on our side. I, I oh. say let them appeal. Uh, and if it goes back to us, goes, I mean, we'll deal with it then. And maybe they won't win an appeal. Uh, no, I, don't, I don't think we, I don't think we should uh, take a vote based on a fear of an appeal to the ABCC, especially given the facts of this case, Correct. especially knowing the ABCC does its own compliance checks. And get this history, this, the facts were stipulated to in this case. So. Yeah. And I think, in our history, we've been more than fair and fair with them and with anybody else. So right. it's not like we're doing this to everybody. This is a tough, obviously a tough decision that the board has to make weighing all the factors and weighing all the facts. And okay, I have two hands up, Miss. So let, let's, let's hear, let me hear from Mr. O'Leary and then we'll hear from you, Attorney Delaney. Mr. O'Leary. Just in relation to the, to the this motion that I'm making is, is not out of fear of any sort at all. 
You know, I, I don't fear the ABCC. I don't fear the fact that they may uh, remand it back to us. I don't fear the fact that they may totally disagree with us and not agree with the revocation. Um, but I'm trying to be practical about the process from my knowledge as to how it works and what, uh, what could potentially happen. And again, I'm not looking at any, any litigation. And again, I don't want to hold anything against the licensee other than you know they broke the law. They're taking up our time and they're, they're bothering the hell out of me because they're not complying. Uh, but to me, this is, uh, I believe what's, what I'm offering here is uh, a reasonable expectation from the licensee. And I believe it's something that if they accept it, then the ABCC won't even have to deal with it. But if it's put before the ABCC, you know, it may get remanded back to us. And I'm not afraid of that at all. I just try to balance it to expending of resources sending the message. And again, I don't want to see them back here again, for sure. Yeah, but now I, I, I mean, we're in the, we're in deliberating a motion that's been seconded. Certainly uh, if the, if my colleagues want to amend it, they can amend it. Um, I know, I, I know attorney Delaney, you had your hand up, but it's a little bit unusual for us to allow you to participate during our deliberation of the motion. So I, only I we'll hear from you on it, but I only raise my hand, Madam Chief, because it was a question posed by Mr. O'Leary. If you don't want me to answer it, I won't. I, no. That's all, the only reason why I raised my hand. Right. Go ahead, Ms. Go ahead, Attorney Delaney. Lucky Mott would accept a 14-day and waive any appeal rights to the ABCC. Thank you, Attorney Delaney. Mrs. Gonzalez. Did we have a, I didn't think we had a second. Am I wrong? Mr. Walner seconded it. You did? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't hear that. So, if, so the motion is a 14-day suspension. Um, and I, Mr. O'Leary gave us the date of when it would begin. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Leary. I think you said February 4th. I think it was the 7th. February 7th. Okay. The second was by Mr. Walner. And is there any further discussion on the motion? So hearing no further discussion, we'll take a vote. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Oh. Mrs. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Walner. Aye. And uh, Manupelli is no. Do we have another motion? Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to suspend for 30 consecutive days beginning February 1st to March 2nd. Oh, I didn't get to that. February, the days, the package store, all alcohol license of Route 28. Local store on February 1st, that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on, excuse me, I think I've read it wrong. I'm going to redo it. I messed up my dates. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to suspend for 30 consecutive days the package store, all alcohol license of Route 28 Lucky Mart, 202 North Street on February 1st, and that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on January 31st and picked up at the police station on March 3rd. Okay, motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Oh, tough crowd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, no second by, no second on the motion, the motion fails. So we've had 14 days, we've had revocation, we've had 30 days. I'm gonna go 21, let's go 21. 21, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Walner makes a motion for a suspension of the license for 21 consecutive days. Yeah. Do I have a second? What dates are we talking about, Rich? Same dates you said. I thought I'd like your dates. We'll start the sixth, the seventh. You handed in the sixth. You're you're done on the seventh, and then you, I don't know, whatever the twenty-one days is out after. So it would be the seventh. So surrendering the license on the sixth, close of business on the sixth, and um, picking it up on the twenty-eighth of February. That's correct. Cam, that's well. like three. That's like basically because Super Bowl is on that first weekend. That's like one, two, three, that's four. That's kind of almost four weekends, three and a half, if you will. So I have a motion and I think it was seconded. And may I just ask a question on that? Why you wouldn't just 
begin it, turn the license in at the close of business on the 4th and begin the suspension on Friday the 5th. Why are you waiting until well, basically Sunday? This, you know, if we're disciplining a licensee by this action. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the, the earlier weekend versus a later weekend. So one way or another, it is a weekend. But Super Bowl weekend is big. It is big. But I, I, I'm flexible to, to move it up if you think you want to do it on the 5th, whatever. I think mean, that's fine with me. To Thank my colleagues, know. I hate to ask this, but when is Super Bowl weekend? I, I'm going to watch it. I just, seven, I, I did not. <laughs> it's Sunday the 7th. Sunday the 7th. I know Tom Brady's in it. I, I know that, but That's yeah. Good. Okay, good. so Super Bowl Sunday. Okay. Yeah. So you're, well, you're doing it the close of business on Saturday. Super Bowl is Sunday anyway. I, I don't understand why you wouldn't just make it Friday and that. I mean. Let's just do it Friday. It's, and, and with the. That that would be, I would actually request you amend it to begin okay. the suspension on the fifth. Okay, so let's do that. So I, I I'm suggesting uh, 21 days beginning on the fifth and ending I guess on the 26th. I think is what 21 days ends up to be. Okay, as amended, the motion by Mr. Walner. Does that get a second? Second. Second by Mr. Studo. Discussion. Mr. O'Leary, any discussion? No, I think I'm all set. And, and again, I, I think it's, I think what I proposed, you know, was sufficient, but that's okay. I'm uh, in the interest of uh, unity and sending a message to the, uh, this licensee and all the other licensees and to the ABCC, should they um, get requested to take a look at it, that we're going to be uh, firm in our conviction. So I will be supporting the motion. Okay. Any further discussion? Mrs. Gonzalez. The only thing that I care about is the youth in this town. And as far as I'm concerned, three shots at selling to our youth is too much for me in a year. So I won't to be supporting anything but a revocation, so. Okay. Any other discussion? All right, seeing none, we'll call, call the vote. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. No. Mr. Walner. Aye. Manu Pelli is no for the same reasons Mrs. Gonzalez asserted. So the motion carries 21 day suspension to begin February 5th, turn in the license uh, by the close of business of February 4th. And let's move on to the next order of business, I think. Okay. Thank you, Attorney Delaney. Thank you all. Have a Thank good you. evening. We are at our next order of business, which is the Public hearing on the nuisance or dangerous dog here on 18 Maple Road continued from January 11th, 2021. This is the notification that was sent to the uh, owner. It's stated January 12th, 2020 to Mr. Edward Guide, 18 Maple Road, North Reading, Massachusetts, 01864. It's a notice of hearing nuisance or dangerous dogs. Dear Mr. Guide, at the request of your attorney, Jeremy Cohen, on January 25th, 2021 at 8.30 p.m., the North Reading Select Board will hold a continued virtual public hearing in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157, to determine whether the two dogs owned and or kept by you in the town of North Reading, named Jaeger and Patron, are nuisance or dangerous dogs, as those terms are defined in said statute. This hearing is based on multiple written complaints of said dogs routinely running at large, trespassing on private property and attacking or attempting to attack other dogs and injuring a person while off the property at 18 Maple Road. Copies of the complaints are enclosed herewith. Please note that the hearing was continued from January 11th under condition that you continue to use a three foot leash and a muzzle whenever the dogs are outdoors. 
In accordance with its statutory authority, the board will conduct a virtual public hearing, which shall include an examination of the complainants under oath and based on the credible evidence and testimony presented may make such findings and orders concerning the restraint or disposal of said dogs as may be deemed necessary. You may participate in the virtual hearing and at that time you may produce any documentation and or witnesses. You may be represented by counsel at your own expense if you so choose and the notification included instructions on participation and a request if there were any questions to please call the town administrator's office. So we are gonna call the public meeting to order. I can see that we're joined by our animal control officer, Berg. We have attorney Brian Riley joining us. I'm looking for attorney Cohen. Is attorney Cohen with us? Oh, yeah. attorney Cohen, I see, okay. And attorney Cohen is a Mr. Guide with us? Uh, yes, in the yeah. Danielle Guide Square. So let's um, begin first by the um, presentation by the, our animal control officer. Uh, we're also joined by Chief Murphy, um, but to begin to explain the basis for which this hearing was convened. And then we'll, we'll, we'll be moving on to any of the complainants that are joining us to pre present their statement as well. And, okay, Mr. Gilberto. Before we proceed, excuse me, before we proceed, Mr. Gilberto. I do believe there was a recommendation that uh, any witnesses who will be um, speaking be sworn in. Um, so I, I, I know there was a list that was provided by Attorney Cohen, and I believe that the chief has a few who are um, witnesses on behalf of the town as well. And Attorney Cohen, was the list provided by Attorney Cohen of anyone that'll be presenting testimony on behalf of the owner? Yes. yes. Okay, so, um, well, we would ask anyone who's going to testify to raise your right hand and acknowledge that your testimony will be under the pains and penalties of perjury and the truth, and it is recorded testimony. And if you agree to that and you're going to testify, please say aye. Aye. Okay, hearing only the chief. Anyone who's going to provide testimony, speak up, unmute yourself, and agree that you're going to tell the truth. Aye. 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 Thank you. You're Aye. under oath. Your testimony is recorded under the pains and penalties of perjury. Anyone that's going to participate is a witness. All right, Ms. Chief Murphy. Madam Chair, um, during the last hearing, I had given a summary. Are uh -huh. you looking for the same summary again? Or... Why don't you proceed, Chief Murphy? We'll go, sure, we'll go to you. Okay, um, an animal control officer, Jerry Burke, is on the call, but th this report was to me dated um, December 19th of 2020. So I'm going to summarize that, and, and if there are any questions, specific questions to it, he can certainly answer any questions. Um, so the following is a summary from daily logs regarding two pit bulls owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road. There were several log entries um, made to the um, a, a log complaints made to the police department between November 25th and December 7th of 2020. Um, neighborhood complaints, um, written complaints were also made during that time period. Um, on November 25th, 2020, the animal control officer was dispatched by um, one of our sergeants to respond with two officers in the fire department at 10 o'clock in the morning to 18 Juniper Street regarding a dog attack that just occurred. When the animal control arrived on scene, um, a resident of five went to Barry Lane and his dog, a golden retriever named Jazzy, had been attacked by two pit bulls off leash um, that were owned by Ed Guide of 18 Maple Road. The victim was bit in the left hand, his thumb and index finger. He was treated on scene by the fire department. Um, the, the victim and his wife had transported their dog to the Reading Animal Clinic for multiple wounds and abrasions. Um, we did have a report that was attached to um, what was submitted to the select board um, for this hearing as well. Um, there were two witnesses um, 
um, that lived on Juniper Road who also um, gave voluntary statements and um, we submitted photos of the dog as well um, with our report. On November 25th, Animal Patrol Officer went to 18 Maple Road, spoke with the owner of the dog, Edward Guide, um, about the dog biting um, the golden, um, the, the dog from Juniper, the golden retriever. Um, as a result of the bites, um, the Animal Control Officer told Mr. Guy that both his dogs needed to be quarantined for 10 days. He was given a citation for be, um, dogs being unleashed, unlicensed, and unvaccinated against rabies. Um, and that was for both dogs. The um, Animal Control Officer explained to Mr. Guy the rabies protocol. On November 29th, um, Mr. Guy had contacted the Animal Control Officer and said that he had the vaccination paperwork on both of their dogs. He did provide proof of vaccination by um, a veterinarian out of Methuen MSPCA. Um, the, the, one of the citations was voided and um, based upon the vaccination now having proof of it and he was, Mr. Guy was issued another citation for being unleashed and unlicensed for both dogs. That offense occurred on November 25th. On December 2nd, um, the animal control also followed up on another call from uh, December 1st, 2020, which was reported to the North Reading Police Department at 7.30. This was regarding Mr. Guide's two pit bulls of 18 Maple Road running loose on the neighbor's back porch at 21 Maple Road. A police officer responded to the call and informed Mr. Guide with the animal control officer that he was in violation of the quarantine and leash law. Um, the animal control officer went again and spoke to Mr. Guide about the quarantine and the violation. He was issued another citation for a leash law, subsequent events, offense, I'm sorry, um, for his dogs being unleashed on December 1st. The animal control officer then ordered Mr. Guide to muzzle his dogs for the rest of the quarantine period and informed him that um, he would notify the state to the quarantine violation. Um, the animal control officer talked to the landlord um, who owns 18 Maple Road um, regarding the, the two pit bulls and uh, the violations that occurred. Um, the owner, Mr. Farazani, lives at 36 Maple Road, had agreed that both dogs are dangerous, especially around other dogs. Um, Mr. Farazani thought that, they'd be, that the dog should be removed um, due to neighborhood safety and liability concerns. Um, the, the animal patrol officer had left it to Mr. Farazani and Mr. Guy to work out the process. On December 7th, the animal control officer went back to 18 Maple Road and spoke to Mr. Guy um, regarding the, um, um, the release from the quarantine. Um, both dogs uh, appeared to, um, in, in the animal control officer's opinion, to be fine and they were released from quarantine. Um, Essentially after that, there was some conversation regarding the dogs being um, voluntarily removed um, to a different location, um, to a relative. Um, the owners had initially um, said that that was going to happen, and, but then they had said that they would not remove the dogs and that they were going to um, seek relief at a hearing. Um, so as a result of um, it was a result of pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 140, Section 157. Um, in our town bylaws, the animal control officer recommended that a public show cause hearing um, in front of the select board um, to have um, to, to make a determination whether the dogs were dangerous. Uh, there was also a muzzle order that was um, issued on December 31st, um, a 14 day muzzle order, which um, which the animal control officer had submitted a report to me. He did recommend, um, make a recommendation as well for the hearing tonight, um, which you know, we can discuss after, um, after you hear all the evidence presented. Sure. Thank you, Chief. We, we, would, we would like to hear Officer Berg's recommendation, but we'll be proceeding through. We have uh, multiple complainants here, including the, um, the victim that um, for which the incident occurred. So we'll, we're going to hear from each of the complainants that's filed written complaint. Um, and then we'll go back, you know, after um, 
attorney Colin presents information on behalf of his client and then we'll and then we'll go back and hear from Officer Berg as to his recommendation. So if if you're all set, Chief, which I see you're muted, I'm gonna actually ask uh, Dan Coveney. I see Mr. Coveney, yes, Mr. Yeah. and Mrs. Thank Coveney. Yes. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, but if you could identify yourself in your address for the record and then and then provide us with your statement. Sure. Uh, my name is uh, Dan Daniel Coveney. I live at uh, 5 Winterberry Lane, North Reading, Mass, 01864. Okay, thank you for joining us. I know we did hear from you and you did provide your statement, but we'd ask you to provide it again for us. Sure, no problem. Um, like I said before, I, I have a golden retriever, Jazzy, and, and, I, and I walked was walking that day on, uh, on, to, on Juniper Road going past Maple Road on a leash with my dog. And as I was, as we got past the street, the first one of the dogs came upon her and just went right onto her from the rear and went right for her neck. Um, I did not even see the dog come down the road um, and he just simply attacked her directly. I screamed for help, and then, as within a minute, the second dog approached and also latched onto her. Uh, for for both of them, I, I frantically, sorry, uh, frantically tried to pull them off. I I wasn't too successful um, at, initially. Um, I had started uh, screaming for help. Uh, because I, I knew I couldn't do anything at that point. Um, and um, eventually the Stansberries came out and helped me. But uh, in the meantime, I was on the ground trying to wrestle them off. I'm trying to, uh, I was, you know, wrestling with them and trying, to, and that's probably how I got bitten a little bit. Um, and then trying to, um, you know, shoot the dog. It was pretty submissive, uh, my dog. And she just was being dragged uh, as the dogs were kind of like tearing, I'm trying to tear her apart almost. Uh, and uh, eventually the Stansberries came out, uh, Bernie and Charlene. And uh, between the three of us, we it, it took us um, three of us to get the dogs off. You know, we were both trying to uh, do whatever we could to get them off her. And, you know, and eventually the dog, my dog got loose and she, she followed Charlene to the back of her house and was able to get into the house. The other dogs also followed her, but we were able to, uh, she was able to get Jazzy in the house without the other dogs. Um, I, I, in the meantime, was trying to call the police because I, 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 I couldn't call earlier because it was just, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't do, do the phone and trying to get the dogs off her. And, um, and eventually they came in and then uh, the fire department came into the uh, house and uh, PM. came into the house and Charlene's house and Bernie's house and uh, took care of my wounds and uh, looked at the dog and we ended up taking the dog to the our vet in, in Reading and, and those reports are in, uh, were submitted. So, uh, but, but again, if it wasn't for Bernie and uh, Charlene helping out, I don't know, I could have got the dogs off them. So, and I don't, and again, they had said uh, because of her thick skin being a golden, she was saved by that. Otherwise, it would probably couldn't have. Uh, and then they, they didn't attack the front as much as the back. But if again, the vet said that if they went for the front, there would have it would have been a different story. So that's basically you, the story. Mr. Colvin, we do have your written we do have your written report and okay. written re complaint with that information, which also included the pictures. Yeah. And I believe a report from the veterinarian, you took the dog, the dog was transported for treatment. Your dog was transported for treatment. We do have that also in the record. 
Okay. And do my colleagues have any questions for uh, Mr. Coveney? All set. Uh, Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions for Mr. Coveney? I do. Thank you. Mr. Coveney, uh, I am sorry for what you went through. I have a golden retriever too. And uh, I've put myself in your position in thinking about tonight's hearing. So I just have a couple of questions. Uh, how, do you know how much the veterinary bill was or has been to date for Jazz? Um, I didn't submit that yet, but it's, uh, it was, uh, I think 380 for the first, some, I don't have the bill in front of me, but 300 and something for the first bill and then a follow-up visit, another $50 or so. Oh, okay. So um, how long, Jazzy came home the same day? From the hospital, she well, yeah we came home and we called the vet immediately, and we uh, made an appointment that morning, early whatever time they could fit us in. But she was treated and came home to you the same day. Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, when your neighbors were helping and got Jazzy into into their house, right, or your house. Their house. Okay. How many, once Jazzy got in, were both dogs still there? Um, they were, I, I, Charlene will have to uh, testify that, but they, I was, I was trying to call the police at the time, but yes, they were following her, chasing her, and uh, Charlene had to close the door quickly to get Jazzy in and not let the other dog in. Okay. And when, I don't she, know if it was two of them or just one. Okay. Um, during any of this, was was anybody tr hitting uh, the two dogs? Yes, we were trying to. After I couldn't get them off from um, from them by pulling her off, we had to start uh, hitting the dog, trying to release it so it would release it, but it still wouldn't release it. I, uh, you know, it just they were locked on to the dog. Were you kicking them? Was anybody yes. kicking them? I too? kicked once, uh, one of them. I don't know about the other one. And uh, you said you got your hand got bit is while you were wrestling and trying to separate everything. I, I don't know exactly how it got bit, but I assume that was probably the case. Uh, do you know which dog bit your hand? No, I, I don't. I don't know the two different. The first one that attacked me, I assume. And did the dogs throughout this incident? Um, bite anybody else, bite either of your neighbors who were there trying yes, to separate things? They, they bought, he also, uh, Bernie got bitten also. And was that reported to the police? I don't know if it was. Was that reported to animal control? I don't know. That was Bernie and uh, I don't know. I did see the wound that he had, but I don't. it was on his other hand. Um, And uh, are you aware if Mr. Guide has offered to pay any of your uh, veterinary bills? Yeah, he offered, he came by to the house and offered, uh, said whatever I could do to help. Uh, was this, didn't specifically say that, but he uh, I applied by that. He, he, have you, like I said, and last time, I, you know, I, I feel the, dog, the, the whole purpose of this is that these dogs are dangerous and I'm willing to even, you know, put up the money to help, you know, the neighborhood. Uh, how soon after the incident did Mr. Guy come to your house? Um, I, don't, I think he tried to, uh, he, the next day, I believe. I, I don't remember exactly when, but. Was, was he apologetic? Did he take accountability? Um, somewhat. I mean, he, he uh, said he kept saying it was an accident with the dogs getting out. And I said, well, look at the results of the accident. Uh, you know, and, and, and it's not like the first time from what I could gather they've been out. But, but what is your firsthand knowledge 
uh, you've heard that the dogs may have got out before, but that's this is your first encounter with the dogs? Yes, for, for my dog. I know that a neighbor of ours had... Right, and we're going to get there because I'll show you how that story's inaccurate. We'll get there. But aside from the $430 that you've spent so far... Along with my medical bills, but I, I don't have all those bills yet, so... Because I, I also went to the doc to the clinic and had it looked at to make sure that because we weren't sure at the time whether it was rabies or, or not involved. But uh, they had, uh, like I said, the fire department patched up my uh, hand a little bit, band, you know, uh, wrapped it up. And then I went to the because it was bleeding and went to the uh, Winchester Clinic to have them look at it and. They didn't put any stitches in it because they said generally bite marks don't, they don't, they would not put stitches in. And have you submitted any pictures of those bite marks? On my hand? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. And has your hand healed yet? Yeah, basically it has. It's got a little lump on it, but the bite. Is it possible? I, I have the, well, I, they didn't take any, they, I have the uh, medical I uh, have to get a medical uh, from the Winchester Clinic. You know, they examined it. A medical what? The medical report okay. from the exam. Do you have that? I don't have that, but I could. It's, it... And who's your normal vet? Reading Animal Clinic in Reading. And my last question is, when you go to the Reading Animal Clinic, just for a routine visit. Um, how much is it just to have your dog examined? Uh, well, examined or with all the shots and everything else, it's usually a combination of things. You know, it could cost up to $500. Okay. Okay, thank you. And uh, I hope- Your attorney, uh, Colin. So. Okay, so just to, just to, to a couple of follow-up questions. So you were bit by the dog, Mr. Colvany. Yes. And your dog was bit by both dogs. Yes. Both of you required treatment and care for being bitten. Yes. And your neighbor was bit by the dog. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for providing your testimony and your written complaint. Um, there are a number of other individuals that are joining us that we also received written complaints from. So I just want to make sure that we give everyone the opportunity to testify. Uh, the Stansberries, the Stansberries are with us. Could you, if you're willing to provide your statement, could you identify yourselves for the record and uh, provide us with your statement? Charlene Spicer and Bernie Stansberry, 18 Juniper Road. Um, we appreciate you guys having this hearing and we are dog lovers and have owned dogs for 30 years. And we are requesting that the select board in their capacity take action against these dogs who have a documented vicious disposition. You have in the record the detailed account of the attack of um, and my husband and my involvement in trying to free the golden retriever. What I hope you take away from our police report is that the dogs attacked repeatedly. They did not respond to the actions of three adults and they tried to enter my home after and, and continue to attack the dog. When Dan was talking about that they went around the back of the house, the dogs chased Jazzy to the back of the house. When I came out the back of the house onto the porch in the back, they were attacking her again. They, she came up onto the porch, they came back up on the porch, attacked her, and then I was able, we were able to get her in the house and they stayed on the porch trying to get into the house. So it was repeated attacks. This is not one event where you shoo off the dog and they run away. This was multiple attacks within the same situation. Um, what haunts me from these attacks is watching my husband jump into the middle of the attack and my repeatedly dropping a large rock on the top of these dogs' heads, trying to injure them so that they would stop 
and the overwhelming sense in the middle of this attack that we weren't going to be able to save that golden retriever. Um, to the guides, I know that these dogs are probably lovely dogs in their home, but outside of their home, the dogs have singular focus is hunting and attacking other dogs. At this point, we all have to accept that whenever these dogs are outside their home, all other dogs in the area are at risk. I urge the select board to take all actions necessary to ensure that these dogs are not able to leave their property or have contact with any other dog. At a minimum, we would request the requirement for a fence with a double entry gate. The dogs when chained have previously attacked a dog that entered their yard. So allowing them to be chained in their yard leaves the risk of injury to others in place. Uh, with a heavy heart, we would support an order to euthanize the dogs. For any order put in place, we do request specific timeframes for compliance, identification of who is checking compliance, and the seizing of the dogs if any requirement is not met. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Stansberry. Do my colleagues, members of the board, have any questions? <coughs> Mr. Stansberry, is there anything you'd like to add to that statement? Uh, no, I think she covered it all, except, just with the exception of when the dogs were um, in the back on our deck trying to get into the, uh, I was in the middle of it there. And the only reason I was able to, 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 uh, to work it free at the time was we have a composite deck and the, the pit bulls could not gain traction on that. And I was able to, I was able to ward, uh, get them off enough to get them into the, uh, uh, into our house, but even when the dogs were into the house, the those pit bulls kept hitting the doors, just trying to get in to that. I, th I thought they were going to tear the door open, um, trying to get in. Okay. okay, thank you for your statements. Do my colleagues have any questions? Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's to um, Charlene Spicer. Question is in your statement to um, in in your previous statement that you submitted. Um, well, can you describe the bite to Mr. Stansbury? It was on his between his you know in the crook of his hand, and it was teeth marks. And do you know what dog did that? No. And did you get medical treatment for that? No. So this statement's accurate then. Um, uh, let's see, as Bernie discovered a small bite when he came in and washed up after everyone left, was that the extent of, of the punctures? Yes. Yes, my, our fa uh, her father, who's an epidemiologist, it, it, uh, asked me to get, get seen because of, of rabies, but I, I did not do so. Um, and can you, um, were both of you also trying to punch or kick the dogs to try to get them to stop? Yes. yes. And what kind of rocks did you drop on them? A large rock. It was a lot. It took two hands and I was dropping it directly on their heads to try. And there was no response from the dogs. And I, had, I, I did it several times. And I will freely admit if there's injuries on the dogs, that was probably what it was from, but they had no response. They just kept at the dog and kept ripping the dog. I, I mean, it was shocking. They had no response to that. And as you were um, dropping these heavy rocks on them, did they turn around and bite you? No. no. Okay. They just focused on, they were just completely focused on the dog, the jazzy. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for, doing what you did to rescue Jazzy. And I don't have anything further. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Cohen. Thank you for your statement. And we do have your written re written complaint as well in the record. So appreciate your coming to the hearing this evening. And our next, uh, the next complainants are Jenna and Chris Albano. And I do, I did see Jenna here. Would you be able to unmute and provide us with your statement? Hi, I'm Jenna Albano from 21 Maple Road. Um, my husband, Chris, is also here who had called the police department that night. Hi, thank you for joining us, Jenna. If you could just give us your statement as 
give us your statement of complaint. Um, it was just, I was in the neighborhood when the dogs had attacked. I had come up right after. Um, not a week later, I was in my kitchen. My son and his friend had just walked in and we went to go let my dog out. And I also had two six week old puppies here <clears throat> that I was fostering at the time. And as I went to open the door, I heard the dogs run up on the deck and I have a glass door, side door and a glass back door. I had one pit bull at each door okay. trying to get into my house. Um, I was banging on the door to scare them away as my husband was on the phone calling the police department because I knew the dogs were still supposed to be in quarantine. It's not the first time that they've been retrieved from my yard. Um, luckily, my dog has never been outside when they were in the yard, thankfully. But, you know, I just, I think they're really dangerous to other animals. And, you know, if someone gets in between, they could be potentially dangerous to the people trying to break up an attack. Thank you for your statement. Do my colleagues have any questions? Okay, seeing none, Attorney Cullen, do you have any questions? No? Okay, thank you. We have your statement. We appreciate your providing your written complaint and thank you for appearing to testify this evening. Thank you. Uh, we have another written complaint from Kevin and Stephanie Norwood. I, okay, I see you here. If you could unmute and please provide us with your name and address in your statement. Yep, Kevin and Stephanie Norwood, 7 Winterberry Lane. Thank um, you. Well, thank you for attending. And uh, we do have your written complaint. If you could just provide your provide the information. Uh, well, generally, it was just uh, more of a concern for the neighborhood and the well-being of, uh, of everyone else around. We consistently are walking our dog, who is much smaller than, than either of the dogs that would be spoken about tonight. So... Just general concern for the neighborhood. Um, I walk that area all the time. I have two little girls, uh, four and six, that God forbid they'd be around and uh, and be caught in the middle of something of this nature. So um, I just want to make sure that the things are handled here properly. Because usually, I, I mean, I take my two girls and my dog. He's a um, he only weighs thirty pounds. So if these two dogs ever got out with me, my girls and that dog, we don't stand a chance. So I would never want something to happen to my dog, nor um, my kids, you know, I feel bad of what happened uh, to Jazzy and, and he's 90 pounds. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what we would do. So it's, he, they're just, they're just very dangerous for this neighborhood. And we haven't been walking down there since we just, it's too dangerous. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your statement. Do my colleagues have any questions? Mrs. Gonzalez. Quinterberry is off of Central, correct? Is that... Correct. There's Tamarack and then a double cul-de-sac for Winterberry. You can um, you can go to the high school, so you can cut through Winterberry. Oh, you can cut them through there. To, well, it's safer to walk over there than obviously on Central. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was just trying to get that straight in my head. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, there is a, a walkway that the town and actually the developer of Winterberry actually put in, which connects to, to Juniper. Okay. And it is, it's, quite, it's quite well used by the students to get to school as I understand it, right? And there's quite a few kids on Winterberry. I can see you nodding, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there are quite a few people, that, quite a few kids that live there. And there are a lot of people that take their dogs walking through there from other mm -hmm. parts on, onto the, from Central Street also. Thank you. Okay. Attorney uh, Cone, do you have any there are, there are also a number of residents that uh, use the, uh, they go out for you know recreational walks, including my wife and I. My wife and I on regular occasions that uh, walk that way, and they go down through Winterberry and come back uh, through that walkway. Mm -hmm. It's pretty oh. heavily traveled. Yes, yes. Attorney Cohen, Quest, do you have any questions of these complainants? Yes, uh, for such a heavily traveled area. Um, it's pretty good that nobody's ever been uh, attacked by these dogs. So the people that just testified, what, I didn't catch their names. 
Kevin and Stephanie Norwood. Okay. And previously the board um, said that they had 13 complainants. Have you folks filed a complaint with the city, with the town? Yeah, we had written something. Okay. And, but is your complaint based on anything that's happened to you? No, we haven't lived in this area for just over a year now. And you said that um, you consistently walk your dog uh, in that area all the time. And during your times doing that, did either of the dogs uh, come out, get off leash and come over to you or threaten you or your dog or children in any way? Fortunately, not in our experiences. Okay. And um, how did you find out about the incidents that the incident that uh, caused this hearing? Uh, I saw Jazzy shortly afterwards, uh, within a couple of days afterwards, out for a walk and spoke to Dan and, and heard what happened. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next um, complainant is John Davis. We have a written statement. I'm not sure if he's here, but if you're here, Mr. Davis. I don't see him here. Do you, Mr. Gilberto? We have his written statement of concern that's been filed. Um, which is part of the record and we could read it into the record. Um, let me just go, just give me one second on that. So Mr. Davis's uh, statement um, was provided December 18th, 2020. He lives at 10 Winterberry Street. Madam Chair, may I be here before you read that? Sure. Uh, this particular document, well, it's in the record. Uh, the allegations made by John Davis It'd be I, ideally we could cross examine because we believe he, he has the wrong dog. He's talking about their old mastiff that that has passed away and he wasn't even at the scene. So he speaks about firsthand knowledge, but he wasn't there. And he, it, this actually doesn't have to do with the two dogs that are the subject here, or we believe it doesn't. Um, so my concern is if you read it in, read it in, then it's going to be accept it as true without a chance to cross-examine him. And I know the rules of evidence don't apply, but this is a pretty prejudicial document. So Attorney Cohen, I understand you're tackling this like it's a criminal proceeding, but I think from the board's perspective, every complainant's uh, complaint should be read into the record. Um, and you're, you're contesting that statement, I think, in terms of the, the credibility or the lack of factual knowledge of things, I think we could put on the record as well. Okay, um, is my approach not appropriate for a dangerous dog hearing? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I think you're, I believe you're objecting to me reading into the record, the complainant statement because he hasn't joined us. Correct. And I think it's, I think we owe this to the complainants because many of them were at the previous hearing and they may not be able to attend this one. And we did grant the continuance, as you know. So I, I think we owe it to the individuals that provided us a statement. And I think after reading it into the record, I'll, I'll ask you to make a statement to, I guess, address the statement that I'm gonna read into the record. Okay. If there's anyone that could not attend this evening's hearing. Thank you. So, so again, here's Mr. Davis's uh, statement that was provided. He lives at 10 Winterberry and it's on with regard to the dogs, Jaeger and Patron, the pit bulls owned by Edward Guide. He has complained that the dogs described in the complaint are uh, constitute a nuisance because they have a vicious disposition towards the animals, causes the following disturbance. It attacked the other dog and places children in fear when walking in the neighborhood 
Mr. Guide's pit bulls off leash attack Dan Coveney and his dog while walking and caused injury to both and another neighbor who came to his aid and it's signed by Mr. Davis. And it, it, Attorney Cohen, although you've made your statement, it, uh, you can certainly make it again for the record. Uh, I'll just call a rebuttal witness when appropriate. Thank you. Okay, M M Chief, okay, I have a bunch of hands here. Chief Murphy, oh, and then I'll get to you, Mrs. Gonzalez, Chief Murphy. Madam Chair, um, the animal control officer did respond to that particular call um, two years ago, and he is um, available to uh, provide testimony on that case. Sure, and, and we'll call him in rebuttal to attorney Cohen's rebuttal ah, witness. Okay. That's how we're going to tackle this, okay? So we're going to proceed with the next complainant that we have. And if they're not here, we're going to read it into the record because we owe the courtesy to these individuals who showed up for the public hearing, all right? So we have uh, Alexander Fershorn. I don't know if Alexander is present. And if not, I'm gonna read his statement into the record. Hi. Oh, welcome. If you could state your name and your address for the record. Sure, uh, Alexander Fershorn, two winter barrier lane. Um, we're right on the cul-de-sac connecting to June up the road. Okay. And yeah, I mean, similar to the Norwoods, we do not have, witnessed this attack. Uh, we haven't met these dogs in person. We just now live in the culture of fear that there are these dangerous dogs there. We saw the attack, the, basically the results of the attack from our window. We saw all the emergency vehicles pulling up, fire trucks, uh, police cars. My kids were, what is going on? And then we didn't know. We just thought it was, oh, you know, we're just checking on what's going on. And then we found it was an attack of a dog two dogs on another dog. And this gave me flashbacks to my own dog getting attacked on Thanksgiving, just like this several years ago, at my mom's house when I was there. And I ran outside to try to protect my dog. I also tried to wrestle these two dogs off my tiny dog, 15 pounds, as they were trying to rape her and bite her. And we brought her to the, the vet and she almost died. And I was so afraid. And I mean, this part's not in my statement, but it leads into the same culture of fear that all of us have now in this neighborhood because of these two vicious dogs. We didn't get attacked personally, but we all as a community got attacked. And that is what's important. And that's what we want safety from. I want my kids four years old, two years old, and just born two months old yesterday. We, I want them to be able to enjoy this neighborhood in peace without being afraid of these dogs running to attack us. We'd have to run to the house and I would put my life on the line to protect us. But I don't know if I could based upon what I hear they can do. So I'm just very afraid. And I want something to be done to take care of this, not just for our family or the simple attack or medical bills for poor Dan. I mean, that's not what's important here. What's important is the safety and the well-being and like the mindfulness of the community. That's what we care about. Just whatever will do that. I mean, whatever the, you know, that will make the, the guys comply to make us feel safe, anything, and as long as they stick to it, that would be a reasonable step. And that's what's important to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for appearing and providing your statement. Do my colleagues have any questions? Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions? Okay. Uh, next uh, individual that provided a statement was Amelia Pearsall. And I do think, welcome. I am here, hi. Um, hi. So yeah, so this is all in my written statement and I will state out that I did not have any personal interactions with the dog, with the dogs. But um, that morning I was walking my own dog who is a 20 pound Cavalier Spaniel on Winterberry Lane when I heard about the attack from a neighbor right after it happened. Um, so I was concerned. I was concerned for Jazzy. I was concerned for Dan. Um, a few minutes into my walk, I observed my two neighborhood kids walking their small dog back from the direction of Juniper Lane. Um, and it had happened in close enough time proximity um, that they saw the animal control trucks. And so then I started having panic attacks of what if it had been them and their dog. Um, I often walk that path. Uh, my daughter is a middle schooler. We would walk the dog to middle school um, in the mornings. Um, and I don't want to walk that way anymore. And I won't let my daughter walk that way anymore either. Um, and it's, it's just, 
it's just, it's sad because like, you know, there are, you know, seven of the 11 families on Winterberry have dogs and I'm sure many other families in that neighborhood also have dogs. And so it's just now the fear of not being able to take a nice little stroll in the neighborhood with my dog because he would have been a nice little snack and there wouldn't have been much that I would have been able to do. Thank you for appearing and providing your statement. Do all my colleagues have any questions for Mrs. Pearsall? Do you have any questions, Attorney Cohen? Yes, I do. Uh, Ms. Pearsall, uh, how long have you lived in the neighborhood? I've been here for um, a little over eight years. And do you know how long the two dogs have lived in the neighborhood? I do not. I have just had my dog for a year. Um, and so really didn't have much opportunity to walk that path before I got the dog and before my daughter started in middle school Okay. last year. In the last uh, six and a half years that the dog have, has, have lived there, have you ever walked past the house? Um, up Maple Road, no. So when I first moved in, it was a dirt road um, and my kids didn't wanna go trick or treating up there. So we didn't walk that way. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, and our next um, individuals that provided a statement were the Peabody's. Chris, I think, had, did join us? Yeah, we're here. Hi. If you could introduce yourselves for the record sure. and your address. Uh, Chris and Julie Peabody, 12 Winterberry Lane. Uh, so we're at the other end of the cul-de-sac. Uh, we have not had um, same interaction uh, with the dogs meaning direct. However, we're, we're new dog owners about a year and have two young kids, a 12 year old and a 14 year old who we had been sending uh, out on walks. Uh, like everyone, we were all home. We've all been home since March. So uh, they were doing the walks and had been going down uh, Maple Road uh, and again, the no specific incident that uh, caused any harm being off, though those dogs being off leash or anything, uh, but had witnessed them. So uh, we were very concerned. And then of course, when this happened, uh, we, we do not send them. And in fact, I'm not sure uh, how many times they've actually left the neighborhood uh, when they've gone to walk the dog now. Um, so we're extremely concerned with having young kids and a small dog uh, walking that way. Okay. Thank you for, for appearing and providing your statement. And do, do any of the, my colleagues have any questions? Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions? Uh, yes. How, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Peabody, how old are your kids? 12 and 14. And what kind of um, new dog do you have? Finish Spitz. How much does that dog weigh? 25. About 25, 30 pounds. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for appearing and providing your statement. And I believe there was one more um, complainant in the record, which is Leo and Lauren Lieboff if they are here to, provi to provide their statement. And if they are not, I'm gonna read it into the record. Oh, are you? Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, through you, so uh, we did receive an email over the weekend from uh, um, Lauren. I have uploaded it to the board's packet and attorney Cohen, I've also forwarded it to you by email. It's a one or two sentence email um, that I'm, I'm happy to read if, if it's easier for folks once you've read through their comments for the record. Sure, okay. So I have a, I have a statement um, from December, tw I'm sorry, excuse me. Just give me one second to scroll back to that. I have a statement from Leo and Lauren Leboff, Seven Maple Road, North Reading, Mass. It's about Jaeger and Patron, the pit bulls owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road. The dogs are a nuisance because they have a vicious disposition. 
and a written statement by Lauren Leboff saying, we have stopped walking past that house because when the dogs are out on the porch, they are barking viciously and we are scared if they get loose. And uh, Mr. Gilberto, was there anything else that you wanted to read into the record with regard to the email? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, is an email that we received um, over the weekend um, signed from Leo and Lauren LaBeouf. Uh, it says, uh, hello, this message is from Leo and Lauren LaBeouf. We live on Maple Road and in North Reading. We have heard about the episode you had with the pit bulls a few weeks ago. We will not be able to join into the Zoom meeting, but please know we are very much aware of how dangerous those dogs are. We will not walk down that road due to being afraid those dogs may be out, please know we are on your side. That uh, was sent to a recipient who's unidentified but forwarded to me over the weekend. Okay. By the resident. Attorney Cohen, do you want to make a statement with regard to their, the statement of the leave offs? Well, I'm just wondering how I'm looking to see who this, the recipient of that was, but how did it get from? So did it go to that recipient to Mr. Gilberto? It appears it was forwarded by the sender to me. So it was sent by them to the recipient and then forwarded to me. Okay. By, by the sender. So I, I'm not, it doesn't identify the sender. Uh, excuse me, the recipient. Okay. Is that anybody on the board's email address that you're aware of? No, I, for the record, it says Oakdale NR at gmail.com. Not, not to my knowledge, no. Okay, thank you. It's not an email address I believe I've seen used. Thank you. Okay, all right. Just for the record, Madam Chair, that uh, the, the LaBeoufs uh, live basically diagonally two, two homes away from uh, the house in question where these dogs live. They're just a stone's throw away, and I've been there for probably over 40 years. Okay. So I believe, um, Mr. Gilberto, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but is there anyone else who is attending this hearing that wants to be heard? I believe that was the extent of the written complainants received. But if there is anyone else um, who is presently attending this public hearing and wants to be heard with regard to this matter, if you could raise your hand. And I... I see none, so I'd ask Attorney Cohen if you could go ahead and present your witnesses. Uh, Madam Chair. Oh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Uh, sorry. Um, did excuse me, Attorney Cohen, just one I'm second. Sorry. I didn't see your hand up. I apologize, Mrs. Gonzalez. I just saw that we have a, another statement from John Davis, um, but the statement's given by um, the animal control officer. Are we reading that into? Do you, can you tell me what page you're? I'm on page 113. Yes, I apologize. I'm sorry, we're gonna, I'm sorry. I did not read that, although I know Attorney Cohen, that was part of the information that was presented. So let me just thank you for pointing that out. Let me just read that. That's the longer statement that was given to Officer Berg. Uh, December 18th, 2020, John Davis uh, at 10 Winterberry Lane. Two years ago, our pet Brady, a small Havanese mix, wandered into Maple Road and wanted to play with Mr. Guide's animals. They were outside and chained. Our dog did not understand when both dogs viciously attacked him. They bit and tore him from front to hind, 17 staples. And we had to, um, pry. Pry, pry our, I see, pry our dogs apart. It's very good printing, so I apologize. We, it's my glasses. We had to pry our dogs apart to save Brady. These dogs have also escaped off leash on at least two occasions in the past few months and had at least one altercation with neighbors and his pet while walking in the neighborhood. These dogs are vicious and but for the three adults, Mr. Coveney and the Stansberries, they would have killed the Coveney's pet. These dogs disposition is to viciously assault 
other dogs and they are a threat to the safety of the neighborhood pets and their owners. And that is signed by Mr. Davis. Um, and I don't know if there's anything, Attorney Cohen, that you want to respond to that. I'll give you the opportunity again to respond to that. Thank you. As a result of that incident, uh, Mr. Davis was cited because his dogs got off leash and ran into my client's yard. His dog got off leash and ran into my client's yard. There was no dangerous dog hearing. There was no citation for my clients. And um, it was their dog, Stoli, who's since passed away, a bull mastiff who passed away. So that's just what's important to know about uh, that, which is left out of his statement. So thank you. Um, Attorney Khan, uh, Mr. Davis was cited by whom? By your animal control officer for having a dog off leash that, that trespassed onto my client's property. Okay. Okay. I see, I'm sorry, I do see someone's hand raised, which is Mrs. Albano. Mrs. Albano, go ahead. I just wanna clarify that it was not Stoli that attacked that dog because I was outside when it happened and my daughter was at the end of the driveway and it was Jaeger and Patron. I think the dog that they're referring to that Stoli attacked was my Jack Russell. When we were out on a walk, Stoli was unleashed, charged out of the driveway and ripped my dog's neck open. So that must be who they're thinking of when they're talking about Stoli. But I can tell you that the Davis's dog was ripped apart by Jaeger and Patron because I was out there. Okay. Well, thank you for adding that clarity to that, uh, Mrs. Albano. And we'll also hear from Officer Burke too after Attorney Cohen, but please proceed Attorney Cohen. Okay, thank you. I didn't realize I was calling the dogs by the wrong name. I thought it was Jaeger and Patron. You don't drink enough. Yes, no, I, I don't, of course. <laughs> Isn't Patron with an E, not an A? No. Okay. Madam Chair. Okay, yes, please, Mr. Gilberto. One I, second again, Attorney Cohen, please, Mr. Gilberto. Did you see a comment that just came through in the chat from an individual named Lisa? Who oh, I, I apologize. Okay, yes. Came in, Madam Chair. So I, I don't, I don't see the person on the screen just yet. Mm -hmm. So, oh, I see you. If you could state your name and your address for the record. Okay, it's um, Mary Lisa Griffin, 9 Winterberry Lane. And I walked up to Maple Road. It was a couple of years ago. I, have a do I also own a dog who's small. And I wasn't aware of the dogs up there. So I was just strolling up with my dog when luckily they were leashed. They were all chained up, but they were vicious. They were barking at us and everything. We, you know, just turned around, walked away. And I've never, I never brought the dog up there again. And that is really, as you could ask anyone, no one wants to walk down Central Street with their dog. So you go over in that area and you're limited. And to have to avoid a whole road because of two dogs isn't fair to people that do like to take their dogs out for a walk. And I also saw Jazzy like the day after he got attacked. I saw the Davis dog the day after they got, he got attacked. So something needs to be done for these, to these dogs and to protect all these young kids that are around here now. Okay. That's, that's it. Thank you. Do my, my colleagues have any questions? Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions? Yes. What kind of dog do you have? A bug, a uh, Boston Terrier, um, Pug mix. And uh, at any time, how long have you had the dog? Uh, approximately 10 years. She's, she's 14 and a half now. I got her when she was about four and a half. When people walk past the house or dogs walk past the house, does she ever bark? She'll let out a bark. She'll just bark, but it's not a vicious, it's not a vicious bark and her tail's wagging and she will wander up to them to get pat. So they pat her. And where are you getting your definition of vicious from? Growling, teeth showing. I've owned dogs uh, most of my life. So I, 
I feel like I can tell the difference. And you know that a growling dog or a teeth showing dog is a dog that's telling you it's uncomfortable, right? Um, yeah, but I'm not, I wasn't walking towards them. I was walking up the street. Okay, thank you. Okay. That's good. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, Attorney Cohen. Um. Thank you. Uh, so uh, briefly before we get to our witnesses, uh, just to sort of build off a theme from last time is uh, in six and a half years, we have one week worth of incidents that were recordable. Whatever else anybody who came here tonight had to say, they either didn't witness anything, nothing's ever happened to them, or um, it, it was never reported to animal control officer. And I certainly can understand fear, but let's have fear about, about based off the facts. And these dogs are not human aggressive. There's been no testimony that they're human aggressive. There's been a lot of testimony how they've been uh, focused on dogs and hit and, and hit and kicked and had big rocks dropped on them, but yet they didn't attack any humans. So everybody who's saying the what ifs about children in the neighborhood, none of that has ever happened. And these kids have been there for, and these dogs have been there for six and a half years. So let's all just understand this is dog on dog aggression. And now you're going to hear how my clients who need to manage their dogs better have, have started to do that. Uh, and they've been in compliance with the muzzle order. Uh, one dog has a flat muzzle, one has a basket muzzle. And it, it's, it's things that they got out during the quarantine, but you know what, since, they, since they, they, they're taking this very serious, they have things in, in place at their house uh, to better manage these dogs. And, and they're moving uh, out of state in, in the summertime. So uh, they certainly want to bring some sense of security to the neighborhood. And I'm going to share with you that through their testimony, some of the things that they're doing. And uh, the first person uh, to testify will be um, Pam Flynn. Pam, are you? Yes, I'm, yeah. Okay, there she is. And she already uh, was sworn in. So Pam, uh, can you just tell us uh, how you know the guides and how you know uh, Jaeger and Patron? Uh, yes, hang on one second. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not privy to electronics. I'm good with dogs, but not electronics. Okay. Um, Yes, I, I was their dog walker for about four years. I have a question. Are you showing us something on your screen? No, you, I don't know what I did. Because you just uh, showed your screen. Mr. Up. Gilberto, I think it's probably best if you exclude the share screen ability so we can just hear from the witness. Okay. Okay, we're back. Okay. So can you okay. start again with uh, how you know the guides and the dogs? I Yes, I, uh, I met Eddie... Uh, and actually at the, um, I think it was the hornet's nest. He was, he, I had a sign saying dog walking services and he asked me if I would be willing to walk his two dogs because he worked many hours during the day. Um, so, so I, did you walk I was, dogs? yes, I did. Yes. For how long a period of time? Um, three to four times a week, half an hour, sometimes twice a day. Uh, for about four years. Okay, so can you share your observations of the dogs with the board, please? Yes, um, I have not, I, as a trainer, uh, he also hired me to do a, a training walk while I was walking them to do some obedience work with them. Um, they're very excitable dogs, but certainly very trainable. I have not had Personally, I'm just giving you my own personal experiences with them. I had them under complete control. I walked both dogs on my left side at heel during daytime hours where there were people about. I walked around the high school, uh, lots of high school people out. Um, dogs in their yards would be running up to fences. And, you know, they would definitely become excitable. But 
I had good control over the dogs as an obedience trainer. Um, and I never had any instances. Stop and talk to people that were out in the nicer weather. I would be talking to people outside and both dogs would be on a sit command and quietly be sitting there waiting for me to move on. So my experience with them, I've not ever had any issues with them personally. And uh, so while you were walking the dogs, did they ever get off leash? No. And um, what is your opinion of the guides in terms of um, their ability to work with their dogs? Um, well, you know, most people have difficulty working with, the, with dogs because unless you have experience, you know, that, that would be like me trying to run Eddie's equipment. I, you know, he could teach me, but I, I wouldn't be doing, I wouldn't be very good at it. Having said that, I think that with, with them working with a trainer, I think that they would be able to, they need to learn the skills. Most people don't have the skills to work with dogs in general. So if they had a trainer work with them and learned better skills in management and had better management, I think that um, things would probably calm down a little bit in the neighborhood. Uh, definitely, definitely better management with the dogs. Absolutely 100% better management with the dogs. Can you tell us a little bit about um, break down dog aggression, dog on dog versus dog on human and how um, they're, they're on complete separate tracks in the dog's brain and um, what you know about the, the, the difference between the two? Well, all aggression stems from the fight or flight instinct. So when an animal feels in danger, one of two things will happen, or three, I should say, they will either fight, flight, or freeze. Some animals will have the tendency to freeze. Others will want to run, which are the more timid dogs, and others will fight if they feel that they are in danger, but it's always stemming from the dog feeling threatened by the other dog walking by, even though that dog was no threat to them in their mind they were threatened by that dog that's what that that's why they did and then often what happens when they're be attacking something or another animal that they were momentarily ago being threatened by that while the dog is on the ground that's being attacked it now becomes prey so now the prey drive kicks in too nice. so those are the factors that we're working with is the fight or flight and then the prey drive kicking in. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's dog or people, it's just they're not threat, they don't feel threatened by people, but they do feel threatened by other dogs. They have been around people since they were young puppies, but they've not been around other dogs. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say that because there were uh, occasions where I had another person walking with me because I wanted to work with them around other dogs. And we would bring another dog with us. And those dogs were actually able to walk with the other dogs. Okay. So I guess my question is, what do you say to people who are legitimately scared? Because right now this group uh, has been led to believe that if a dog can do that to a dog, it can do it to a person. How do you explain that? There's dog on dog aggression, there's dog on human, and they're separate, given the history of these dogs not attacking people. Um, I certainly understand their concerns. Dogs can, it, it, dog on dog aggression and dog on people aggression can be both separate, but they can also be, you can have a dog that's, that's aggressive with both dogs and human beings. So. But to my knowledge, knowing what I've known, I've known these dogs for several years, although I haven't seen them for two years because I live in South Carolina now, I've not ever seen them show any aggression towards people, only towards other dogs. But if you, if I'm, when I was working with them and I was 
indicating to them that I wanted them to just keep mind their business and keep moving forward and going along with me and to avoid ignore the other dogs they did so just fine so dogs can can be man but dogs if without training they're just reactive and 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 it just depends on the breed and the variations within the breed i have a pit bull myself she's quite docile um so, so Vince, you've you've been here for the entire hearing tonight Yes. You've heard all the testimony from, from yeah. the people in the neighborhood? Okay. Uh, yes, and I, I'm certainly, you know, the, the, the dogs must be secured that it, it, for, the, for the sake of the, the people in the neighborhood um, feeling comfortable enough to walk down their street, um, the, the dogs have to be better secured. I have a very docile pit bull, but because she is a pit bull, she is always going to be secured behind a fence no matter what, because even though she's a very, very passive dog, she might go after a dog if she sees one walking by my house. Okay, so I wanna bring you home to this hearing, okay? My question is this, and let me finish it, please. You've heard the testimony tonight, right? Mm -hmm. And based on what you've heard, we understand these dogs can be definitely dog aggressive and we're, we're there. From what you've heard, are these dogs targeting humans? No. No, if they would, if they were targeting humans, then other people in that situation would have been bitten. It's very common to be bitten trying to break up dog fights because dogs are just in that heat of the moment and they're fighting. And when they feel something grabbing at them, their call is to be pulling, trying to be pulled off. They're, they're going to bite the hand. That's happened. That happens very often. So if is there something redeemable about these dogs by the fact that they were being kicked punched, had rocks dropped on their head, and they didn't bite those people. Is, it, is yeah. that a good thing that we can- Absolutely. Oh, to? yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Okay. They certainly could have retaliated, but they did not. And knowing these dogs and the guides, if they have muzzles on uh, permanently when they're outside the house, if they're on a run only with adult supervision in the yard, and if they're not walked in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, Are those significant enough restraints that can be put in place to keep the keep everybody safe? Yeah, well, I would go one step further for the sake of the neighborhood. I would secure a fence around them. The leashes cause a lot of anxiety with dogs because of the because of the constant pulling on the on the dog's neck that makes the dog feel very trapped and then they feel a little more vulnerable. So leashes and restraints like that cause, can cause uh, more anxiety in, the do in dogs. So, I mean, they can set up a dog, there's dog kennels that you can just pre-assemble and put them in the kennel outside. And, but they should be with people outside, yes, with the, with the muzzles on. And you think you've seen the guides have a, uh, a kennel? They had a kennel at one point, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, do do the, my colleagues have any questions uh, for Ms. Ms. Flynn? Mr. Studo. Ms. Flynn, so just to clarify, uh, just because of that exchange at the end there, um, so you do recommend, or if we don't want to use the word recommend, but you do believe that a fence would be appropriate. Or a kennel situation, yes, a kennel, yes. Well, no, but that's what I mean. I'm trying to get to that because I don't, you know, I, I have a 23 pound rat terrier who, you know, hides in the spare basement as soon as, you know, the Amazon guy comes. So I don't have that problem, but, um, so, but is it a kennel? Like kennel to me means like a little house with a door. Is it a kennel or is it a all around fence? Which it's one is an it? All, it's an all around. You can buy them at Tractor Supply or Home Depot there. You can just pre-assemble. It's okay. a fence links, of, the fence panels that you can just pre-assemble that would be kennel, that can kennel them in. 
rather than having them on leashes that would secure them, that would be m more secure for them. So you weren't actually talking about an actual like fence, like- Oh, like perimeter that. fence, no. No, but That's these are clarify. these are fences. These are these are these are uh, a kennel situ. These are corrals, if you will, for dogs with with tops on them. Okay. Although they're not climbers. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Do any of my co other any other colleagues have any questions, Mr. O'Leary? Just uh, getting back to the dog on dog aggression and dog on human aggression. Uh, if you've got a dog on dog aggression taking place and human trying to break it up, dropping rocks on the head, <laughs> um, where is the focus of the dog going to be, do you think? On the other dogs. Right. Okay. And, and then as far as, um, your experience with these with these dogs, you, you said they're very excitable. Uh, they were never off the leash with you. Uh, no. Very excitable, and you indicated. Uh, and I know it's been two years since you've you've walked them and trained them. Um, that the owners need better management skills in order to manage their animals, manage their dogs. You know. Well, therefore, they're they're following the the instructions or the. Um, what, what was required of them. So as far as uh, I know, they're wearing the muzzles and they're not outside. No, no, I understand, I understand that they're, yeah. under, they're under some orders right now, right. but, but you, you indicated based upon your experience, your four years, four, three to four years, yeah. uh, or four years in, in walking these dogs, uh, after your tenure uh, with the guides, you stated that you indicated they still need better management skills of their dogs and basically you need to train the owner sometimes. This is why dog owners sometimes go get the training to hire people their dogs like me to dogs. come in and train their dogs, right? No, yeah. but, uh, let's not let's not talk over one another, please, right. because it, it's really hard to hear both of you on Zoom, but it's also hard for to be recorded. So um, during the time that you you worked with the guides and worked with the dogs, are you aware of the of the guides ever going for? training for themselves in order to assist them in better managing their dogs? I worked with Eddie a little bit here and there, but Eddie was often very busy because he worked long hours during the day. So I didn't often see them. I never saw Danielle and I did see Eddie only once in a while. Right. Obviously they needed you to come and assist and they walk the dogs because they're very busy people. And I, and I know yes. that they work hard. They're very hard workers. Okay. So, so that again, your recommendation was it would be that that would certainly have assisted them in, in better controlling their dogs if they had adequate training and how to manage their their pets well I, I mean i thought their management of the dogs were fine they were in the house during the day they were not left alone outside on leashes or any you know they were in the house and i would go take the both dogs and i handled both dogs myself um, with no problem. I, I Sometimes I had an assistant with me and other times, most of the time I did not. I was by myself with both of those dogs and walking them by myself. So, and I did not have any issues with them. As far as the skill set of, of the average person trying to do the training and, and work at long hours, he hired me to, to do the training for him. Correct, right. but, but, but again, so the dogs would react differently to you as the trainer than to Mr. Guide as the owner. Until Eddie started working with the dogs himself, yes. Right, okay. And but it, I mean, they still would have, they still would have an understanding of the commands for Eddie to be able to um, work with them. It, I was just trying to help him make it a little bit easier so they were not pulling on the leash so much. And, and, and again, we, we had some testimony here that we had uh, three adults trying to give some commands to the dogs when they were dog on dog that were non-reactive to the adults. Right. And totally dog on dog aggression. And as you just stated, uh, that's where the dog's attention would be, would be on the other, other dog, correct? Yes, because the adrenaline, now the dog is being taken, the dogs that are fighting are, are in a state of adrenaline. So they're not hearing anybody that is saying anything to them. And I've, I've been in situations with other dogs 
not Eddie's dogs, but in, in just situations where through my career, I've had dogs that got into fights. They don't hear anything around them. They're in the fight. They're in the heat of the moment. And so they're not, and, it, and, and I don't know if you, if you ever been in a fist fight with anybody, but you probably wouldn't hear people screaming at you. It's just the, when you're in that situation and there's adrenaline involved, nothing else is being hurt. So they did what they had to do to stop. You know, I'd like shit. to put myself in the category of your passive, uh, personal passive pit bull. I don't get into fist fights, uh, usually verbal, but. Uh, no, I'm just, you know what I mean. Yeah, so I do, I do. adrenaline is involved, it's, yeah. it's very hard for. To now, get are, you, are you familiar with uh, a terminology that someone else would testify to the, the double entry gates, in, in, like in the kennels? Mm, I, I, yes. Uh, I, I know I've heard her say something about double entry gates. Like I was trying to picture what that looked like. Uh, just the gate or the whole fence. Well, I, I think it's like a, a little penned in area inside a bigger, oh, Okay. Area, I, I believe. Are you familiar with those at all and how they work? So, you know, as you're taking the dog out of the, out of the house is a smaller area and then you let it into the bigger area. So I see what it's you mean, from right? one area to another. Mm -hmm. area. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you say that these, these kennels that you, um, suggest may, may assist, they do have, how tall do they have to be so that these dogs can't escape and you said that they have, some of them do have a roof to our top to them? You know, these dogs are not climbers. They, you can, gosh, I've got, you can get them seven feet tall. Mm -hmm. you, and you can just, you can have it as big or as small, you can get them as small as five by fives and, or you can add more panels and make them 10 by 10s. Now, in, in relation to your uh, understanding of these two two animals, if I were to walk by the house without a dog, and one of those dogs got loose, what do you think its reaction would be? Would it be threatened by a human? Would it be threatened by me? You know, should, that's, I, should, I, should I be concerned? I do not believe that they, in my opinion, just knowing Jaeger and Patron, they've been around enough people. I do not think that they believe that they are threatened by people, feel threatened by human beings. I think it's mostly they're triggered by dogs. The, uh, the, the, one of the reasons I ask is uh, yesterday, I, I happened to live close by and, and I decided to walk up Maple Street a short distance. And I, I got to the house before the guide's house and the dogs were inside the home and were acting extremely aggressively at the uh, slider mm -hmm. on the side of the door that could see the a view down Maple Street. Uh, no other animals, uh, extremely aggressive, barking, hitting at the door. What if the door were open? Would it, I mean, I would be fearful, I, I am fearful of, of dogs that are aggressive like that anyway, but I was just trying to see what was going on. And, and that, that's what the reaction I got out of those dogs without even being on the property line yet. Should, should I be concerned? Should any of our neighbors here be concerned Well, without a dog? They did the same thing to me when I would pull up in the driveway and they would hear me, they would be doing the same thing. But then when I walked into the house, even the first time I've ever met them, they were doing that. And then I walked into the house and if they were human aggressive, that first time I walked into the house, they would have come after me and they did not. So that's, you know, you know, I can't give you a guarantee that that would never happen. That would be dishonest of me to say, oh no, it would never happen. Dogs are very territorial by nature. But what I'm saying is when I never knew these dogs and the first time I went to that house, they were barking at the door and I walked in and I was not being threatened by either one of those dogs. Yeah. It just or I didn't feel question. like I was in danger of those dogs being attacking. Just me. one other question. If, if, um, if the owners of the dogs had uh, better management, as you put it, uh, and better training in order to manage their dogs better, does that change the aggression 
towards other dogs? Yes, that can be changed. Yeah. Many, many, and I've done it myself. I had a Rottweiler that was very dog aggressive. I spent a lot of time working with her and I had a, a very, very well behaved off leash Rottweiler and a shepherd who was very dog aggressive. So but yes. In order, for that, in order for that to work, does the owner have to be present in order to command the dog or will the, can the dogs be- Yeah, well, you're dog? talking about a lot, you know, you have to, there's six or seven year old dogs now. Right. So you, yes, you can change the pattern of behavior of the dogs. But that's something that is that can't be done overnight. That you're talking about something that would take a long time to do. In most cases, dogs need to be managed by the handler or the person that's that that's, they're taking their cues. A trained dog will take their cues from the handler or the person that's with them. That's why I had no trouble with them when I was well. They that's took. Right. I was just going to say. So the, in the, for the four years you were there, it was mostly you. Yeah, I was the one during the day. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Do my colleagues have any, any of my, my other colleagues have any questions? I do have a couple. So just let me understand. So you were training the dogs for the guides? Well, yeah, to not pull on the leash because they they tended to pull, you know, be a little draggy on the leash and, and he needed them, them to have some skills in the house, sit, stay, down, stay. Um, come when they're called and, and it's mostly walking them on the leash because he him and Danielle like to walk them at night and uh, they just were a little pulley so they oh. wanted me so you did that training and dog walking for four years uh, on and off yeah okay but not for the past two years correct and that's when these two attacks that you heard have occurred in the past. I just of heard years. about this, this recent one. I did not know about the other one. Okay. Well, we heard about an attack when the dogs got loose of another dog. Right. I just learned about that one. I did not know previously about that other attack. Dad, the other one happened within the past two years as well. Yeah. Okay. So there were two attacks in the past couple of years where two dogs were ripped apart. Okay. And I, I, I think, you said the dogs in their minds, they're being threatened by those dogs, even when those dogs aren't threatening them. So they're attacking them. That's why they're attacking them. It's, I just it's, want to make sure I understand It's the fight or flight instinct. So yeah. it just happens just because there's another dog near them. They yeah. get that fight or flight. It, if they, yes, because they've not had the socialization when they were younger. They're, they've not been around other dogs. Okay. So they're, they're insecure about other dogs. So, but those dogs, I'm trying to understand how you're saying they can't be aggressive to humans when we've had testimony. They, they actually bit two people, chased a, chased a woman to her door, and you don't think that that's aggression towards humans? Well, I'm just not understanding. I thought they were they were breaking up a fight, and that's how the the bite occurred. Correct? Is am I correct? That's how one of the bites in that incident occurred, and the other bite was when they were chasing the two individuals that were breaking the fight up. Happened, and that's not aggression to humans. Testimony to that? Yeah. Yes, we did. They were both happened while while the fight was going on, while the dogs were. Uh, they were trying to separate the dogs. I specifically asked that. And the um, dogs ran after the neighbors and and until the neighbors could get Jazzy into the house. That's what the testimony the was. No, and then the neighbors chased the dogs home and the dogs didn't turn around and bite the neighbors. So I think you're reading into some testimony that yeah, wasn't often. Sure. No, I think I'm not reading into it. I think I'm pretty clear on that. But no. re even if you even if you just let's confine it to one bite of a human, that's not aggression towards a human? She's asking you. Oh, she's asking me. You don't think a bite of a human is aggression towards a human? Of course, yes, of course we can call that aggression, but is it is it a bite because they're breaking up a fight or were they going after the other dog and then the, the person got bitten in the, in the interim? So, I mean, there's a lot of factors as far as, but were they deliberately going after the human to attack the human? 
that would be a whole different story. If they were if they were seeking out the human being deliberately to attack that person, that to me is a whole different story. That's a different, that's different than in the heat of a moment where they're going after the other dog and the human being was there. Okay, but human beings walking by them, which we heard testimony, and they're growling and, and uh, you know, being vicious in their actions towards human beings that are walking by in the neighborhood. Because we heard multiple people say they've not even walking by anymore. They're not taking the walks anymore because they're scared. So that to me would, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree that that's showing aggression towards humans? Well, I'm just, my experience is myself with those two dogs. I've walked by many, many people with those dogs. Both, and I was handling two, two 75, 70 pound dogs and I only weigh 120 pounds. I handled both 70 pound dogs by myself walking by people and by houses that had other dogs outside. And I was able to manage those dogs just fine. I had no trouble with those dogs and they never showed any, any aggression towards people at all. And they were- I've never always... seen them be aggressive towards people myself. Okay. And they were, but they were always on leashes with yes. you mm -hmm. and you stopped training them a couple of years back. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, just, uh, just, oh, Mr. Mr. O'Leary. Just, just, uh, follow just one follow-up question for uh, Ms. Flynn and then a, a question for uh, Attorney Cohen. Maybe he can, maybe he has someone else coming up as a witness. But uh, Ms. Flynn, the, what do you have any, uh, what, what training do you have in dog behavior in training? Is it self-taught or did you get trained somehow, somewhere? I'm self-taught. I've been doing it for 30 years and I have had some working with other trainers through the years um, for Thank different behavior, for behavior problems, dogs with behavior problems. Thank you. I, 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 I should have asked you up front. <laughs> Thank right. you for that. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, just for attorney uh, Cohen, um, is anybody walking or training the dogs now? And, and for the last two years, has anybody been walking and training as Ms. Flynn did for the prior four years? Uh, they're not walking off property right now, but that's now like within the last month. Um, I'll have Danielle Guide's going to be on in a second. She yeah, just, so, so over the, since in the last two years, you know, who, who's I don't think they've had a trainer. Of anybody. And then, um, you know, has there been any additional training or, or any additional um, uh, assistance given to the guides, professional assistance. So my understanding uh, yeah. about that is, I mean, part of bringing in Boston dog lawyers, you bring in the people that we know. So there's a trainer ready to come to who works with the owners and the dogs. And um, it's all one, one unit who will come to the house and we'll work with all of them. So uh, that's going forward. I'm just wondering what in the, the cusp time here in the last two years, you know, what's, transpired, um, what assistance has been asked for and rendered, and uh, what was the magnitude of that assistance? We'll be able to address that in just a couple minutes with Danielle. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All set to All my set. colleagues? All set? Okay, thank you, Ms. Flynn. Attorney Cohen? Okay, let's uh, hear from Danielle Guide, please. Hi. There you are. Hello. Danielle, how long have you owned these dogs? Uh, six and a half years. And um, what happened um, on the night before Thanksgiving that these dogs got out? I was at work, so I just know on Eddie's standpoint that he went to open a door or whatever early in the morning and the dogs got out. He changed, went down the street, but saw the dogs turning back. So got them inside. That's kind of the story I know. And then what um, Dan Coveney was saying. Um, and have you reached out to the Coveneys? That night, uh, we talked to Jerry or that day, and 
He said that not to go over there. He wanted to talk to them, but we were immediately, you know, sorry. I mean, it was definitely something that we didn't want to happen, but apologetic told Jerry to have them reach out immediately. You know, let's cover their bill. He said that he would drop off something in the mailbox for us. Um, nothing ever came. So I, it was the night before Thanksgiving. So, I mean, clearly holiday stuff. We didn't want to bother him. Um, Eddie wanted to go down the next day, but I told him it was Thanksgiving. Just talk to Jerry. Um, Jerry said he was getting everything squared away with the, you know, vets and all of that. So then the day after Thanksgiving, I said, you know, um, write a note with your phone number, just in case go over there. Um, just because of COVID and stuff, drop something in his mailbox, but I guess he was home. So he was able to talk to him and, you know, whatever well, we can do. All right. Well, you, you could talk to him right now. <laughs> yeah, I know we are very sorry and it stinks. It has to come to this or whatever, but you know, we feel horrible for the dog and stuff. Had you ever seen Jazzy before? This no, no. Mm -mm. Um, and just to answer a question out of sequence to um, Mr. O'Leary's question, when Pam moved and stopped walking and training the dogs, she said it was about two years ago. Is that, is that how you remember it? Yeah, probably like, I don't, I don't know if it was two or a year and a half or something like that. Yeah. Uh, did you hire somebody else after her? No, because we would take Pam's training and go from there. But we would usually just walk late at night when no one's out after work, after dinner, probably be like eight or nine o'clock. And when you walk the dogs, um, did, did they ever get loose from you? They and, have the choker collars and stuff like that and harnesses. Um, do you agree though, that, uh, the training has to be repetitive, consistent, and do you agree that you and Eddie probably need some additional training on management, managing these dogs? I think it's just hard with everything that's been going on right now with medical and financial stuff. And it's no excuse. Um, but we do anytime I'm home, I sit there and train them. So and I do take her. What's been different about the two years or a year and a half or, or so since, since Pam, you said there were medical and financial issues. Has, what prevented you from, from hiring another trainer? Well, I'm usually working anywhere from, it could be eight hours a day to up to 14. Um, so Eddie came through medical issues with like a liver transplant and stuff. So I don't know if anyone knows anything about that. It's extremely hard to even get out of bed. You're basically on your death sentence. So it was harder for him to train the animals or even go out during the day. So it kind of decreased at that point but I would pretty much have to do it at night. So now knowing about this week from Thanksgiving to December 2nd, this week in the six and a half year life of these dogs, um, how do we know you're going to engage a trainer? Do you have the means to engage a trainer? If when I speak about the, the person coming down to your house, is that, is that viable? Do you understand that, that needs to happen? Yeah, if the trainer needs to happen, I mean, we're definitely willing to do it. It'll help out. Um, I mean, I'm willing to, I mean, they're not even going to go out anymore if that's what needs to happen. So basically what we've been doing since November. But they go in your yard? With us on a leash with a muzzle. Okay. So are they ever in your yard alone anymore? No, not since November. And as far as... Um, activity outside the house being triggers for the dogs. Have you taken any steps to try to prevent that? Close, either putting them in the back of the house during the day or closing the curtains? Yeah, I mean, the windows all around the house, there's sliders everywhere. So I mean, of course, seeing something or someone, they bark. There's definitely no growling. They don't growl, but they bark. So I just try to shut the shade. But if I'm home, what's usually failed to say is, you know, even when the dogs are on the out back or whatever on the deck, they go to bark. I'm there immediately letting them inside the house, telling them no, or whatever, um, to get them back inside. So they're not sitting there barking at someone constantly. Okay. And, um,
are the dogs are siblings is that right yeah they're brothers okay and did you get them together at the same time yeah aside from pam uh have you had anybody else work or train the dogs um i think it was i mean there might have been like one or two other people briefly maybe for like a month or two but then we got pam and they were great with her. I thought the training skills that she gave us were good. So we stuck with Pam. Okay. And um, have you, I'm pretty certain you've had a chance to read through uh, the statements that were talked about tonight, including um, the recommendations from the animal control officer? Uh, muzzling and leashing. Right. Is that have you had conversations with the animal control officer uh, since that week? He would show up regularly. Okay. And uh, have there, has there been since, let's say, um, let's say December 31st, that's the day that he put the muzzle order in that's continuing through now. So almost, almost a month. Uh, have you been cited for anything? Yeah, having just the unlicensed, which we're waiting for this, so. Okay, and um, I, regarding the unlicensed, it was my advice that we to make sure they're not gonna euthanize your dogs first before you license them, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and if, if your dogs are allowed to stay with you, uh, do you anticipate licensing them soon? Yeah, we, would, we would do it tomorrow morning. Okay. That's not a problem. Uh, tell us about the muzzles that you purchased. So can you hand me this? Basically, I mean, a little struggle at first, but we have a couple, each dog prefers something different, but we have almost like the basket one, which fits Patron better. Um, he tends to not have an issue with that one. So that goes on him uh, before we even exit the door. So the doors to remain closed, we put them on the leash um, hold the leash double wrapped and then muzzle goes on him uh, one dog at a time. So usually the other ones inside are in the kennel. And then the flat one almost looks like you don't have a muzzle, but it's keeps your mouth completely closed, which tends to be a little bit better for Jaeger. Um, so he's been doing that one, same routine. Okay. And I don't know if you have or not, I, and I'm not sure if you're even allowed to, but if you have to take the dogs to the vet or something, um, are you muzzling them in and leashing them in the house, bringing them into the car, leashed and muzzled? I mean, we haven't gone out anywhere, but yeah, that's how it would be as if they were on quarantine. And then the same, if you pull back into the house, they got to be leashed and muzzled from the car into the house. You know that. Right. right? Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, you earlier today shared with me uh, your insurance policy, correct? Yeah. Okay. And I, I have forwarded that to town council. Uh, just Tony Riley, if you can acknowledge receiving the insurance policy from, uh, from me. Mm -hmm. That's been since 2016 too. It's okay. been in effect. I'll continue while we wait for him. Um, Madam Chair. Mr. Coberto. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Are you all set, Attorney Cohen? Or did you uh, have more questioning of your witness? I do, but I had interrupted to ask Attorney Riley or even Mr. Gilbert if they received the insurance policy uh, that my client supplied. Okay. I, I mean, go, go ahead, Mr. Gilberto. So yes, we, we did receive a copy of a policy. I do believe that there are some questions that Attorney Riley could probably speak to with regard to that policy, um, but I did put it in the share file folder as well. Um, it, it was a policy that was dated uh, beginning in June of 2020 to, July, to June of 2021. Um, but I think there were some questions about what it actually covered. I have the, uh, for Jeremy, was that policy, I confirmed it with the agent. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, Mike. I seem to have lost my audio for some reason. We can hear you now, yes. 
Can you hear us? I, I lost my audio. I'm going to try, try to find it again. We, we can, why, why don't we hear from Attorney Riley at the end if we need to? I think it's 20 past 10. It's getting rather late. So I think if we could just proceed with the witnesses, Attorney Cohen, and I'll let, my, I'm sure my colleagues might have questions for Mrs. Guide. So if you can just proceed, Attorney Cohen, we can talk about the insurance later. Okay. Uh, so Danielle, when you say you spoke to your agent about the insurance, you asked if it, it would cover um, the docs? Yep. Yeah, he confirmed it, which I think I forwarded to you. And it's um, renter's insurance? Yes. Uh, we've heard from Ms. Flynn that descent, trying to train the dogs and desensitize them to, to other dogs, which are, seem to be triggers for them, it could take a while. Are you willing to at least consider with a behaviorist or a veterinarian who understands behavior uh, to uh, possibly medicate your dogs with some type of um, an anti-anxiety medication, something that will uh, turn their engines down a little bit so they can be a little bit calmer? Yeah, I mean, if that's something we had to turn to or talk to a vet or something like that. And you were asked to, um, to consider removing the dogs from your property, right? Yeah. Okay. And you don't want to do that? No, I mean, I've reached out to multiple people. Some people are supposed to get back, but at this point, they can't, and I'm leaving anyway, so. So tell us about your plans. I have a house built, being built, so we're actually getting out of town. I was hoping within two months, but it might be a little bit longer, but it shouldn't be too long. Okay. So we won't be in North Reading. Um, but you are now, so we need safeguards. What is your commitment level to the safeguards that we've discussed and that you've seen or discussed with the animal control officer? Yeah, I mean, basically it's still muzzling before exiting, leashing. Um, when they go out for their bathroom trip, we'll do a quick little exercise, but they're not gonna be on the chain or anything at this point until we're out. And what do you do to prevent them now from uh, getting out the door? Okay. Um, there's a couple of gates, but basically one of the sliders that was the incident actually has like a double lock. So that's just to remain closed at all times. So do you now have internal gates before the door inside the house so that there's a, a barrier before they could just come to the door? Yeah. Usually one of the doors we just keep shut at all times now. Um, but we're supposed to be getting another gate just for precautionary. Okay. So that's a backup to make sure they don't get out the door. Any kids in the house? No, just friends, kids every now and then. Okay. Um, and you were asked to put signs on the house, beware of dog, have you done that? We've had them before, but we got another one or two. Okay. Have you made any other purchases or changes uh, relative to managing the dog since that week? Um, just pretty much the muzzles um, was the addition. Um, I don't think it was anything else. Uh, has animal control checked out the muzzles? Um, did Jerry look at that at all? I, I'm not sure. I know he came to see the dogs again. I think it was today. So okay. I guess Jerry will have to answer that. And uh, you showed animal control officer Berg where the dogs are, would be outside when you're outside with them and the type of um, leash and, and restraints that they're on. Yeah. Yeah. He went over that with Eddie. Okay. I just want to ask you briefly about this Davis situation because it's now being discussed as though it were a full second incident, even though um, it won't tell us what you know about that. That incident was, I had a bull mastiff at the point who actually had multiple issues, um, but they were all chained up and there was a couple of kids, I guess the lawn guy let his dog out and the dog came running up. These kids were trying to get the dog 
calling the dog. It wasn't even the owners, it was kids. And then the dog went up, Eddie was outside, told them to get the dog and Stoli's the one who attacked the dog. Jaeger was there, but my dogs never got sighted or anything. His dog did. Someone earlier said that actually the quote was that they, they, that this dog, the Davis dog was attacked when your dogs got loose. Did they get loose? Yeah. No. And this all happened on your property? On the property with all dogs chained. And you uh, spoke to the animal control officer? Yep, he came up, said it's not your fault. Did you receive any citations? No. Nope. Were you the subject of a dangerous dog hearing? No. Nope. Were you asked to pay any bills for the dog that uh, was injured? No. Nope. Okay. And how long ago did that happen? approximately how long two and a half three years approximately okay okay is there anything i didn't cover that you would like everybody to know um i mean again just sorry for the whole incident and we're trying our best to come up with a different routine with the dogs that's it okay thank you mm -hmm. okay questions from all set, Attorney Cohen. I'm sorry. Are you all set, Attorney Cohen? Questions from my colleagues? Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, Danielle, did you, were you just talking about a, a gate? Can you explain that to me? Because my concern was the dogs, during this incident, the dogs ran out the door when the door was open. So they um, wouldn't be muzzled at that point. They wouldn't be muzzled they would get out the door unmuzzled. So explain to me how this gate would stop that from happening. So on the front door, I don't know if you guys ever received any photos. Um, we have like a latch gate that again, the dogs don't jump or anything, but everything's barricaded in the front now. Um, and it has a gate, but where they got out, it's a longer deck, but there's a slider. And typically there's another door because it's the bedroom area that's shut so we've never had this incident until the door was open and the slider was open and cracked and that's how they got out. But now we have that double lock. So no one's using that slider. Anything else, Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, just the statement, and I heard it twice tonight, um, that you walk them at night when no one is out. Just, just because by the time I get home, again, I could work anywhere from eight to 14 hours a day. So by the time I get home, I need to get situated. I cook dinner, make sure the dogs are good. And then we tend to go out. So by the time we would go out, it could be anywhere between seven and nine. So it's just one of those late long walks to, like around the high school and all of that. So it sounds to me like these dogs are, they're in the house all day. They're not going to um, exercise all day until you get home at night. No, because Eddie's usually around during the day, so he'll let them out during the day. Right now we're on crunch down because I don't want to make the wrong move, you know. Right, but when but stuff. when you're letting them out, they're they're tied up. They're not really getting any exercise all day. What do you mean, like beforehand? Yeah. Just, they would have a long runner, so they'd run back and forth. Okay. Yeah. That's up. Okay. Any, any other questions? Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Leary, all set? I think so. Mr. Studo, all set? Yes. I just, have a, I just have a question. That, uh, we're going to hear from um, Animal Control Officer Berg and, uh, and then Attorney Riley, too. There was a question as far, as far as whether the coverage was sufficient. Yes. Yes. I, I just, we, I just want to allow uh, uh, for questions of Mrs. Guide and then allow Attorney Cohen if he has other witnesses. So I do have some questions, but I'm just asking my colleagues, do you, are you all set with any questions for Mrs. Guide? No, I'm good. Thank you. And Mr. Walner. Just one quick question. You said you were building a house. What is your, what is your best guess that when that might happen, where you might be moving? Um, it was supposed to be March, but like most construction, it kind of gets pushed back. So I wouldn't say any 
later than July, but I mean, again, I'm hoping quicker than later, like anyone who wants to move into a house. Okay, thank you. Mrs. G oh, Mrs. Gonzalez. Are you putting up a fence at that house? Um, it, it depends. We, again, we're in the woods, so yeah, we have no fence. numbers. Um, where, where, what town, can I ask you what town you're going to? I prefer not to answer that. Okay. Um, I, I just don't want to see a problem go to another town and, and them have to deal with that. So, I, I mean, a fence shouldn't even be a question if the dogs are going with you, I think. Are you all set? Mm -hmm. So, Mrs. Gad, you had the bull mastiff before that you're talking about that was involved in an attack of another dog? Is that the one you're, with uh, Davis or whatever? I don't well, know. I'm asking name. you because they're oh, well, your dogs. So, why don't you, which one is it that, you talk, what, that you're talking about? Well, I would say it was the Davis dog. That would be Stoli. So Stoli was attacked by your bull mastiff because oh, Stoli Stoli. went onto your property. I'm trying to understand the story. No, there was a little dog who got out walking with little kids trying to get it. My dogs were chained up. Stoli, when the dog came up, we said, get the dog or Eddie did. And of course the dogs and attacked the dog. But oh, they were so, I'm saying, so our, our dog Stoli was the bull mastiff. Yeah. And yeah. even though chained up, was able to attack Mr. Davis's dog. Yeah, because he came onto the property up at the top of the driveway there. Okay. So so that was that bull mastiff also trained by Ms. Flynn? No. Was that bull mastiff walked by Ms. Flynn? Uh she walked her, yep. So those, those, you had three dogs at the same time. In other words, that bull mastiff as well as Jaeger and Petron? Petron, yeah. She, uh, she oh, ended up passing two, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Petron? You had three dogs at the same time? Yep. Okay. But Ms. Flynn was only working with the pit bulls. Worked with the pit bulls, but she would walk Stoli um, just to get her out for exercise too. Okay, so she worked with all three dogs, but all three dogs have been involved in these attacks. Basically, is what what yeah. I'm hearing. No, it was Stoli the last time. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right, and then you don't want to say where you're relocating to. You think you'll be relocating in the next couple of months? Yeah. Okay. And um, when I think I'm all set. Does anyone else have any questions? Just a quick question in relation to I think it was um, General Albano testified about yes. a separate incident. He is still with us. Yeah, yes. so I, I just want to get that clarified as to which incident, mm -hmm. it was the second or a third incident. And then, um, yeah, I just want to get that clarified, I guess. And then we'll also hear from animal control because it sounds like he was involved in that. But uh, Ms. Obano, I appreciate your talk, staying with us this late hour and, and again, providing us with the clarification on that. Um, I had- Hang on a second. Uh, Isn't the question to my client? No, to me. No, we, 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 I'm sorry, we were all set, Mrs. We, we had finished questioning, but we, we were just trying to clarify with another individual that's here. I'm sorry, we were all set, thank you. I was all set and none of my colleagues had any further questions. And then we'll, we'll, we're just gonna get some clarification Then we'll get back if you have other witnesses, Attorney Cohen. All right, Mrs. Albano. I had a Jack Russell who has since passed. My husband and my two kids were taking him out for a walk and the Mastiff was unleashed. And when we got to the end of their driveway had charged out of the driveway and attacked my Jack Russell, my husband had to wrestle it to the ground and pry its mouth open while my kids stood there screaming and crying. Um, in the tussle, it bit my husband's hand 
Um, but at the time, our main concern was my Jack Russell. I mean, it was a bull, a, you know, a bull mastiff against a 15, 20 pound Jack Russell. It had tore its throat open. Um, we had to end up rushing it to the Wuben Animal Hospital. Um, you know, he recovered, he was fine. But since then, especially with the addition of the two pit bulls, we just don't walk past the house anymore. If I want to walk my dog, I put him in my car, I drive to my brother's house or I drive to Ipswich River Park and I walk him there because I just don't feel safe and my kids are no longer allowed to walk my dogs. So Mrs. Albano, that yard dog was attacked by the bull mastiff. Yes. And the bull mastiff has since passed away. Yes, both the dogs. Uh, were you cited away. by the animal control officer in regard to that incident? Was I? Yes. No, my dog was on leash. Their dog was not leashed, so they oh, were cited. Okay. Oh, so this sounds like a separate incident, but it also sounds like it, it involves a separate dog owned by the guides yes. who since passed away. Yes. Okay. I, I understand now. So, and, uh, okay. Uh, Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, just a, a clarification on the, on the timeline of uh, building the new home. I heard March and then Chair, Madam Shea, you said something for about two months, and, but then we heard maybe the end of July. You know, I, I don't know what stage the, the new home is at, and, and there's no doubt. I mean, I had an addition put on my house, and it fell way behind schedule, for sure. So maybe if we could just get a clarification as to what um, we believe the timeline. Uh, I mean, I would, yes, sir. I would like the timeline to be March, but, I, you know, you know like you said, yeah. <laughs> construction, you, you fall behind and you could be looking at April or May. I'm just trying to say July for like a worst case scenario, but I, I, it's hard to say a good timeline with construction. Is your foundation in the ground yet? It's supposed to be going in in the next week or two. I wish you all the luck in the world. <laughs> yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Attorney, uh, Officer Berg, we'll, we'll ask you to follow up, but I just want to make sure, I don't know if Attorney Cohen has any other witnesses that you'd like to present. I do, thank you. Uh, let's see. Maureen uh, Thibault, she's, she's still with She's, yeah, hang on yeah. one second. Hi. Hi, Maureen. Uh, I just want you to share with the board what uh, what you know about the dogs and the guides. Um, Excuse um, me, I, could you just state your name and address for the record, please? Sure, it's Maureen Tebow. It's 184 Park Street, North Reading. Um, I've been friends with Danielle probably over 10 years. Um, I'm at her house frequent with my nieces and nephews. And... I mean, the dogs greet you, excitable, not anything that any other dog wouldn't do, I say, but to me that I've had dogs, so to me that's normal. If they come around and smell you and kind of jump up. Are you afraid of the dogs at all? No. And um, have you been to the house since... Uh, this week in late November? Yeah, I'm usually there more than once a week, probably. And have you seen changes in the way the dogs are managed? Yeah. How so? I mean, they listen to me when I'm there personally. They listen to Danielle or Eddie when they tell them to do something, or even if I tell them to get off or don't smell my bag or anything. So. And, um, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Do, do any of my colleagues have any questions? No? Yes? So, uh, how old are your nieces and nephews that, that come over and how often do they go over and interact with the dogs? Well, if I have them for a day, um, I have a niece that's nine. I have another niece that's five. Nephew is four and two. And how often have they interacted with the, with the dogs? A couple times a month, maybe. Okay. Okay. Very good. All Did set? 
Yeah, all set, thank you. Any other questions? All set, thank you. Attorney Cohen. Thank you. Uh, is Tyler Taylor with us? Um, they were on Hi. here. Yeah, we're right here. We're just having issues with our video. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes. Yes. I can hear you. Hi, I'm Meredith Taylor. I'm here with my husband, Tyler Taylor. Hi. Can you just tell us? Um, can you tell us your address, please, yes. for the record? 36 Haverhill Road, Amesbury, Mass. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us about your interactions with the dogs and the guides? Yes. Um, we've known Danielle since 2014. Um, we've spent a lot of time at the house with the dogs. Um, our daughter has been there at the house with them. Um, she was probably 11 or 12 when we first started bringing her over there. We've never um, seen any kind of aggression towards us or our daughter. Um, they're, they listened whenever Danielle and Eddie gave them directions. Um, but more importantly right now is just seeing all the preparations that they have been trying to do to follow the compliance for this. Um, they just, they love their animals very much. They feel very badly about what's happened and they're really very committed to doing whatever they need to do. Um, you know, we see Danielle on a daily basis and it's just, this has been really difficult for them and they're just really trying to do what needs to be done to make sure that, you know, they can keep their animals. Okay, thank you. Okay, do my colleagues have any questions? No, all set. Attorney Cohen, thank you. Attorney Cohen. Last one. Um, Elisa Shalskaya. I believe she's on. Yep, right here. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Can you state, state your name? Sure. It's Elisa Shelskaya, and I currently uh, live at 12 Neyland Road in Tuxbury, Mass. And um, have you been on this hearing the entire time? For most of it, yes. Okay. So what can you tell us uh, about the guides and their dogs, Jaeger and Patron? Um, so I've known Danielle for about over 10 years. Um, I've known the dog since she was, since they were puppies. I was there when they, uh, they first got them. I mean, the dogs are excited. They do bark when you pull up, but I have two shepherds who do the same thing. So once you walk through the door and you greet them, they completely calm down and then they go to their crates and then they chew their bones. So I've never had any personal issues once I've entered the house, but that's again, a dog's doing its job. When you're walking by the house or when you're pulling up and they hear noises, it's their job to protect them. Okay. And do you, uh, do you go to the house alone? Do you go with people, kids, other dogs? I go by myself. Okay. Are you fearful of the dogs at all? No. Have you been there since, um, since Thanksgiving? Okay. Uh, Just because of COVID and I work in a health field, so. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Any questions of my colleagues? All set? Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, I have no further witnesses. Just like to reserve the uh, 90 seconds to make a statement at some point. Of course. Of course. So I just want to hear from, we have Officer Berg here, and now we've heard about, I believe, two separate instances with the other dog, the bull mastiff. That's what it sounds like to me. And these instance, even though that's not, even though that's not what we're here for, we're here for the pit bulls. Um, I think we, since we've heard testimony and these are other dogs by these owners, I think we need to hear from Officer Berg with regard to some clarification on who was cited for what. We've heard from Mrs. Albano. I think that that sounds like a separate that sounds like a separate instance than Mr. Davis. But you can you can clarify that for us. Oh, good good evening. How are you? 
Listening. Uh, Thanks for hanging in there. This is um, uh, Officer Berg. I believe we all. You you, you don't Officer you don't want Berg. me to talk about that incident. It actually happened on October twenty fifth, two thousand eighteen, with the full mass of Stoli. Um, I don't know if you want me to read that uh, that uh, incident to you. Uh, I can, uh, if you like. I just think there was a little bit of confusion and there was some talk of you citing an owner whose dog it sounded like was. I, I, um, I'll give you the story real quick. Uh, on October 24th, 2018, um, I received a fax at the Board of Health um, from North Reading um, Vet Clinic stating they had treated a dog, uh, Poodle Brady, owned by Patty Davis at 10 Winterberry Lane the dog bite wounds that occurred on October 22nd, 2018. After speaking with Mrs. Davis, she informed me her dog, Blue Brady, had escaped their yard. So the dog was off leash at the time and did go into uh, Mr. Guide's uh, yard. Um, Mr. Guide's uh, dogs were both tied up on long leashes at the time during the attack on... Uh, Mr. Guide's property, causing puncture wounds to the hind legs and neck of the poodle. Uh, I'm at 18 Maple Road quarantining. Both of Mr. Guide's two dogs that were involved in the dog attack, Bull Master Stoli, which I was informed it was Stoli, and Pitbull Jaeger. Uh, Mr. Guide was cited for not having both of his dogs licensed, $50, $25 each. Both dogs were currently vaccinated. They had a three-year vaccine that expired 325 of 2021. Um, that, like I said, is a separate incident um, to this one that occurred, you know, in uh, November. Uh, just, just to be clear, Mr. Guide was cited, not Mrs. Davis. Miss, Mrs. Davis, um, <clears throat> when I went there uh, she had she had a lot of uh, uh, vet bills to pay herself um, I, I, I didn't cite her you know due, due to the circumstances uh, but mr. guides dogs were both not licensed at time of the incident they were on leash and they were maybe vaccinated okay so the one of the two dogs, is also the subject of tonight's hearing, Petra. Uh, Jaeger. Okay, Jaeger, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so Jaeger was one of those two dogs at the time that was involved in that. And yes, I was informed Jaeger. it was Stoli, but um, I mean, we can't be 100% sure. And they were both leashed when that happened? Yes. And He was um, compliant with the law. You know, he, he didn't do anything wrong. Okay. And the, um, the, was, was Jaeger licensed after that? Uh, yes. And when did Jaeger stop being licensed? Because um, you cited them for not licensing them this I believe they, they licensed them right after. I, I don't have the report on okay. that. Okay. Does anyone else have court? I give you a chance, Attorney Cohen, too, but it just my colleagues have the answer. Right? So, Mr. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, well, I'm curious about the, the, the other incident with Anna Albano talking about her dog. I, I, I have no Being report attacked. on that. I have no report on that. Um, She's here. I get it right down the, the station here. Um, you know, I pull up all the reports and that, that wasn't one of them. I didn't have any, any incidents with the Albanos. Can we recognize her, Madam Chair? Of course, Mrs. Albano, for the fourth time providing your testimony. <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Albano. Well, there should be record of it because he actually, Jerry, came to my house because the animal hospital had reported it to the town where I had brought my dog. Jerry showed up at my house because he had the story backwards thinking my dog was unleashed. My dog was not unleashed. He got the information correct, left my house and proceeded to the guide's house. And he later told me that they were cited for an unleashed dog in an unlicensed dog. 
so it should all be on record. He came to my house and knocked on my door. It was reported by the Woburn Mass Veterinarian Emergency Hospital. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Alfano. Okay. Any other questions for Officer Berg? Mr. Walner. Is that your complete report? Is that, have you given us everything you wanted to say tonight, Officer Berg? Uh, I mean, besides my recommendations, uh, uh, no. Uh, Chief Murphy covered basically all the incidents that occurred. Uh, we did have one last incident today um, but we did compliance checks on the muzzle order uh, for the last, uh, we'll say from the 11th. Uh, myself, uh, police department, uh, first and second shift would go by daily, you know, just to check, see if he was complying with the muzzle order and leash law. Uh, we only, a uh, couple times we saw him with the leash and muzzle. Uh, that was it. Uh, but today I, I went there and I actually spoke to Mr. Guide to check, check his license status and he didn't end up getting the dog license like he was supposed to. So he was cited for the offense. Um, I actually have the log here at 1030, did compliance check on muzzle order at 18, uh, 18 Maple Road, Guide residence. Mr. Guide was walking one of his pit bulls on his property with leash and muzzle on. Edward Guide has still not licensed his two dogs, Pitbull, Yeager, and Patron. Citation number 2030 issued in hand to Mr. Guide, a license violation. Two dogs, $50. That was today? Yeah. Before this meeting? Yep. Okay. Which was, as I stated before, at my counsel, because if the dogs are going to be removed from the property uh, or euthanized, which is one of the things you could do, you don't license the dogs to, uh, until you know for certain that you're going to be able to keep them, keep them on your property. <clears throat> that, that's funny logic, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Walner, are you all set with your um, question? And then are you going to hear your recommendations at the end of this? Is that, are you going to offer Yes. Yeah. What are yeah, your I, recommendations? Okay, uh, my recommendation would be uh, the following requirements as prescribed by Mass General Law, Chapter 140, Section 157. And one is ordering the dogs to be confined to the owner's premises, which they have been doing. Uh, two, when either dog is removed from the premises, they should be muzzled and restrained with a tethering device, the uh, minimum tensile strength of 300 pounds, and not to exceed three feet in length. Uh, and uh, guides maintain at least $100,000 in liability insurance, which was prescribed by law. Um, I also recommended to, to Mr. Guide to uh, post signs in which he did. Uh, he put them on all four corners of the house. Um, and that's uh, basically it. Uh, I do, I would recommend also uh, a, a trainer. I think that would be, you know, that's just my recommendation. That's not by law uh, to, you know, maybe correct, correct the disposition of the dogs. Uh, dogs, uh, like um, Pam Flynn said, uh, they are friendly around people. Um, but if you have another dog, if you have another dog attached to that person, it, it, it might not, a uh, uh, dog might attack. No guarantee on that. Mr. Walner? And what do you think about Pam's recommendation of the fence with the, the covering on top? How, how do you feel about that? Well, um, the fence, you know, under the law, uh, they, 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 want, they really want you to uh, uh, to leash walk the dog. Um, my, my uh, what I would be afraid of is a dog hopping the fence or uh, anything like that. And uh, at this time, um, 
Todd Ferrazani uh, owns the property. So I, I don't think it's up to the guides to put up that fence. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez? Mr. Ferrazani with us at all? I don't think so. I don't think so. So um, just uh, to, because we're, we are still in the hearing and I, I do want to um, explain really to my colleagues what are, what we have to decide here and what we need to determine. So before that, I'd ask Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions of Officer Berg? And if, and if not, if you could present your statement, I'd be happy, we'd be happy to hear it. Thank you. Um, just a question for Officer Berg. Then, um, then in lieu of a fence, it, this system that they have, where the dogs are, if they're outside in their yard and um, and muzzled and leashed and with an adult, um, because it, the landlord, because they don't own the house, uh, what's your position on that? As a as a safeguard, if they're the way they've been, the order that you've already put in place, if they're outside the property. Well, I, I re recommend continuing that order. Um, you know, we, we don't want the, the dogs to escape. You know, um, like I said, putting up a fence or anything like that. Uh, you know, your, your pit bull's leaping ability is, you know, you can jump pretty high. Um, so I, I, that, that wouldn't be my recommendation uh, is to put up a fence. But like I said, uh, Todd Ferrazani is the owner of that property. Uh, okay, thank you. I don't have any, anything further for Officer Burke. Okay. Did you want to make some final comments, Attorney Colin? Thank you. Uh, Everything we wanted to say has been said tonight. Uh, horrible incident, dog on dog. We haven't seen the, the human aggression um, that it's, it's just not there. The human aggression is just not there. Uh, sounds like um, Officer Berg's recommendations, a lot of those are in place already, if not all of them. Regarding the insurance, uh, what I sent was just the deck page today, but it's a 38 page policy. I just have to redact one section of it, and um, it, which is, has to do with uh, other personal property in the house. And then I'll send attorney Riley the entire policy. I believe this coverage based on um, what, what the agent had told Danielle Guide, but I'll point out that in the law, you either get the $100,000 insurance or you have to show that you made your uh, reasonable efforts to get that. So I believe that they have it. Um, if they don't, there's, there's another effort that they can make with a, uh, just a liability insurance company that just covers dogs, uh, separate from any type of renters or homeowners. And I will share that information with them as well to see if they can get it that way. And usually if it's just dog on dog, you can get the coverage for that. Uh, so, Attorney Cohen, as to that insurance, you're, you're saying that their homeowners or renters insurance covers um, liability for the dog's aggression to other dogs and humans? I'm telling you that um, according that the policy, according to Danielle, who spoke to her agent, the dogs are covered. Now, it's through MapFree, and I know MapFree is one of the only companies that does not discriminate based on breed of dog. So um, we know they're not gonna exclude the dogs for, for that reason. I've only sent through the declarations pages, 37 other pages I got this afternoon, uh, like Attorney Riley and Ms. Gilberto were skimming it to look for the exclusions. I haven't seen it yet, but if they're in there, there's another layer of insurance uh, that they can try to get. Okay, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just okay. wanted to make sure the board understood what you were mentioning about that uh just just to wrap up i mean these people get it they're and soon they'll be out of there anyway and it's just a matter of making sure that for the next six seven months um people can feel safe that these dogs aren't getting loose and if they 
if they were ever to get loose, that they're, they're muzzled when they do. The internal safeguards, now we have, along with the external safeguards, um, while training isn't necessarily something that the statute calls for, uh, my clients absolutely understand that they, they, need, they and their dogs need training. And um, even that their willingness to consider medication until the training uh, can, kick in, can kick in more. Uh, it shows their commitment to at least keeping everybody safe until, until they move out. Um, and to one of the board members, I think it was Ms. Gonzalez, they are moving out of state. So uh, there's no doubt the dogs fit the definition of dangerous under the statute. And my clients get that. You know, dogs that without provocation bite a, a dog or, or a person. So they fit the definition of dangerous. Wherever they move to, if it's out of state, it stops at the state line. So the, the dangerous label carries anywhere in Massachusetts along with the restrictions. Um, but if they move out of state, it doesn't. But as you said, um, hopefully they're educated enough now to know that they would need to, to carry, bring the safeguards with them. So thank you. Thank you for um, all the time that you've put in here tonight and last hearing. Thank you, Attorney Cohen. Okay, and so you just made at least the first half of our job easy that where our first order of business is to move to deem the dog either a nuisance, which is a barking dog, or, or deem the dog dangerous, which is more in line with what we've heard and what was just really essentially stated by Attorney Cohen. Um, we can dismiss the complaint or we can, we have the option under the statute to impose measures such as what is suggested by Officer Berg. Um, and in addition to that, maybe other measures up to and including order to euthanize the dog, depending on how the board just deliberates on this. Um, so under the statute, our first order of business is to move to deem the move to deem in separate motions to deem um, one or both of the dogs separately as uh, dangerous dogs which I think has really been already, it's already a matter of record at this point. So do we have a motion regarding yep. Jaeger? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to the dog owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road, named Jaeger be found to be a dangerous dog pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, chapter 140, section 157. Second. Motion <laughs> by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. And any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just as far as the discussion, I appreciate the fact that Attorney Cohen and I assume he's speaking on behalf of his clients agree that they're both dangerous. Uh, so I appreciate that. So aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Mr. <clears throat> Kelly is aye. Do I have a motion with regard to Petron? Is that right? Matt Petron. Petron. Patron. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move that the dog owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road named Patron be found to be a dangerous dog pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. <clears throat> So um, our next order of business is to really deliberate what exactly where to do. And I believe we can, as our, as part of our findings, just cite for, for the record, the, the complaints that were filed with regard to this matter then, and the testimony that we've heard with regard to this matter and anything else that my, um, uh, fellow colleagues would like to uh, make as a statement of findings. Mrs. Gonzalez. So if you watch the dog whisperer, Cesar Milan, he always says there's no bad dogs. There's only bad owners. Um, it was tes testimony that they've had these dogs and puppies. So they're not rescues. You know, there was, there's clearly, they weren't socialized as puppies. Um, they're dangerous, obviously. And so was Stoli. There was issues with Stoli also. 
which was their other dog. So my feeling was that a fence should be put up. I thought that would be a solution, but after hearing from Officer Berg, that's not a solution. So, um, well, I don't, I don't know why you would say that's not a solution because Officer Berg said that. I, I don't think that that's a, so that that's could still be a consideration. consideration that. So that could still be a consideration. That was my first thought. 100% in an alternative to euthanizing a dog, yes. 100%. So that, that, that was my first thought was a fence. But then after hearing from Officer Berg that that could possibly not be a solution and they could jump over the fence and that's a scary thought. And that's not going to give any calm to the neighborhood. So my other thought is to board these dogs until they get to their new home. Have these dogs boarded. It's, it's probably going to be expensive, but they'll be out of the neighborhood. They'll be safe. Everyone else will be safe. And when they get to their new home and hopefully put up a fence, they take the dogs back. I mean, that's so let doing. me just read for you because I appreciate the deliberation, but there's some really specific things that we're allowed to order under the statute. So it's consistent in line with what Attorney Cohen is suggesting and consistent in line with Attorney Berg, uh, Officer Berg is suggesting, but once the dogs are deemed dangerous, we have the ability to order one or more of the following to, to order that the dog be humanely restrained, order that the dog be confined to the premises of the keeper of the dog, order that when the dog is removed from the premises, the dog is, shall be securely and humanely muzzled and restrained with a chain or other tethering device, having a minimum tensile strength of 300 pounds, not exceeding three feet in length, order that the owner keep proof of insurance in an amount not less than $100,000, insuring the owner or keeper against any claim, loss or damage or injury to persons or animals or property resulting from acts, whether intentional or unintentional. Um, and like attorney Khan said, that there has to be a reasonable effort to obtain such insurance if a policy has not been issued. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Order that the owner or the keeper of the dog provide to the licensing authority or animal control officer uh, information by which a dog may be identified through its lifetime, including photographs, videos, veterinary examination, tattooing, or microchip impl implantations. Order that unless the owner or owner um, or keeper of the dog provides evidence that the veterinarian is of the opinion the dog is unfit for alterations order that it shall not be reproduced, that it shall be, uh, the owner or keeper of the dog shall cause the dog to be altered so the dog shall not be reproductively intact, which I don't think is an issue here, and, and or order that the dog be humanely euthanized. So I think it's pretty specific and I think it's consistent with, with um, what's being recommended. However, I don't think it's a, I think it's, it's the whole, there's a whole variety of options that are available depending on how, how dangerous the, the book, my colleagues think these dogs are based on the information that that's been presented tonight. Mrs. Uh, Gonzalez. I'm uh, sorry. Keep Mrs. Gonzalez. All, all of the above and whatever else can be done. I don't I don't know what else to say. I mean, I, I don't think that's enough, but Mr. Mrs. Gonzalez, are you all set? Mm-hmm. Mrs. Mrs. Mr. O'Leary. I'm sorry. Just, just <laughs> yeah, it's late. Yeah, I know. Just a question for Attorney Cohen. I mean, he uh, I'm sure you have I know you have far more experience in dealing with these issues than uh, fortunately than we do. Um, just in relation to the uh, fencing or kennels uh, that we're talking about, the ones with the double entry gates or ones with the roof over it, how often and uh, reasonable are those to, to get, particularly this time of year, in order to restrain dogs of this size and strength? Okay, so and thank you for directing the question here. It's, it's 
difficult right now because you can't get fence companies to come out. Uh, it was a little warmer a few weeks ago, and some people said they could get fences, but they're not going to get into the ground right now. And these fences, uh, they have to be somewhat into the ground to prevent digging. So we're already in basically late March, probably, if depending on what order they come in with the fence company. So we're into late March before the fence could be brought in. I understand about the kennel, Ms. Flynn is saying, but I don't, I don't know the sturdiness of it. Um, I haven't seen it in, so, and I don't know what it attaches to. So I, I'm having difficulty picturing that being a remedy right now. And it's further complicated because they don't own the house. But that's why I was asking the animal control officer, if these dogs are outside, A, is this enough exercise given the length of their tie out? And I, I just feel comfortable, more comfortable if they're out there and they've got their muzzle on, they've got the tie out and they've got an adult um, because of their inability to put a fence in because they don't own the house. So in that they could be do right now. Um, I'd have to see the kennel itself, according to the law, they, it can have a cement bottom, but most places, if they order a, a run or if they order a kennel, it's usually, um, it's instead of a fence, it's, it's secured into the ground. It doesn't take up the whole yard. And at the top, if they're going to stay out there in inclement weather, then it has to have a roof. But usually, if not, at the top, there just has to be some fold in. This way, a foot or so that's bent in and fence companies or kennel, people put up a kennel know how to do that, even with wire, just to prevent them from being able to, to jump over. Does that help? I'll say, I'll say, does that answer your question? Was that Mr. Oliver? To a certain degree, I'm just wondering, and again, I, I think the construction of, of a home always runs behind schedule. And, and, you know, and the guides probably are going to be not threatening residents longer than they choose to be, unfortunately. And that being the case, the neighborhood is going to have them as neighbors and, and along with their, their animals. And, and while they may not be able to comply right now with the fencing, uh, they may be able to comply by a future date, you know, by March 30th, uh, something of that date, so March 15th, whatever, depending upon the weather, I suppose. Um, I, I just think that the, first of all, the, if you're not going to euthanize the dogs, you know, they, they still need some room to move around. You know, a, a three foot tethering uh, isn't fair and humane, humane either. So it's, uh, and again, with the hours that they work, and again, Mr. Guide's of the construction business is going to get busier, I'm sure. And uh, Mrs. Guide is busy, as you say, working eight to 14 hours a day. Um, you know, short of euthanizing the dogs, we, you know, to me, you got to be somewhat concerned with their um, well-being also. And I think the well-being of the neighborhood. And I think uh, Mr. I think it was Mr. Fershane said it said it well that uh, you know as a community, we all got attacked um, with this incident, and the dogs have admittedly uh, by the owners and their attorney, you know, are dangerous dogs. So you know we need to protect if they're going to stay stay here even for a short period of time, the best way to protect the neighborhood is, you know, the tethering, the muzzling, and I, and I think some, some sort of fencing, but that's my own personal opinion. Yeah, so I, I think let's, I think maybe we should poll the members to see if, if, if they've ruled out euthanizing. And I also think, um, you know, there is ability under the statute to order if, it, if the dogs are outside con confinement to a structure and it does explain what that should be. Um, but let, why don't we just, let me just pull the membership as we deliberate to determine where you're at in terms of the, the, the basically the spectrum of what we're, what we would like to, you know, see happen here specifically euthanize, euthanizing the dogs. Is, is that, Mr. O'Leary, I think you've ruled that out. I haven't ruled it out totally. Again, what I'd like to do is to see that uh, the neighborhood could be accommodated uh, in the short term by Mr. and Mrs. Guide. And, and again, if they have to speak with their landlord 
to get accommodations here. You know, so I'm not ruling it out. Okay. Mr. Walner? Um, I don't see the dogs being able to stay on property. I think it's just too many variables. And uh, we've already heard enough that the landlord isn't going to let a structure be built on the land, especially when they're going to be leaving very soon. Um, so I, you know, euthanasia would be the last thing I'd want to see happen. But I think the owners have to commit to having them boarded being off property. They have to pay somebody to take them off property. I don't see how they can possibly stay there. It's just there's, there's been no consistency in following through on things that have been asked of them. For the simplest thing is even just getting a tag for the dogs. I mean, it's like $15, 20 to get a license. It's not a big deal. And knowing that they're going to appear here tonight just shows that they just can't, you know, they just, we just can't trust it. So I think they have to be off property um, and they have to pay for it to get it done at first. Um, and I think that falls within the, the, the guidelines of what you've told us. So um, short of that, if they can't do that, then they're kind of making the decision to euthanize their own dogs. So, Mr. Studo, your thoughts? Um, yeah, on the euthanize issue, I mean, if I, I can see the danger of the dogs, it makes sense, especially the dog on dog. However, yeah, no, no person has been hurt. And I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I mean, the evidence points that way. Um, I've definitely been around aggressive dogs, definitely. But I think that um, I do agree with Mr. Wallner and Mrs. Gonzalez that we got to find a way to have those dogs removed, stay with a friend, just, um, something something away from that neighborhood to make everyone feel better but but yeah if you're asking me yeah the the euthanized thing I, I just um animal to animal is really bad but i think that you gotta you gotta cross the animal to human threshold before you put a dog down that's just that's how i'm seeing it on here and, and, I, and I get it so i but i'm i'm gonna i'd have to be convinced at a at a very high level to uh to recommend it also i uh, just like to state about that that um seeing that i'm not an expert in the matter and i don't deal with as many i am weighing heavily the recommendation um <clears throat> by the animal control officer uh because i i've noticed that in time where where it's a decision that can be emotional in a lot of levels because we all i have a dog sometimes you have to try to put it aside and look at the local expert and that's who I'm going to kind of lean on to, you know, for the next step. So that's, but that's my position on the euthanization. Okay. And just to that point that the statute prescribes what we can order. So having them boarded would have to be by the agreement of the owner in lieu of our, you know, taking other, you know, action such as euthanizing, they would have to come up with that as a resolution here, I think, because we have specifics under the law that we're, those are the parameters we have to work in. But I don't, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, I'd want to hear from you on euthanizing. Um, I've had dogs my whole life. I still have dogs. I, I, you know, the last thing I want to do is, is do that to a dog. Um, I know that they're like family, but I have to think about the residents that live in that area and feeling terrorized. And it's not fair. It's not fair to the neighborhood. And I wouldn't want to have to live with them getting out and, and doing something even worse. And um, so it's, I'm not ruling it out. And I'm going to go back to, I know you're saying we can't order it, but maybe we need to have, some give and take with the owners. Um, I think the dog should be off the property. Or and my, my daughter has a, a police dog. There's a kennel built in the backyard and, and the dog's in that kennel and it's very sturdy and you know it can be done. I wouldn't, I, I, I don't rule youth, euthanizing out either because I think we've heard enough evidence from the individual neighbors about their fear just walking by the home when the dogs are 
inside the home. Um, and I, I also think that it kind of, no offense, Mrs. Flynn, and I appreciate your being with us, but the, I, I walk dogs too and walk my dogs and that they basically have the same level of understanding of things. And this sounds like these dogs were trained for years and they're still acting like this. So I, and I understand that you're a dog walker and, and that that is a particular area that you have of this, some, some sort of training, but it, it, it didn't work and it didn't work for the other dog either. So um, I think it, it defies logic for us to say, well, maybe with some training when we've already heard evidence, it was years of training or supposed dog training, but at the same time, that didn't work. And, and that's not really something that we, we know that wouldn't be effective because that's a, they're doing this with the training. And I also think it defies logic to say that fighting two individuals and then chasing another woman, into, in, chasing another woman as she's trying to get the dog in her house. And, you know, another woman, Mrs. Pierce, all walking up the road and them just, just basically going crazy that she walks by. I mean, and we've heard multiple neighbors have rerouted what they do. They don't even let their kids walk through there. What are we doing here? What more do we need to hear here? There, there's a whole two streets in, in, a, in, a, in a rearranging what they do here because of these two dogs. And we've heard all of these people are dog lovers themselves. So it's not, this isn't something that should be taken lightly. And I do think that at the, at the minimum, we should be imposing the maximum here. And if that maximum here is in an order to euthanize the dogs, then we impose the maximum. And if there's some alternative, I don't think we have the right under the law to impose it, but we can certainly say to the owner, what are you gonna do here? Yeah, you might not be able to build a kennel or, or put a fence in, but there's electric dog fences that can go up in addition to all these other conditions. I'm not really hearing anything other than, we'll, we'll keep doing what we were already ordered to do. That kind of allays the fears that all the neighbors have. And there's a lot of kids in that area. And I wouldn't want that on my hands. I don't think for one minute that a dog that doesn't bite and attack other dogs isn't going to bite a human being. And this, they did bite a human being. They bit two of you. So we can talk all we want about what's inside the minds of these dogs and opine all we want about the minds of these dogs. But the facts here are the facts. So Mr. Studo. Um, Madam Chair, may I ask a question of uh, Mr. Berg? Sure. Um, Mr. Berg, can you, like I said, like I said a few minutes ago, um, at, at this point, I don't see, you know, how we could go down that road. Well, I don't see it. But in your opinion, when you look at, you know, putting aside the recommendations that you gave a little while ago, do you feel that this case warrants that? Because again, like I said, it's something where I'm trying to get a non-emotional expert opinion who deals with this constantly because it is a very charged emotional issue when you're talking about pets. Well, I, <clears throat> I would exhaust all, uh, all of what I recommended. And like uh, Kate said, uh, if they don't comply with that, the euthanization is is a uh, option, and if they're not complying with the orders, then that that should that should be it. But meaning, but I mean, the, to take it further, there's things we can't force them to do. So meaning that if there's voluntary things they could do which they cannot be forced to do under law, do you feel that? Do you, you feel that those also have to be there? So forget about what we could rule on, but do you think that whether it's a kennel or anything else, uh, you know, electric, any kind of other mechanic, do you think that, that a stipulation like that should be agreed upon based on the circumstances, in your opinion, for us to take euthanization off the table? Well, uh, with the electric fences, uh, I've seen a lot of them not work because I've had dog bite incidents without with the electric fences. I'm not a firm believer in them, 
uh, the fences, a pit bull can jump over a fence. Okay. I've seen that happen. Uh, it actually happened at our pound. Uh, and we had a, over a six foot fence with no roof on it. Uh, and, and they, a pit bull did jump over a uh, fence because there was food in the other, in the other, uh, uh, you know, kennel. Um, uh, that, that, that's how, what I wouldn't, I, I recommend that they're, they're, they're with them at all times with, you know, you, you, you can exercise a dog. I see people who just run around the lake, you know, stuff like that. Um, or a place where, you know, even if there's no, not much human contact, um, these dogs are not, uh, people aggressive. I mean, I, I've actually patted the dogs myself, uh, but, but, with another dog, you, you just don't know. They're, they're very dog aggressive in that that regards. Thank you. Madam Chair? Oh, Mr. Attorney Riley. Okay. Oh, I can see uh, you. You got a yellow hand up there on a yellow yes, wall. A, I'm sorry. Oh, that's a problem. I'm in the wrong <laughs> room then. Um, but, for, yes. First, uh, first, I, I want to, uh, I'm sorry, I actually lost my audio for three or four minutes, had to leave and come back. Um, so I know I missed when there was talk about the insurance. Um, uh, the only thing I wanted to say, and I know uh, Attorney Cohen says he will provide us the insurance, is that uh, my understanding, homeowner's insurance will cover uh, pets and your dog bites as long as there's no pet exclusion in it. But he said that he could uh, provide us the policy so that would take care of that. The, the level of it is certainly well above the 100000 that the statute talks about. Um, uh, also, that uh, as as you stated, Madam Chair, I think I, I do think the way this statute is written, and it's not perfect. Um, you know, there's seven different things that the board can pick and choose from. Uh, I, I really do think that's a that's a limit. Um, and the first two uh, don't work terribly well when you're talking about a tenant, uh, because well, the first one is uh, restraining them, but not not to anything, not to an inanimate object, which sort of leaves out, you know, chaining them outside when a person's out there. And, um, and then confining to the premises, it talks about pens and runs and things, but if the landlord doesn't want it, um, you know, practically speaking, that makes it difficult. But uh, yeah, I did want to say that um, the, the conditions that Officer Berg, you know, has mentioned, uh -huh. um, that's that's are in place now uh where and i believe i don't want to put words in her mouth but i believe i heard this guy basically agree to keep those in place which would be the dogs are either in the house or if they're out of the house even right outside the back door they're on a short leash with muzzles and certainly if they're off the property they're on a short leash with muzzles um you know those are all those are all pretty strict. Obviously, they have to do the right thing and comply with it. Uh, but you could kind of say the same thing with a kennel. People have kennels and they leave the door open. So, um, uh, you know, the, the board has has all these options they can do. Um, but uh, I I thought that the uh, Officer Berg's recommendations, they're certainly well within the statute, what the board can order. Um, and from the sounds of it, I don't think um doesn't sound to me anyway as though the guides would be tempted to appeal that um so you know maybe that's another just another factor to to consider but um anyway i just you you cited all the correct uh, criteria that the board has to work with and um um you know that's as long as we stay in there i think it's uh, uh defensible Thank you, Attorney Riley. Hey, questions? All set. Again, I'll just ask the question: um, Is it is it can we part of those seven rules, guidelines, whatever? Can we order that the dogs be removed from the property? Uh, I'd have to say no to that. Um, there isn't anything like uh, compelling someone to board the dog somewhere else. And the um, back before this uh, statute was rewritten uh, six, seven years ago, I think, uh, back before that, where 
there was a lot less detail in what the board could do with a dangerous dog. And unfortunately, what some boards would do would be tell the people, you've got to get rid of these dogs. We don't care where they go. They just got to get out of town. Uh, and obviously that has a lot of problems because now you're shifting it into another town. Uh, and so they specifically wrote in that banishing the dog, ordering it to be taken out of the town line uh, is not something that the select board can do. And I know that's not what you're saying about getting them to, you know, to board it or find friends or something. Um, but it, it just simply can't be part of the board's order. Uh, the district court would, would not uphold it. So if we take just one last question, if we took the opposite of saying euthanasia, but we gave a 20 day window, can we do something like that where they remove the dogs on their own? Is that another if, way? To, if they, the if same, they voluntarily, the thing, basically? If, if they voluntarily say, um, to themselves, um, you know, let, let's just make it easy on ourselves and f find our friends somewhere else. I mean, they can do that. It's it's their their dogs. Um, but I just I, I wouldn't recommend something about getting the dogs out of the house or getting certainly not getting the dogs out of town. Uh, I just think that would conflict with the statute too much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Attorney Riley. Okay. To my colleagues. Do we have any further discussion? Do we have any motions? How about, how about a further uh, uh, suggestions from Attorney Cohen, if he has any? Uh, <clears throat> well, I am absolutely not a fan of electric fences. Um, not only they're, they're just not good, other animals can get in. And, and certainly dogs can break through. However, if it's a backup, okay, and in this instance, if it's a backup measure, so in addition to what we already talked about in the yard, it, see, I think they're able to exercise in the yard based on the size of the run. I, I thought if they're on the run, and ACO Berg can speak to this, if they're on the run outside, so their leash is attached to, or they're, they're attached to a run, adults out there and they have their a muzzle on that gives them freedom to to run and exercise a bit I, I thought if they're not on the run then they would have to be on the three foot leash but the the electric fence as a, a backup measure especially where you can't have a fence is good but I wouldn't go with just an e-fence instead of uh, the, the muzzle and um, and the tie out or the leash so that would solve the problem about them being able to exercise. And to the extent that this, these tieouts are, can be put in an area that's not front and center to the property in terms of where people would walk. Um, so they, the, if it's pushed back further, um, just to keep the dogs away from the street so people don't have to see them or hear them uh, would be helpful too. And I mean, and here's the thing. This is not a euthanasia case. I can tell you there's just no way a judge is going to uphold a euthanasia order on a dog that had a $430 bill. It just doesn't happen. And as much as uh, people want to say, well, it bit people, your ACO just said it at 1124. These dogs are not people aggressive. They're not. And a judge will see that. So if we can do this stuff that's in place and, and enhance it with the e-fence, then, then it's on them. Like uh, if they don't comply, as the ACO said, there's strict measures. You don't have to go through this whole hearing thing again. 157A starts with, you can seize the dog. It's criminal if you don't uh, obey the order. So it's not as though you have to go through this pain of the hearing again. You don't want anything to happen, but it would really be on them because they have to, com they have to comply. And there's certainly plenty of deputized people in the neighborhood who are, who are looking for, for them you know, whether they're complying or not. Um, so on the run, attorney Cohn with a muzzle on the run with a with the owner out there with them. Right, they should never be outside alone. Okay, even on the run, in other words. Well, usually on a run you can let them out, but I'm saying I, they would agree to be out there with the dogs. Okay, I, I, just for the so everybody can feel safe. And and agree to when they're outside mu muzzled because. We did hear evidence, at least one of the two on the run, 
without the muzzle was able to attack another dog that happened to run in there. So with the muzzle on, right, at all times when they're outside of the house? That is what I'm envisioning, yes. Any other questions? M Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, not a question, but um, if you want to hear how I'm feeling about it right now, are we there? We're on deliberation. So thank you, Attorney Cohen. Yes, we're on deliberation on this. So considering the limitations we have, um, I would be willing to agree to all of those stipulations that Officer Berg, Attorney Cohen, muzzled at all times, never alone, always tied up. Um, and if they don't comply, then what? That uh, Officer Berg, maybe you can speak to that. What if they don't comply? What happens then? I mean, we we can order we can order a euthanization. Uh, if, if they do not comply with the orders, uh, there's also uh, large penalties, uh, you know, uh, financially, you know, fines and even imprisonment um, if, they, if they don't comply. Uh, I don't have the, the paperwork with me right now, but there is uh, sizable, you know, they, 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 will be, they will be accountable. I, I saw the... Um something in the, in the packet here. First of all, the, the first offense is, it, again, I, I didn't consider it sizable as far as the, the fines and up to 30 days in prison or something and 60 days, I believe, or 90 days for every subsequent offense. But um, I'm trying to just find that. So I, to me, I thought the, the penalties for non-compliance were kind of weak. <laughs> Maybe town council can assist us here. Um, but it was, we did have something included in our packet as to what, uh, what the non-compliance. It can't be weak because we've, we've seen well, this already. Uh, unfortunately, the statute, yeah, unfortunately, the statute is weak. You know, we don't want it to be weak, but the statute. Uh -huh. is, so yeah, the act authorizes the issuance of fines for failure to comply with such orders, a fine of not more than $500 or imprisonment of not more than 60 days or both, for the first offense and a fine of $1,000 or imprisonment for not more than 90 days or both for the second and subsequent offenses. So I don't... Um, Could I ask um, if the guides are there, how they're feeling about voluntarily boarding the dogs until they get into their new home? Uh, hey, Colin. I believe Danielle. I'm still. Yeah, I'm still here. I mean, I I wouldn't want to board them. I'd want to exactly what we said before: muzzle. If they can be on their runner, be on their runner. But again, they're like that before they go out the door now. So we've already taken action on how we handle the dogs before going outside. So that's a no. Boarding. I yeah. mean, is the town paying for it? No, <laughs> no, no, it's not the town's issue, it's yours. So, no. Sure, Larry. Uh, I know what you have in front of you, but I also want to make sure you have uh, 140, General 140, Section 164. So 157A is what you were reading from, but one, Section 164, failure to you have not euthanized confined or restrained dog after notice and this is where um animal control can seize and euthanize uh, um, sure it's a fine of not less than 25 dollars but it then says a police officer constable or animal control officer may euthanize the dog in a humane manner if it's found outside the enclosure of its owner or keeper and not under the owner or keeper's immediate care uh after such an order's been put in place Okay. Um, that's pretty strict. So that that's our order is what comes of our vote here, essentially. So these are going to be a motion to put these orders in place. 
that's what we're doing here tonight. So have I got a motion, Mr. Studo? Yes. So, and I'm going to, should I add the electronic electric fence? So that, that, I mean, I, I think that isn't part of what we can order, but if that is not voluntarily, you know, I mean, it's not really part of what we can order under the statute, but Mrs. Gonzalez. Maybe. Can I just say uh, an electric fence doesn't work unless you train with the electric fence. The dogs have to be trained. It doesn't just happen. You know, they have to, they have to be taught not to go across the fence. I mean, I've seen dogs that run past it and then they're afraid to come back home because <laughs> they know they got shocked on the way out and they don't want to get shocked on the, so it was almost worse Then they're not going to go back to the, to the yard. I, I don't still think that would be a solution. It, it, it is true, but if, if all of the other measures of, of the order it presumably are in place, that's just kind of a stop gap. However, you know, I don't know that that is something that's agreeable and we certainly could incorporate it if it was volunteered, but I don't hear that being volunteered as kind of a, you know, a safe gap. And it's not part of what we can order under the law, but. Okay. Could I just ask of a uh, town council if he can answer this is that uh, what attorney Cohen referenced that again, I don't, we don't have that from council uh, that I see anyway. Um, so if whatever we issue here, as far as, uh, the short of, uh, euthanizing them, if they don't comply, can the dogs be euthanized at the direction of the uh, animal control officer? If they, I, I believe what he was reading was that if they are found, you know, they're, they're ordered to be on the property and they're found, you know, off the property and not under their control, um, that legally the animal control officer uh, would have the authority to uh, to you know euthanize the dog um, whether that was felt he didn't have any other choice or what it, it does use that language um, I also wanted to mention you know you would you would reference uh, you were reading from that uh, the statute about the fines um, yeah you know up to five hundred dollars is not a significant amount on the other hand, it is a criminal statute and under right circumstances, a judge could actually put the dog owner in prison for violating the order. They might, um, you know, they might take it a little more personally if it was a court order that was being violated, but, uh, but the statute does authorize uh, both a, a criminal fine uh, or imprisonment under, you know, if conditions merit it. No, I know. I, I was just confused because, you know, this was, um, some correspondence that was sent to us or included in the packet from from town council here mm -hmm. and under the enforcement section it doesn't reference the 164 it just references 157 and again my next question is do we have to go through the enforcement of 157 before you can impose 164 uh no i I'd, I'd say and Attorney Cohen can correct me if I'm wrong. I think there, there are two different things. One is if uh, the 164 is if, you know, the, the dog is totally ordered to stay on the property, behind a fence, whatever it might say, and then the dog is running around town loose again. Um, obviously, the uh, animal control officer can take custody of the dog and impound it and Get, ask the board to hold another hearing and order it euthanized this time. Uh, but that statute also, you know, gives cover, uh, I, I guess I'd say, to the animal control officer to euthanize that dog that's out running around town that's already been found to be dangerous and ordered never to leave. Uh, the other thing that can happen is if, um, uh, the, if there's a violation of some kind, but um, uh, the animal control officer doesn't have to euthanize it, they can seize it. Um, you know, the, the board could hold another another hearing like this and, you know, not not at that point, not consider anything but euthanization. 
but uh, you know, go through that go through that process. I, I think what 164 is more sort of a, you know, the the police department needs to needs to act and uh, you know spur the moment, and that gives them some cover because the uh, he has that authority uh, if the dog is out running around. So it's it's sort of apples and oranges, I think. Yes, Mr. Studo. Oh. Mr. Carly, are you all set? I guess I'll have to be. Yeah. Mr. 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 Studo. Yeah, and I'll read the motion, I know, because it's pretty late for a Monday, but yeah. I'd like to say that based on, I think it's pretty clear where this is headed if any of this is violated. You know, not to be Captain Obvious here, but so, you know, I just hope that, you know, I, I think that, I'm, I'm assuming Ms. Scott has been sincere and, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that attorney Cohen will reinforce, but I like to say that, you know, it's, uh, we're going to vote on this motion. I, I don't know how my colleagues will vote. I'm assuming we're going to go through with the conditions that we have, but just to, you know, be clear that I, I hope it's perfectly clear that if it comes back to here and there's only one way, I, it's not going to be favorable. Now, I can just say that. I'll, I'll say that part because I think at that point it would meet my conditions of the next step. So I just needed to get that off my chest. So, Madam Chair, if you'd like, you if you're gonna, I can read, or if you want to give another opinion, somebody. I know you're running the show. No, I think we've had all the opinions we can. I think with <laughs> regard to that section that Attorney Cohen, I mean, police, you know, can't just take. Dogs are considered people's property. So there needs to be some exigency for which an officer can act. And the statute writes the exigency in if we've already deemed the dog dangerous, which we just did. We've deemed both dogs dangerous. So that affords the officer the exigency the officer needs to seize the property, which is the dog or dogs, and, and possibly up to having to euthanize the dog in an emergency circumstance and hopefully that provides some clarity so there's rules about what officers can and can't do so that's an exigency written right into the statute for the officer to act in an emergency um but also all the rest and hopefully i that clarifies it so um do we have a motion yes, we do and no. it's, it's lengthy yes. madam chair I move that the board approve in order to Edward Guide imposing the following conditions pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157. The dog Jager and Patron shall be confined to the property at 18 Maple Street, except as provided in condition B, provided that confined shall mean securely confined indoors or when outdoors, either on a three foot leash or muzzle when under the owner's control or in a surely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area upon the premises of the owner or keeper. Whenever Jaeger or Patron are removed from the premises of, of the owner or the person keeping the dog, the dog shall be securely and humanely muzzled and restrained with a chain or other tethering device having a minimum tinsel strength of 300 pounds and not exceeding three feet in length. The owner shall provide proof of insurance in an amount not less than 100,000, insuring the owner or keeper against any claim loss damage or injury to persons, domestic animals, or property resulting from the acts, whether intentional or unintentional, the dogs, or proof that reasonable efforts were made to obtain such insurance if a policy has not been issued. Second. I have a motion and I have a second by Mr. O'Leary. Is there any further discussion? I'm sorry, maybe I missed it. W weren't we gonna add um, that they couldn't be outside without an adult supervision? Yes. It says uh, the owner in it. Did it say that? Okay, I'm sorry I missed that. It did. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Then, well, when outdoors either on three foot leash and, and muzzle, when under the control, owner's control, or in a secured, enclosed, and locked pen. So, in other words, if they get the fence and get the kennel, the dogs can be in the in the kennel, but unsupervised. But right. otherwise, if they don't have the kennel and the fencing, they have to be there. Okay. Thank you. Anytime they're outside in in there, 
And they're confined to their home is really what the order is. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, any other further discussion? Okay. Just, to, just, just a clarification from our town council that that is what we're reading here as far as a condition that has to be under the owner's control. Yes, that's um, that's consistent with the uh, the various things that the board can order. You know, secure secure it on the premises, yeah. so it's indoors or outdoors on the leash and muzzle. And with the owner. In with and, the yeah. owner. Yes. Pretty good. Thank you. All set, Mister. Mr. Gilberto. Oh, yes, Madam Chair, I am still here. Um, a question uh, more for town council through you. The, um, the motion with the condition um, identified speaks to um, being under the owner's control or in the securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area. So just just so that it's clear to all, the dog run area is that something that needs to be fenced or otherwise enclosed, or is you know where does a, a cable with a pulley and you know leash you know run leash on it is is that gonna does that satisfy that definition? It says in a securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area upon the premises of the owner or keeper provided further that such pen or dog run shall have a secure roof. And if such enclosure has no floor secured to the sides thereof, the sides shall be embedded into the ground for not less than two feet. And provided further that within the confines of such pen or dog run, a dog house or proper shelter from the elements shall be provided to protect the dog. Can we from the statute, Madam Chair? What's that, Mr. You're reading from the statute, Madam Chair. The, this is, yes, uh, paragraph C2. That, that last part wasn't in the motion when I read it. Do you want to add it? I think that's Mr. Gilberto. That's what you were mentioning, right? That's why I'm just, I'm asking the question only because it wasn't in the motion prepared by town council. I think... Um... I think the intent of when I was drafting that was that for a variety of reasons, it didn't seem even feasible to construct a fence or a kennel or what have you, mm -hmm. um, you know, a permanent kind of thing. And so <clears throat> this would be either, you know, on the, on the premises, on the property, they're either inside the house or if they're outside, they're on a leash with a muzzle and under, the owner or somebody with the owner's control. Uh, I, I don't know what I, I don't know what sort of run there is there now, but uh, but it, it sounded to me as though they were willing to just be with these dogs all the time when they have them outside. I don't think it would be an option under the statute not to. So I just want to make sure that it's clear for everybody. That's all. Thank you. So it's it's not an option, right? They didn't hear that from no, not an option under the order. They have to be with the dogs if the dogs are outside. The dogs have to be muzzled, and the dogs have to be um, secured. Even if they're on the run. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Do we have any other questions? We have a motion. And I think we had a second. Yes, from Mr. O'Leary. Motion by Mr. Sudo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? S Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, I, I hate to keep beating it. No, it, Mr. O'Leary, this is the- Yeah, this, this is the final day. And again- it, This I, is I, too important to no, worry I, about I, asking I, 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 Under paragraph A, again, I think it gives a, 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 an or. It, does, it, it gives them a, an opportunity to have them outside without owner supervision it says, or when outdoors, either on a three foot leash and muzzle under the control owner's control, or in a securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area upon the premises of the owner or keeper on the premises only. So that, that should also be, if never than the dog run, should be under the owner's control. Yeah. And that, that language about the locked pen or dog run, I mean, 
it doesn't sound like there's that kind of facility on the property right now and probably not going to be. So I think as a practical matter, anyway, um, you know, if, if they're if they're outside the house, the dogs can have to be secured and in their control. Yes, right. No matter that, how- That sounds like it's describing the kennel that we said can't be built there. So that's, that's the order would be that when they're outside, on confined to the premises, indoor or outdoor, they're under the owner's control, which is how I think Mr. Studo read it, yep. right? Okay. Or Mr. O'Leary, if it, if it isn't reading like that, it should be amended. No, no, that's how it's reading. But okay. the, it yeah. just gives us the or. Well, I I think we heard from the owner that or can't ha isn't going to happen. They're not going to they're not going to be able to build or attorney Collins. They're not going to be able to install any kind of fencing like that there. So, um, all right, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? And so we're. Mr. Stewart, do you want to read it again so we're clear with, with regard to the order? Do you need to read yeah, it? Yeah, I mean. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that the board approve an order to Edward Guide imposing the following conditions pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157. The dogs Jaeger and Padron shall be confined to the property at 18 Maple Street, except as provided in Condition B, provided that confined shall mean securely confined indoors or when outdoors, either on a three foot leash and muzzle when under the owner's control or, or in a securely enclosed and locked pen or dog run area upon the premises of the owner or keeper. Whenever Jaeger or Patron are removed from the premises of the owner or the person keeping the dog, the dog shall be securely and humanely muzzled and restrained with a chain or other teetering device having a minimum tinsel strength of 300 pounds and not exceeding three feet in length. The owner shall provide proof of insurance in an amount not less than 100,000, insuring the owner or keeper against any claim, loss, damage, or injury to persons, domestic animals, or property resulting from the acts, whether intentional or unintentional, of the dogs, or proof that reasonable efforts were made to obtain such insurance if a policy has not been issued. Second, again. Yes, I just wanted us to be clear on what that states, which is what we're intending it to state. So motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary, and any further discussion? Just, See? I want to thank the neighborhood for coming out. I want to thank whoever delivered all the notices to everybody's mailbox over the weekend. Uh, it was very important and informative for people to, to participate and uh, good job. And, marketing this thing, letting them know that, that we were having this important meeting tonight. And, and to the guides, uh, your dog's uh, future is in your hands. So whatever, uh, any non-compliance is, is gonna result in something tragic. So um, please control the dogs. Please um, work with the neighbors in the neighborhood and um, protect your animals too. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure, and to the neighbor, but if there is any kind of non-compliance, certainly please call right away. And obviously it's a situation that that our own you know, officer Berg will be vigilant on cert making sure to go visit the, the property too, to make sure there's compliance. Um, okay, so we have a motion and a second. M no further discussion. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Aye. All right. So I guess uh, that'll be put in writing, although the owner is aware of it. So the other matter, the other aspect of this is the owner has to register those dogs immediately. I think she acknowledged she'd be doing that tomorrow morning anyway. So. Um, thank you, Attorney Cohen, for uh, appearing all, and well. all thank the you. information. And we're going to move on. We have a, a other thank business to attend to at you. midnight. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, everyone, for thank you for attending, Aaron. Thank you. Hope for the best. Well, it's my first after midnight board meeting. I'm so excited.
And there's no there's no bar or tavern for us to go to have. No, and even if there was, trial. we'd have to go three towns over because nothing in the Merrimack Valley is open after 10. We'd have to go back to our hunting grounds of Malden. Oh, that's right. 145. And they're closed now. And they're closed for right now, so it doesn't All matter. Right. I do believe that we did have our, our clerk. I know you want to give a COVID-19 update, Mr. Gilberto, but I do think we should let clerk stats give us an update and actually talk to us about the next order of business, which is the early mail-in voting for May 2021. And there's a letter in the packet to allow us to, which actually, I'm assuming that's what clerk stats is here for. There was a letter written in the packet. So we need to vote to allow me to sign off on that, to ask the delegation to try to make that happen for us. And I think that's in a nutshell what, what that next item is, right, Mr. Gilberto? It is, but I, I would like to just, you know, apprise the board that after the last meeting, I did speak with Representative Jones, and he had um, proactively filed legislation, which this letter is uh, aligned with, in order to afford the communities within his district the ability to potentially conduct um, early voting voting by mail for their municipal elections, which I believe all happen after the current deadline of March 31st. So he's very much aware of the issue and had filed legislation. And as you see, we've um, spoken with town council. Um, it's actually Brian who was on the call, who's not on now. Um, and uh, I've crafted a letter to basically uh, support that legislation um, that would advance um, the option of extending the current uh, option for early voting by mail to include our municipal election. And through you, Madam Chair, I don't know if the clerk would like to add anything else. Madam Chair, yeah. thank, thank you, you for sticking with us. <laughs> it was an interesting evening. Um, no, I'm, I'm totally in support of this um, legislation. We're hoping that this goes statewide, actually, the, um, to have this option available to all the municipalities across the state for extending the uh, mail-in early voting to cover all municipal elections this year. So I'm totally in support of that. Right. Is there any additional cost attendant to this? Well, it would be, I mean, it will be similar to absentee voting it, as it always has been. People will still ask us, you know, to send them a ballot. So yes, there will be additional costs, mailing costs for the ballots. Um, as far as the municipal election, it's not exactly at the same level as the participation for a state election. So it's going to depend on the makeup of the ballot. Are there going to be contested races? Um, the interest of the local residents. I don't know, the, the chairperson here is a big drawing card. <laughs> <laughs> we almost took the cake for the lowest, lowest <laughs> attendance, I think. I think Vincenzo, I think Vincenzo beat us out. 235. <laughs> Yeah. You did. <laughs> we just want to make sure that all the voters know that, you know, if they are taking precautions due to COVID-19, this, this opportunity is there for them to exercise. Right. It might, might hopefully encourage more voting. Mr. O'Leary. Yeah, will, will we be sending out or will there be, as was the case with the, um, the state primary and the um, national election, um, I know the Secretary of State sent it up, but would, are we in a position to send out postcards? Uh, no, this, this legislation, um, between what was passed under Act Chapter 255, um, which extended this, this uh, right through the all municipal elections through March 31st, and which the Secretary of State is trying to extend through all of 2021 municipal elections, um, it doesn't require that we would be sending out those postcards or forms to the voters. Does it, it preclude would, us from doing it? It, it, does, it doesn't preclude us as far as I can see, but now you are talking about an, a tremendous cost. This would be, you're talking about sending out uh, close to 12,000 postcards, letters of some sort to the voters. Um, the legislation last year for the two fall elections also 
it, it directed the Secretary of State's office to do that portion of it. It also provided for return postage uh, so that the voters weren't even paying for a, a stamp to send back their card. So if you're going to be talking about all of this, this is not something we can handle in-house. It just isn't with the COVID conditions and uh, um, the other uh, responsibilities of the office. So we would be looking at going to a mailing house. We would be looking at extensive costage, uh, postage costs. It's late. <laughs> um, so that goes beyond what Representative Jones is looking for. It's going beyond what the Secretary of State is looking for. What they are trying to do is just open up the opportunity to provide basically no excuse absentee voting for any person uh, who is exercising precautions due to COVID-19 in particular. Well, I, I, again, I, I endorse the, the legislation, certainly, because I, I think we suggested it at the last meeting that you know we go on the record to do it. And I'm glad Representative Jones took the proactive step to filing it uh, anyway, so which is great. Uh, so I, I think we should endorse it and move forward and uh, hopefully it becomes more the norm instead of an exception just because of the a pandemic. So I, I think it's a great idea. I think it's something that we should be embracing and um, at some point maybe discussing um, the costs associated with uh, at a future date, the future elections, uh, the costs associated with you know notifying the public through the postcards like it was done uh, last fall. But I won't fully in favor of it. Terrific. Any other questions? Do I have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to sign a letter in support of extending state law authorizing mail-in voting to include the May 2021 annual town election. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Minu Pelli is aye. Next order of business is the license renewal for Dairy Queen. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following common particular license to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements for Dairy Queen. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Why, what took so long for this one? Yeah. Madam Chair, for you, it traditionally comes to us in late January. Oh. They, they're generally aiming to be open the February school vacation week. Okay. All right. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Definite aye. Ms. <laughs> Mr. Studo. I could give an ice cream right now. Yeah. <laughs> and your belly is on. Right. Uh, us, Mr. O'Leary. I'm over there. <laughs> I'm taking a cookie myself. Next order of business is legal bills. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills in the amount of $3,759 for <laughs> Coppola and Coppola. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Our, Mr. Gilberto, our next order of business is town administrator's report. Would you like to combine that with your COVID-19 report? Sure. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, for the town administrator's report, the Department of Public Works is evaluating potential options for trash and recycling uh, collection as the contract with JRM is expiring uh, June 30th. Um, you know, we, we are anticipating a significant increase in the cost for trash disposal as a result of the pressure on the disposal facilities, um, um, particularly resulting in an increasing per ton fee at the regional facility that's run by Covanta and Haverhill. Um, <clears throat> we uh, have received a, a proposal from JRM um, that would be uh, that would allow for a potential extension. It's something that we are evaluating right now. Um, a group of us uh, spoke last week and are going to uh, be reconvening again later this week in the hopes that we might have some further direction um, for a potential uh, contract uh, moving forward. Um, so that's something that's very much on the, on the radar and, um, and something that we're, we're dealing with. 
um, right now in DPW. Um, Mrs. Gonzalez, do you want to add anything? Um, just that um, we're, we've definitely got a, a good group together and um, very focused on doing the right thing and um, getting the best rate for everybody. Thank you. Madam Chair, just regard to, with regard to COVID-19, um, I can tell you that uh, last week um, we saw a significant reduction in the seven day period as, uh, ending on Tuesday. Um, we had 31 new cases over that seven day period. That's compared to 66 new cases the, the seven days prior or two weeks prior, I should say. So, um, you know, as we've seen with the caseload um, and the case count statewide, the numbers do appear to have uh, come down um, quite a bit uh, over the past seven to 10 days. And so we hope that that's a trend that continues. So a couple of things I want to bring the board up to speed on. The first is I know there's been a lot of discussion about um, vaccinations. And as you are aware, we have begun vaccinating the phase one eligible um, individuals uh, two weeks ago now. Um, they're scheduled to get their second um, dose uh, in two weeks time, the week of February 8th. Those are clinics that were run out of the town hall here. Um, we've been looking to um, setting up uh, uh, an arrangement where we scale up the capacity in that and running a clinic here in town as we move into the phase two and ultimately phase three vaccination, which expands it to the general public ultimately. And um, while our emergency dispensary site plan calls for the use of the middle high school as a location, there's been a significant amount of effort that's been put into um, looking at the Hillview function facility since it is available as a potential site and with its proximity to the, uh, the town hall and its ability for us to, uh, to have access to it um, almost exclusively. Um, it's been identified as a, perhaps a more uh, suitable site that would not be disruptive to the in-person the in education that I know is so important to so many folks in the community. So um, there've been a couple of walk, there's been a walkthrough and a number of discussions and actually a plan submitted to the State Department of Public Health that would allow for that site to be utilized as a vaccination location. And um, well, you know, things certainly are not final. Um, we are certainly moving in that direction of building a plan to staff, staff that lo location for vaccination, um, beginning with the phase two, which is just around the corner. Um, it's a facility that we believe we can, we can staff and operate you know, to, to do a significant amount of vaccinations per day, um, you know, potentially up to uh, a thousand or more vaccinations a day um, if necessary. Um, but we were advised today to plan that for the next, um, I believe it's six weeks through February, that only 100 doses would be available to the town through the State Department of Public Health. So that will significantly limit what's available in terms of the supply if we were to be running such a, uh, um, a clinic. So, you know, that's something that we're trying to be mindful of. And, you know, our capacity is going to be driven by the availability of the vaccine, but it's something that we are, I, I just, I want the board to know, you know, there was a discussion at the Board of Health meeting two weeks ago, the planning effort has continued. And we are, you know, working very hard to make available an operation here in town for our residents but it's gonna depend upon obviously the availability of the, uh, the vaccine. And our, our only avenue to get at it is through the state, which is ultimately getting it through the federal government. <clears throat> Another thing I would just add with regard to COVID-19 um, is that we have been working closely with the um, administration over at Royal Meadowview Nursing Home. Um, there was an original date scheduled for vaccination of the residents there in uh, the end of December, December 30th, it was um, postponed to what would have been their second immunization date on January 20th um, last week. That date also um, ended up being canceled by the third party provider. So myself, the health director, the public health nurse, the public safety director, the administration of the nursing home, representative Brad Jones, the congressman's office, we've all been working to get um, that, that uh, vaccine scheduled as soon as possible. And there is a date that's been provided. It's this coming Sunday, January 31st. We do continue to work to try to expedite that, to get it to occur as soon as possible. Um, and uh, there has been some response from the third party vendor um, to try to get this moving. Um, but um, you know, it, is, it is later than was it, it's you know, certainly anticipated. And you know, I think it would be fair to say that all of the parties that I just mentioned are concerned and you know, know that this is a vulnerable population. We need to be getting them vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, I know that was a lot. Um, it is late, but I wanted, I did want to bring you up to speed. I'm happy to answer any questions to the extent that I can. Okay. Questions? Just, Ms. Romieri. 
Just uh, comments because a, a bit of oh, well, comments, sure. Yeah, is it just comments in relation to the Board of Health, what they're doing, uh, the use of Hillview, uh, the, the health agent, uh, public health nurse, all the department there. Um, proactively, again, again, I want to give credit to uh, Mr. George Stack from the Hillview Commission, Chairman of the Hillview Commission, who suggested uh, the use of the, the Hillview facility and everybody jumped at the opportunity to take a look at it. And it, it looks like it's gonna work extremely well uh, with the traffic flow could be handled uh, uh, just fine. And we can handle you know, a significant number of people at any given time, given the time scheduling that has to take place in relation to the vaccinations. Um, but the health director went out there, and again, the, the, uh, the layout looks good, uh, did a terrific job. And again, moved very quickly. Again, the Board of Health is um, proactively now taking a role in preparing for um, the opportunity to provide uh, some sort of a vaccination facility here in North Reading, uh, should we be called upon and allowed to do it. And I think that's a terrific thing to do and credit and kudos to the health department and the administration for facilitating that. In relation to what's happening up at uh, Royal Meadow Nursing Home, inexcusable. I mean, these are the most vulnerable people in our community. Um, should have been vaccinated a month ago, or pretty close to it, three weeks ago. Didn't occur because of a third-party vendor uh, that they contracted with, so it's not through any fault of the uh, nursing home and their management team, but the third party. And I think the state needs to take stronger action against the third party and uh, to push them out twice a, a whole month behind where they should have been, um, where we have people who are less vulnerable being vaccinated before these people than our residents here in town, inexcusable. And, and should not be left uh, unspoken about. And there needs to be some sort of uh, analysis as to why it occurred, how it occurred, and uh, how, could it, how it can be avoided going forward. That's all. I, that's my report too. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Except for another thing later on, but go ahead. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Gilberto? <clears throat> I do have a quick question and it doesn't sound like there is the, and I could be mis misunderstanding you because it is late, but with the hundred vaccines and uh, an elderly population that's at risk, it doesn't sound like where we have any sort of a near term plan of vaccinating the, our elderly residents, do we? We don't have a targeted date to do that because we don't even have enough vaccines. Yeah. And why do we only get a hundred vaccines with the population of 16, 17,000. I don't understand that either. I, I, and I don't even know if you can answer these questions, but I'm gonna ask them. I think we have a plan that's capable of, of, of addressing the need in the community at a, at a pretty good rate, but it's dependent upon the vaccine being available. And then the State Department of Public Health, which is our source for getting the vaccine at this point, and as I understand it is our only source for getting the vaccine at this point, has told us as of this morning that we can expect a limited supply of 100 doses a week. Oh, mm. a week. Okay. Okay. I missed. I missed a week. I. I, I didn't <laughs> but at that, that, rate, that matters gonna, a lot. Okay. Yeah, but, yeah, we might all be rate, tired, but I didn't take that. a year to do 5,000 people. So it's. Oh it's my great. God. Okay. All right. I feel slightly better, even though that's still pretty low. So. But yes, 100 per week is what we were told. But that doesn't preclude, again, other agencies, whether it be the pharmacies and other places in town, also getting the, right. the vaccines and then people's health care providers and all the rest. But uh, again, okay. the Board of Health is setting themselves up to be prepared when the vaccine becomes available and the supply is increased. Okay. Mr. Studo has his uh, name. I have a, well, it's one suggestion because I helped two clients do it today. Um, you can go online and book to get the vaccine at Foxborough, which I know is kind of a hike. But as of this morning, when I did these two clients, it tells you what's available. For next week, there was still 3,000 available. So literally, if I had one resident after the other sit down at my desk, I could have signed up 1,000 people today in less than 20 minutes. So maybe we, I don't know what the transportation issue would be, but Maybe we can help residents who maybe wouldn't want or wouldn't be comfortable doing it on their own. I, I know that if I had to drive 45 minutes south to get the vaccine or an hour, like a, like 
I'm actually doing this with my parents as soon as phase two starts because, you know, next month I'm driving them down the first available. So, and I helped two clients today sign up who were um, nurses, clients of mine. So it's available. I mean, it's not, it's not convenient, but instead of waiting around for the state, which I think I made my opinions clear less that um, I just, this vaccine rollout, I think is going to be for the, for those to go get it. I think if we wait for it to be delivered, we're going to be waiting a while. So I'm just saying a suggestion, maybe we can have a workshop where those that are willing or can get a ride to Foxborough, we can help them sign up. I don't know, just a suggestion, but there were, there were thousands of appointments available for next week. Thousands, not a hundred thousands. And they were first come first serve for people who were phase one and for phase two um, to Mr. O'Leary and uh, Mr. Gilberto's point, almost everybody we just discussed will be eligible. Start, so starting next Monday, anyone over 75, irrespective of anything, if you're over 75, anyone and um, can sign up and all they have to do is prove that they're over 75 starting February 1st. So we do a parks and rec trip. I'm not sure we want to. <laughs> Assume the liability of transports, especially shuttle transports, down to Foxborough in the middle of a pandemic. Can we release like a link? Is that allowed, or is that that doesn't give us liability, right? If the town just let people, I mean, well, I think, I think you just did. Well, I mean, everyone well, left. Everybody that's watching. You know, <laughs> I just, I just think that it's something where I, I'm just shocked that it's not as well advertised. That you know, right now. I bet if I go online right now, I mean, no one here is over 75. Well, I know Mr. I, I'm, I don't think anybody is based on how old people are, but you could you could do it right now after the meeting if you don't fall asleep, if you know somebody. <laughs> you know, I just know that uh, it's, um, I don't know. I, I just think that for, especially if we don't know when that 100 a week will increase, I mean, we could theoretically, with a little bit of willpower, have you know, what do we have? 5,000 that may qualify next for phase two. We could probably have them done in a few weeks. You just got to get signed up. Can we put it on the website? On a website. Yeah, it's through. On it's our website, I mean, on oh. the town. I can, forward, I can forward the link to Mike. It's CIC. They're the ones handling it out of Cambridge. They're, uh, they're administering it and they're following whatever guidelines the state tells them for eligibility. So there, are, there is information that's been put on the Board of Health website, and I should also add that they are going live with a Facebook page as well, the Healthy Hornet, if some of you have seen it, and some of you were on a health meeting when it was discussed. Uh, but we'll, I think you can expect we'll be putting that information out, although, again, you know, what I've seen is limited to the phase one, and we're really, you know, trying to be prepared for the phase two implementation. I don't know, Mr. Studo, if you've seen phase two appointments up yet on that. On that. No, you have to wait till Monday. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Perfect. starting Monday, phase phase two A, which is seventy five and older, will start. And then whenever the governor announced, I think phase uh, the second phase in phase two, phase two B is anyone in like transportation, healthcare, uh, restaurants, and et cetera, plus uh, anyone with two comorbidities over sixty five, and whatever that means. And then uh, and now I'm gonna get vaccinated in May. Mm -hmm. That's my plan. I'm going to hold off. <laughs> I don't have a choice, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry to be long winded. I, that was, yeah. Okay. That's all right. Any other questions from Mr. Gilberto? Seeing none. Board member reports. Do you have anything else, Mr. O'Leary, you wanted to add? I just have one other thing. And if you recall, the, the board uh, endorsed the idea of participating in the America United um, mm -hmm. Uh, ceremonies, which was uh, the day before the inauguration. And again, it was the first time uh, that it was a, a national acknowledgement of the loss of life and loss of over 400,000 uh, people to this COVID pandemic. And so it was the first national memorial and it was um, a great testament for uh, North Reading to, to participate. And, uh, you know, kudos again to John Watson, who uh, was our bell ringer. And uh, what he did is he uh, rang the bell 40 times um, which was 
one time for every 10,000 deaths through the pandemic, so 40 times. And it wasn't easy, you know, it literally pulling the string and ringing the bell. So he did yeoman's work. And at the same time, we had the uh, public safety officials, uh, police department, fire department out front with the, uh, with the lights going and the uh, gazebo lit up. It was a nice scene, a uh, nice gesture, and it was um, good for us to, to participate. So I thank the board for uh, endorsing it, and I think it makes a difference. Yeah, so, thank you. That's it. Thank you. That's a great idea, definitely. Mr. Walner. Um, the only thing I'll say, uh, uh, Mr. Studo and I both attended the CPC meeting this last week, and uh, one of the issues that's coming up, and I think we talked about it earlier, much earlier tonight, was um, Pulte Property wants to add on an extra floor onto two or three of the buildings. Um, and so I don't know if you've driven over there, but the buildings are pretty tall right now. Um, you add an extra floor on, it becomes dizzying. Um, they're doing this because they, when they dug up the dirt, they um, they have lead in the in the in the in the ground cover, so they have to remediate that, and that's costing them a lot of money to do that. So they're they tech, they just they were just pretty honest. They need to add on these floors to try to recoup some of their investment. It raises some issues, but it's going to the ZBA. So I just want to make you aware of it because I don't think we have much to say about it if it's going to the ZBA, but it's going to the ZBA. And I think it's I think it's on February 11th is a meeting and it's a public meeting. So if the public has any good concerns, that would be a good time to go. Um, but um, anyways, it's, you know, it, it, when we bought the property, we bought it at 450 units. We didn't, I mean, when we sold the property, excuse me, when we sold the property, we sold it for 30 million at 450 units. It's now gonna go up to like over 500. So 503, and that, I think it's 503. It's gonna have an impact on the town. And it's just something we should be aware of. But again, it's going to ZBA. So I think that our input other than just, Showing up at the meeting, I don't know how much we say we really have to say about that. So, anyways, just want to make you aware of that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. I and just have a quick question in relation to that. Was there any discussion about uh, these additional units uh, having any affordable aspect to it? Because to me, in order for us to uh, to consider what they're asking for, and again, I was probably a lone member at, at the time of the sale. To, uh, to have an affordable aspect to it, but it was gonna be considerably less money to the town. It was gonna to be 18 million instead of 30 million yeah. uh, to do the affordable aspect. We're talking about an increase here now. And again, as you increase the number of units, if they're gonna put another 150 units, or was it 150? No, no, 50. Oh, 50, another 50 units. Again, that's another five units that we have to uh, come up with to meet our 10% uh, affordable housing aspects of it. So yeah, it, no, I, it's a good have, question. I was thinking the same as you. I immediately floated the idea is that when we sold it, we sold it 450 units at 30 million. And I reminded him that 18 million was going to be affordable housing. But he kind of batted that back as saying, well, we just bought the land. You know, we didn't, you know, what we do with it is kind of up to us once we get it done. So I didn't get very far with it, but I still think it's a. It's a well, to, to me, yeah, I think we're going to consider we're negotiate anything. on it. I think it's a, I think it's a, it's a, it's a worthy path to go down. So I'm glad you reminded me about it because it was it was on my mind when it came up. Yeah, I just think it's important. I mean at this point every unit with every every 10 units we we add, we have to pick up another affordable unit and they're not contributing anything towards it. Yeah, we picked up 450 units there and got nothing in return. So and the sale the sale was based on a, a bit a bit a request for proposals too. Right. So. Out of that request for proposal yeah. they put in was 18 million with affordable aspect to it and 30 million. No, no the, I mean, the proposal that we accepted was based on the specific number of units. Right. Well, I understand that. So I think if we're going to accommodate them at all, then this needs, it needs to be an accommodation for affordable units considered. I just don't know if we can, I don't know how we can interject that. It's at CBA next, so I don't know. Well, again, maybe they need to modify their proposal and take that into consideration if we want to consider their proposal at all. And uh, Mr. Studo, you're the liaison with the, with the Board of Appeals. Um, and again, if it's the sentiment of the board to say, if we're gonna consider an additional 50 plus units, you know, what are you gonna do for the affordable aspect of it? If anything, why else would we consider it? You know, other than it's gonna to add to our tax base, you know, which is sure. It's good. Again, we're still ignoring our problem there in our responsibility. Do we have the ability to though to, in, to impact this discussion, or when would we have the ability to be able to do that? If CBA makes the decision to 
grant them to do what they want to do. Well, the, well, the ZBA could certainly uh, pose the question as they're considering a proposal put forth by, you know, the purchaser of the property, the developer, doesn't mean they have to accept it because it's, a, it's, a, it's an exception at this point. Uh, Board of Appeals does not have to grant them relief and grant them any additional units. Yeah, I, would, I would think the ZBA was involved in that decision because we had, we had that modified zoning when we accepted the proposal. So they would know the terms and conditions of the, you know, what was bid for that site. So, you know, they're going to kind of, they're kind of going outside the scope of what was accepted, an accepted bid there. And do we have an, a land disposition agreement on that? I don't remember. I don't we had a purchase and sale or LDA on that. Right. Purchase and sale. I don't believe there was a. There, I don't believe there was a development agreement, Madam Chair. Meaning, I don't, I don't believe that there are obligations with regard to the development. I mean, I can go back and review the paper trail, but I remember that coming up, and I remember it being determined through the discussion that that was not going to be a component of our arrangement with Colte. It would be a land dispos disposition agreement, as you mentioned, but not a development agreement. Based upon what they proposed to develop there, though, because it was put out to bid. Yes, and I, I, I've not I've not reviewed the agreement to determine you know whether there's a violation or anything like that, but it's certainly something we could look at. Mm -hmm. And right. hopefully the ZBA is looking into that as well as part of their you know hearing, looking into the background of it. But I can add some commentary when I get to was that. Was that was that your so you? But that's that's Mr. Studo's board. Do you have board, your board member reports, Mr. Walner? Uh, no, no. Okay, M Mr. S Mr. Studer, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt I, you, but I just wanted to make sure Mr. Walner had it. Yeah, the CPC, the CPC is going to give, they're gonna give an opinion um, before that February 11th meeting. It seems like they were gonna hold off, but then uh, Mrs. McKnight recommended that maybe um, there's a bunch of things that Pulte Homes have to come back with so the CPC can give their opinion on the special permit. Uh, they had some issues that, although did not violate the agreement that was first signed, it, you know, there were some concerns that maybe the spirit of the agreement wasn't followed. You know, for example, it was never mentioned that indoor parking spaces were going to be for sale. And now they are, and that's becoming an issue uh, or one issue. Also, it seems that after the fact, there's an issue with there only being one elevator per building, although I guess the original plans only called for that. So I think they're they're coming back to address some of the things that um, also the, the current people living there have. And then at that point, the CPC is going to try to get a recommendation out before that February 11th meeting. And I believe... That's a CPC meeting for February 2nd, which is already next week. Yes. So that will, and then at that point we'll know. So hopefully uh, the CPC will have enough information where then to Mr. O'Leary's point, the ZBA at least will have an opinion on, you know, maybe, I don't know, I, I, I'm assuming maybe something can be attached to the variance. Is that, is that how, I mean, the, or the ZBA could at least ask, but that's, that's that's something definitely that was discussed purposely, um, and other than that, yeah, other than that, it seemed like I, I mean, it just Pulte seemed pretty confident that they have been performing per the contract. I mean, that's that that's the air I got. I don't know if it's just being arrogant, but you know, that was the air I got from the conversation. Um, also, another thing is um, <clears throat> Mr. Bruce Wheeler is. Um, uh, trying to build affordable uh, housing, well, excuse me, age-restricted housing sure. at, um, I think it's 146, 148 Park Street behind... Uh, next to the police uh, station. Next to the police, sta next to the police station across yes. from the library. So um, it's still early. I think it's only the second time it's come to the CPC. Um, they're really trying to get... Um, you know, everybody together to see how it will work. I think the question now is that I guess there's a, a lot of different ways to go to affordable housing. 
you know, air quotes, because there's a lot of different ways. They're asking for a zone overlay, which uh, there was some concern that it might be spot zoning, which, you know, I've learned after the fact is uh, definitely not something you want to do or implement. Uh, so Mr. Pierce uh, definitely brought that up. And I think that they're going to come back to the drawing board and just clarify that. But also, um, it hasn't really been decided yet. Um, what criteria, like I said, of affordable housing will be. I brought up a point that I like the board to know, and I brought it up a couple times that um, I think that should definitely, if possible, have an asset restriction. I think that if we're going to do affordable housing right for elderly residents that want to stay, I don't know if we're, it's going to be the best look if someone sells a property for five, six hundred thousand in respective of how much they purchased it, and then bank six hundred thousand and show very little income and go live in affordable housing. So that's just something that I want the board to know that is um, it's starting to just have conversations just because there's there's definitely ways to hide money, as I like to say. So um, that's just something part of it. So, but that's early in its infancy. Um, I think, uh, if I believe correctly, they're gonna be in front of the board again on the second. Mr. Warner, was that correct? Did you hear? Is it the second they're going to try to be? I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the second. Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to move along because, you know, I think the other problem is that, uh, you know, whenever you know how everybody wants their warrant articles put on for town meeting and there's just so many. So the concern is that if there is an idea that's ready to present to the town, that they want to make sure that they at least get it in front of us to consider. So that's the update on that, but it's uh, more to come and that's it. Any questions on that? I mean, I, I have more, I just didn't know how much. Well, I think they're also going to try to build a local preference housing for that as well. Yes. It's although that one, yeah. the local preference, it seems that um, that might be a problem because of how the, the state deems things. You might, the, the they don't, the question is, how much can you discriminate towards uh, North Reading, uh, you know, residences? And that might be a, an issue. But yeah, we're definitely, thank you, looking for the local preference, which what it's, it's what we want, but you got to do it in a certain way. So, yeah, that's it. And thank you, Mr. Sudo. Mrs. Gonzalez? Yep, just quickly, um, I was on a Zoom call with uh, members of the Historical Society and the Militiamen um, trying to get the ball rolling to get the Putnam House Committee, they might change the name, um, together, um, which will comprise some militiamen and some of the Historical Society members um, so that they can start deciding um, what they want to do with the money that was allotted to them at town meeting um, to start restoring some of those buildings. So the ball's rolling on that. And um, we, we have another meeting set up for them to kind of form their committee and get officers um, involved. And I, I know that we had talked about myself being a liaison. I think Mr. O'Leary, were you also, right? Okay. I just wasn't able to make that meeting. That okay. Yeah. So great. So um, we're we're getting the ball rolling, and um, that's a good thing, getting it together. Oh, the and I'm sorry, the historical society with that um, the McLean House is gonna still be there for that project because um, I think that you, I think Mr. Mr. Hayden had mentioned that you do need clearance. Maybe somebody, I, I think, from the historical society, like, you know, if you're going to build, you have to keep the McLean House in a certain form. Am I okay. saying that right? The Historic District Commission, the McLean House you, is in the Historic District, so it's the Historic District Commission that'll have to weigh in on that. All right. uh, so it's different from this? Correct. Yeah, that, yeah, that'd be a separate thing. That's not going anywhere. <laughs> That's good. That's one of those nine nine uh, historic buildings in the center, right? Yeah, we should re. You know that one that's the little tavern there on the other side. We should David really reopen. We should reopen it as a tavern once there's no more COVID. <laughs> oh, oh yeah. I missed that. I was I was a, a long time ago. 
Yeah. <laughs> proposed that. That's where we could go but after our meeting. When town, when town hall was at that was at the was now the library that was town hall, we could have gone yeah. right across the street afterwards. It would have been fine. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, anything else? That's it. All right. And um that's a good segue. The uh, facilities master plan committee met last week too. So that's a good they're getting the ball rolling on at least one of the priorities, um, which is the fire, the fire station. And obviously COVID prevented um, any kind of any kind of consideration of meetings or interactions or inspections or discussions on um, you know town town owned property, but that is one that's been kind of a top priority for us for a long time, especially because the fire apparatus can't actually fit into the fire base. So they, um, with the inoculation, I think of the fire department, the architect is going to be going out and to be able to at least conduct some site inspection and prepare some rendering. So that, that kind of what was the only item addressed by the committee at the meeting. So at least we'll get that portion of things moving because that build out is what the what's we're thinking or what the committee is having the architect looked into is a build out of that build out of the bays there an extension of the bays there to be able to accommodate the larger apparatus because right now it's about more firefighters too yeah hopefully yes yeah. right <laughs> hopefully wow so that's kind of like. Mrs. Gonzalez says that that ball is rolling. The rest is kind of still on hold and it will be in, in a holding pattern for COVID probably until more people get vaccinated and more, you know, a little more capable of interviewing people and going and doing site and going to buildings and site inspection. So that is all I have. And um, I think we kind of did both old and new business and board member reports together. So is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. <laughs> Seconded. Motion by Mr. Studo, <laughs> second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Daniel Pelley is aye.